Chapter 56 Consciousness Arising World Arises Questioner, when an ordinary man dies, what happens to him? Maharaj, according to his belief it happens as life before death is but imagination, so is life after. The dream continues. Question, and what about the Jani? Maharaj, the Jani does not die because he was never born. Question, he appears so to others. Maharaj, but not to himself. Himself he is free of things, physical and mental. Question, still you must know the state of the man who died. At least from your own past lives. Maharaj, until I met my guru I knew so many things. Now I know nothing, for all knowledge is in dream only and not valid. I know myself and I find no life nor death in me, only pure being, not being this or that, but just being. For the moment the mind, drawing on its stock of memories, begins to imagine, it fills the space with objects and time with events. As I do not know even this birth, how can I know past births? Is the mind that, itself in movement, sees everything moving, and having created time, worries about the past and future. All the universe is cradled in consciousness Mahatattva, which arises where there is perfect order and harmony Mahasattva. As all waves are in the ocean, so are all things physical and mental in awareness. Hence awareness itself is all important, not the content of it. Deepen and broaden your awareness of yourself and all the blessings will flow. You need not seek anything, all will come to you most naturally and effortlessly. The five senses and the four functions of the mind, memory, thought, understanding and selfhood. The five elements, earth, water, fire, air and ether, the two aspects of creation, matter and spirit, all are contained in awareness. Question. Yet, you must believe in having lived before. Maharaj, the scriptures say so, but I know nothing about it. I know myself as I am, as I appeared or will appear is not within my experience. It is not that I do not remember. In fact, there is nothing to remember. Reincarnation implies a reincarnating self. There is no such thing. The bundle of memories and hopes, called the I, imagines itself existing everlastingly and creates time to accommodate its false eternity. To be, I need no past or future. All experience is born of imagination. I do not imagine, so no birth or death happens to me. Only those who think themselves born can think themselves reborn. You are accusing me of having been born, I plead not guilty. All exists in awareness, and awareness neither dies nor is reborn. It is the changeless reality itself. All the universe of experience is born with the body and dies with the body. It has its beginning and end in awareness, but awareness knows no beginning nor end. If you think it out carefully and brood over it for a long time, you will come to see the light of awareness in all its clarity, and the world will fade out of your vision. It is like looking at a burning incense stick. You see the stick and the smoke first. When you notice the fiery point, you realize that it has the power to consume mountains of sticks and fill the universe with smoke. Timelessly the self actualizes itself, without exhausting its infinite possibilities. In the incense stick simile the stick is the body and the smoke is the mind. As long as the mind is busy with its contortions, it does not perceive its own source. The guru comes and turns your attention to the spark within. By its very nature the mind is outward turned. It always tends to seek for the source of things among the things themselves. To be told to look for the source within is, in a way, the beginning of a new life. Awareness takes the place of consciousness. In consciousness there is the I, who is conscious, while awareness is undivided, awareness is aware of itself. I am is a thought, while awareness is not a thought, there is no I am aware in awareness. Consciousness is an attribute while awareness is not. One can be aware of being conscious, 
but not conscious of awareness. God is the totality of consciousness, but awareness is beyond all, being as well as not being. Question, I had started with the question about the condition of a man after death. When his body is destroyed, what happens to his consciousness? Does he carry his senses of seeing, hearing etc., along with him or does he leave them behind? And, if he loses his senses, what becomes to his consciousness? Maharaj, senses are mere modes of perception. As the grosser modes disappear, finer states of consciousness emerge. Question. Is there no transition to awareness after death? Maharaj, there can be no transition from consciousness to awareness, for awareness is not a form of consciousness. Consciousness can only become more subtle and refined, and that is what happens after death. As the various vehicles of man die off, the modes of consciousness induced by them also fade away. Question. Until only unconsciousness remains. Maharaj, look at yourself talking of unconsciousness as something that comes and goes. Who is there to be conscious of unconsciousness? As long as the window is open, there is sunlight in the room. With the window shut, the sun remains, but does it see the darkness in the room? Is there anything like darkness to the sun? There is no such thing as unconsciousness, for unconsciousness is not experienceable. We infer unconsciousness when there is a lapse in memory or communication. If I stop reacting, you will say that I am unconscious. In reality I may be most acutely conscious, only unable to communicate or remember. Question, I am asking a simple question, there are about 4 billion people in the world and they are all bound to die. What will be their condition after death, not physically, but psychologically? Will their consciousness continue? And if it does in what form? Do not tell me that I am not asking the right question, or that you do not know the answer, or that in your world my question is meaningless. The moment you start talking about your world and my world as different and incompatible, you build a wall between us. Either we live in one world or your experience is of no use to us. Maharaj, of course we live in one world. Only I see it as it is while you don't. You see yourself in the world while I see the world in myself. To you you get born and die while to me the world appears and disappears. Our world is real, but your view of it is not. There is no wall between us, except the one built by you. There is nothing wrong with the senses, it is your imagination that misleads you. It covers up the world as it is, with what you imagine it to be, something existing independently of you and yet closely following your inherited or acquired patterns. There is a deep contradiction in your attitude, which you do not see and which is the cause of sorrow. You cling to the idea that you were born into a world of pain and sorrow. I know that the world is a child of love, having its beginning growth and fulfillment in love. But I am beyond love even. Question, if you have created the world out of love, why is it so full of pain? Maharaj, you are right from the body's point of view. But you are not the body. You are the immensity and infinity of consciousness. Don't assume what is not true and you will see things as I see them. Pain and pleasure, good and bad, right and wrong, these are relative terms and must not be taken absolutely. They are limited and temporary. Question. In the Buddhist tradition it is stated that a Nirvani and enlightened Buddha has the freedom of the universe. He can know and experience for himself all that exists. He can command, interfere with nature, with the chain of causation, change the sequence of events, even undo the past. The world is still with him, but he is free in it. Maharaj, what you describe is God. Of course where there is a universe, there will also be its counterpart which is God. But I am beyond both. There was a kingdom in search of a king. They found the right man and made him king. 
in no way had he changed. He was merely given the title, the rights, and the duties of a king. His nature was not affected, only his actions. Similarly with the enlightened man, the content of his consciousness undergoes a radical transformation. But he is not misled. He knows the changeless. Question. The changeless cannot be conscious. Consciousness is always of change. The changeless leaves no trace in consciousness. Maharaj, yes and no. The paper is not the writing, yet it carries the writing. The ink is not the message, nor is the reader's mind the message, but they all make the message possible. Question. Does consciousness come down from reality, or is it an attribute of matter? Maharaj, consciousness as such is the subtle counterpart of matter. Just as inertia tamas and energy rajas are attributes of matter, so does harmony, sattva manifest itself as consciousness. You may consider it in a way as a form of very subtle energy. Wherever matter organizes itself into a stable organism, consciousness appears spontaneously. With the destruction of the organism consciousness disappears. Question, then what survives? Maharaj, that of which matter and consciousness are but aspects which is neither born nor dies. Question, if it is beyond matter and consciousness how can it be experienced? Maharaj, it can be known by its effects on both, look for it in beauty and in bliss. But you will understand neither body nor consciousness, unless you go beyond both. Question, please tell us squarely, are you conscious or unconscious? Maharaj, the enlightened jhani is neither. But in his enlightenment jhana, all is contained. Awareness contains every experience. But he who is aware is beyond every experience. He is beyond awareness itself. Question. There is the background of experience, call it matter. There is the experiencer, call it mind. What makes the bridge between the two? Maharaj, the very gap between is the bridge. That, which at one end looks like matter, and at the other as mind, is in itself the bridge. Don't separate reality into mind and body and there will be no need of bridges. Consciousness arising, the world arises. When you consider the wisdom and the beauty of the world, you call it God. Know the source of it all, which is in yourself, and you will find all your questions answered. Question, the seer and the seen, are they one or two? Maharaj, there is only seeing, both the seer and the seen are contained in it. Don't create differences where there are none. Question, I began with the question about the man who died. You said that his experiences will shape themselves according to his expectations and beliefs. Maharaj, before you were born you expected to live according to a plan, which you yourself had laid down. Your own will was the backbone of your destiny. Question. Surely karma interfered. Maharaj, karma shapes the circumstances, the attitudes are your own. Ultimately your character shapes your life and you alone can shape your character. Question. How does one shape one's character? Maharaj, by seeing it as it is and being sincerely sorry. This integral seeing feeling can work miracles. It is like casting a bronze image, metal alone, or fire alone will not do, nor will the mold be of any use. You have to melt down the metal in the heat of the fire and cast it in the mold. Chapter 57 Beyond Mind, There is No Suffering Questioner, I see you sitting in your son's house waiting for lunch to be served. And I wonder whether the content of your consciousness is similar to mine, or partly different, or totally different. Are you hungry and thirsty as I am, waiting rather impatiently for the meals to be served, or are you in an altogether different state of mind? Maharaj, there is not much difference on the surface, but very much of it in depth. You know yourself only through the senses and the mind. You take yourself to be what they suggest, 
Having no direct knowledge of yourself, you have mere ideas, all mediocre secondhand by hearsay. Whatever you think you are you take it to be true, the habit of imagining yourself perceivable and describable is very strong with you. I see as you see, hear as you hear, taste as you taste, eat as you eat. I also feel thirst and hunger and expect my food to be served on time. When starved or sick, my body and mind go weak. All this I perceive quite clearly, but somehow I am not in it, I feel myself as if floating over it, aloof and detached. Even not aloof and detached. There is aloofness and detachment as there is thirst and hunger. There is also the awareness of it all and the sense of immense distance, as if the body and the mind and all that happens to them were somewhere far out on the horizon. I am like a cinema screen, clear and empty, the pictures pass over it and disappear, leaving it as clear and empty as before. In no way is the screen affected by the pictures, nor are the pictures affected by the screen. The screen intercepts and reflects the pictures, it does not shape them. It has nothing to do with the rolls of films. These are as they are, lumps of destiny prerabda, but not my destiny, the destinies of the people on the screen. Question, you do not mean to say that the people in a picture have destinies. They belong to the story, the story is not theirs. Maharaj, and what about you? Do you shape your life or are you shaped by it? Question, yes, you are right. A life story unrolls itself of which I am one of the actors. I have no being outside it, as it has no being without me. I am merely a character, not a person. Maharaj, the character will become a person when he begins to shape his life instead of accepting it as it comes and identifying himself with it. Question, when I ask a question and you answer, what exactly happens? Maharaj, the question and the answer both appear on the screen. The lips move, the body speaks, and again the screen is clear and empty. Question, when you say, clear and empty, what do you mean? Maharaj, I mean free of all contents. To myself I am neither perceivable nor conceivable. There is nothing I can point out and say, this I am. You identify yourself with everything so easily, I find it impossible. The feeling, I am not this or that, nor is anything mine is so strong in me that as soon as a thing or a thought appears, there comes at once the sense this I am not. Question. Do you mean to say that you spend your time repeating this I am not, that I am not? Maharaj, of course not. I am merely verbalizing for your sake. By the grace of my guru I have realized once, and for good, that I am neither object nor subject, and I do not need to remind myself all the time. Question, I find it hard to grasp what exactly do you mean by saying that you are neither the object nor the subject. At this very moment as we talk am I not the object of your experience, and you the subject? Maharaj, look my thumb touches my forefinger. Both touch and are touched. When my attention is on the thumb, the thumb is the feeler and the forefinger, the self. Shift the focus of attention and the relationship is reversed. I find that somehow, by shifting the focus of attention, I become the very thing I look at and experience the kind of consciousness it has, I become the inner witness of the thing. I call this capacity of entering other focal points of consciousness love. You may give it any name you like. Love says, I am everything. Wisdom says, I am nothing between the two my life flows. Since at any point of time and space I can be both the subject and the object of experience, I express it by saying that I am both and neither and beyond both. Question, you make all these extraordinary statements about yourself. What makes you say those things? What do you mean by saying that you are beyond space and time? Maharaj, you ask and the answer comes. I watch myself, I watch the answer and see no contradiction. It is clear to me that I am telling you the truth. It is all very simple. Only you must trust me that I mean what I say, 
that I am quite serious. As I told you already my guru showed me my true nature and the true nature of the world. Having realized that I am one with and yet beyond the world I became free from all desire and fear. I did not reason out that I should be free, I found myself free unexpectedly without the least effort. This freedom from desire and fear remained with me since then. Another thing I noticed was that I do not need to make an effort. The deed follows the thought, without delay and friction. I have also found that thoughts become self-fulfilling, things would fall in place smoothly and rightly. The main change was in the mind, it became motionless and silent, responding quickly, but not perpetuating the response. Spontaneity became a way of life, the real became natural and the natural became real. And above all, infinite affection, love dark and quiet, radiating in all directions, embracing all, making all interesting and beautiful, significant and auspicious. Question. We are told that various yogic powers arise spontaneously in a man who has realized his own true being. What is your experience in these matters? Maharaj, men's five-fold body physical etc has potential powers beyond our wildest dreams. Not only is the entire universe reflected in man, but also the power to control the universe is waiting to be used by him. The wise man is not anxious to use such powers, except when the situation calls for them. He finds the abilities and skills of the human personality quite adequate for the business of daily living. Some of the powers can be developed by specialized training, but the man who flaunts such powers is still in bondage. The wise man counts nothing as his own. But at some time and place some miracle is attributed to some person, he will not establish any causal link between events and people, nor will he allow any conclusions to be drawn. All happened as it happened because it had to happen everything happens as it does because the universe is as it is. Question. The universe does not seem a happy place to live in. Why is there so much suffering? Maharaj, pain is physical, suffering is mental. Beyond the mind there is no suffering. Pain is merely a signal that the body is in danger and requires attention. Similarly, suffering warns us that the structure of memories and habits, which we call the person viacti, is threatened by loss or change. Pain is essential for the survival of the body, but none compels you to suffer. Suffering is due entirely to clinging or resisting. It is a sign of our unwillingness to move on, to flow with life. As a sane life is free of pain, so is a saintly life free from suffering. Question, nobody has suffered more than saints. Maharaj, did they tell you, or do you say so on your own? The essence of saintliness is total acceptance of the present moment, harmony with things as they happen. A saint does not want things to be different from what they are, he knows that, considering all factors, they are unavoidable. He is friendly with the inevitable and therefore does not suffer. Pain he may know, but it does not shatter him. If he can, he does the needful to restore the lost balance, or he lets things take their course. Question, he may die. Maharaj, so what? What does he gain by living on, and what does he lose by dying? What was born must die, what was never born cannot die. It all depends on what he takes himself to be. Question. Imagine you fall mortally ill. Would you not regret and resent? Maharaj, but I am dead already, or rather neither alive nor dead. You see my body behaving the habitual way, and draw your own conclusions. You will not admit that your conclusions bind nobody but you. Do see that the image you have of me may be altogether wrong. Your image of yourself is wrong too, but that is your problem. But you need not create problems for me and then ask me to solve them. I am neither creating problems nor solving them. Chapter 58 Perfection, Destiny of All
Questioner, when asked about the means for self-realization, you invariably stress the importance of the mind dwelling on the sense I am. Where is the causal factor? Why should this particular thought result in self-realization? How does the contemplation of I am affect me? Maharaj, the very fact of observation alters the observer and the observed. After all, what prevents the insight into one's true nature is the weakness and obtuseness of the mind and its tendency to skip the subtle and focus on the gross only. When you follow my advice and try to keep your mind on the notion of I am only, you become fully aware of your mind and its vagaries. Awareness, being lucid harmony sattva in action, dissolves dullness and quietens the restlessness of the mind and gently, but steadily changes its very substance. This change need not be spectacular, it may be hardly noticeable, yet it is a deep and fundamental shift from darkness to light, from inadvertence to awareness. Question, must it be the I am formula? Will not any other sentence do? If I concentrate on there is a table, will it not serve the same purpose? Maharaj, as an exercise in concentration, yes. But it will not take you beyond the idea of a table. You are not interested in tables, you want to know yourself. But this keeps steadily in the focus of consciousness the only clue you have, your certainty of being. Be with it, play with it, ponder over it, delve deeply into it, till the shell of ignorance breaks open and you emerge into the realm of reality. Question. Is there any causal link between my focusing the I am and the breaking of the shell? Maharaj, the urge to find oneself is a sign that you are getting ready. The impulse always comes from within. Unless your time has come, you will have neither the desire nor the strength to go for self-inquiry wholeheartedly. Question. Is not the grace of the Guru responsible for the desire and its fulfillment? Is not the Guru's radiant face the bait on which we are caught and pulled out of this mire of sorrow? Maharaj, it is the inner Guru Sad Guru who takes you to the outer Guru, as a mother takes her child to a teacher. Trust and obey your Guru, for he is the messenger of your real self. Question, how do I find a Guru whom I can trust? Maharaj, your own heart will tell you. There is no difficulty in finding a guru because the guru is in search of you. The guru is always ready, you are not ready. You have to be ready to learn, or you may meet your guru and waste your chance by sheer inattentiveness and obstinacy. Take my example. There was nothing in me of much promise but when I met my guru, I listened, trusted and obeyed. Question. Must I not examine the teacher before I put myself entirely into his hands? Maharaj, by all means examine. But what can you find out? Only as he appears to you on your own level. Question, I shall watch whether he is consistent, whether there is harmony between his life and his teaching. Maharaj, you may find plenty of disharmony, so what? It proves nothing. Only motives matter. How will you know his motives? Question. I should at least expect him to be a man of self-control who lives a righteous life. Maharaj, such you will find many and of no use to you. A guru can show the way back home to your real self. What has this to do with the character or temperament of the person he appears to be? Does he not clearly tell you that he is not the person? The only way you can judge is by the change in yourself when you are in his company. If you feel more at peace and happy, if you understand yourself with more than usual clarity and depth, it means you have met the right man. Take your time, but once you have made up your mind to trust him, trust him absolutely and follow every instruction fully and faithfully. It does not matter much if you do not accept him as your guru and are satisfied with his company only. That thing alone can also take you to your goal, provided it is unmixed and undisturbed. But once you accept somebody as your guru, listen, remember and obey. Half-heartedness is a serious drawback and the cause of much self-created sorrow. The mistake is never the guru's, 
it is always the obtuseness and cussedness of the discipline that is at fault. Question, does the guru then dismiss or disqualify a disciple? Maharaj, he would not be a guru if he did. He bides his time and waits till the disciple, chastened and sobered, comes back to him in a more receptive mood. Question, what is the motive? Why does the guru take so much trouble? Maharaj, sorrow and the ending of sorrow. He sees people suffering in their dreams and he wants them to wake up. Love is intolerant of pain and suffering. Patience of a guru has no limits and therefore it cannot be defeated. Guru never fails. Question. Is my first guru also my last or do I have to pass from guru to guru? Maharaj, the entire universe is your guru. You learn from everything if you are alert and intelligent. Were your mind clear and your heart clean, you would learn from every passerby. It is because you are indolent or restless that your inner self manifests as the outer guru and makes you trust him and obey. Question. Is a guru inevitable? Maharaj, it is like asking is a mother inevitable? To rise in consciousness from one dimension to another, you need help. The help may not always be in the shape of a human person, it may be a subtle presence or a spark of intuition, but help must come. The inner self is watching and waiting for the son to return to his father. At the right time he arranges everything affectionately and effectively. Where a messenger is needed or a guide he sends the guru to do the needful. Question, there is one thing I cannot grasp. You speak of the inner self as wise and good and beautiful and in every way perfect, and of the person as mere reflection without a being of its own. On the other hand you take so much trouble in helping the person to realize itself. If the person is so unimportant, why be so concerned with its welfare? Who cares for a shadow? Maharaj, you have brought in duality where there is none. There's the body and there is the self. Between them is the mind in which the self is reflected as I am. Because of the imperfections of the mind, its crudity and restlessness, lack of discernment and insight, it takes itself to be the body, not the self. All that is needed is to purify the mind so that it can realize its identity with the self. When the mind merges in the self, the body presents no problems. It remains what it is, an instrument of cognition and action, the tool and the expression of the creative fire within. The ultimate value of the body is that it serves to discover the cosmic body, which is the universe in its entirety. As you realize yourself in manifestation, you keep on discovering that you are ever more than what you have imagined. Question, is there no end to self-discovery? Maharaj, as there is no beginning there is no end. But what I have discovered by the grace of my Guru is, I am nothing that can be pointed at. I am neither a this nor a that. This holds absolutely. Question, then, where comes in the never-ending discovery, the endless transcending oneself into huge dimensions? Maharaj, all this belongs to the realm of manifestation. It is in the very structure of the universe that the higher can be at only through the freedom from the lower. Question, what is lower and what is higher? Maharaj, look at it in terms of awareness. Wider and deeper consciousness is higher. All that lives works for protecting, perpetuating and expanding consciousness. This is the world's sole meaning and purpose. It is the very essence of yoga ever raising the level of consciousness, discovery of new dimensions with their properties, qualities and powers. In that sense the entire universe becomes a school of yoga yoga etc. Question, is perfection the destiny of all human beings? Maharaj, of all living beings ultimately. The possibility becomes a certainty when the notion of enlightenment appears in the mind. 
Once a living being has heard and understood that deliverance is within his reach, he will never forget, for it is the first message from within. It will take roots and grow, and in due course take the blessed shape of the Guru. Question, so all we are concerned with is the redemption of the mind? Maharaj, what else? The mind goes astray, the mind returns home. Even the word astray is not proper. The mind must know itself in every mood. Nothing is a mistake unless repeated. Chapter 59 Desire and Fear Self-Centered States Questioner I would like to go again into the question of pleasure and pain, desire and fear. I understand fear which is memory and anticipation of pain. It is essential for the preservation of the organism and its living pattern. Needs when felt are painful and their anticipation is full of fear, we are rightly afraid of not being able to meet our basic needs. The relief experienced when a need is met, or an anxiety allayed, is entirely due to the ending of pain. We may give it positive names like pleasure or joy or happiness, but essentially it is relief from pain. It is this fear of pain that holds together our social, economic and political institutions. What puzzles me is that we derive pleasure from things and states of mind which have nothing to do with survival. On the contrary, our pleasures are usually destructive. They damage or destroy the object, the instrument and also the subject of pleasure. Otherwise pleasure and pursuit of pleasure would be no problem. This brings me to the core of my question, why is pleasure destructive? Why, in spite of its destructiveness, is it wanted? I may add, I do not have in mind the pleasure-pain pattern by which nature compels us to go her way. I think of the man-made pleasures, both sensory and subtle, ranging from the grossest, like overreading, to the most refined. Addiction to pleasure at whatever cost is so universal that there must be something significant at the root of it. Of course not every activity of man must be utilitarian, designed to meet a need. Play for example is natural and man is the most playful animal in existence. Play fulfills the need for self-discovery and self-development. But even on his play man becomes destructive of nature, others and himself. Maharaj, in short you do not object to pleasure, but only to its price in pain and sorrow. Question. If reality itself is bliss, then pleasure in some way must be related to it. Maharaj, let us not proceed by verbal logic. The bliss of reality does not exclude suffering. Besides, you know only pleasure, not the bliss of pure being. So let us examine pleasure at its own level. If you look at yourself in your moments of pleasure or pain, you will invariably find that it is not the thing in itself that is pleasant or painful, but the situation of which it is a part. Pleasure lies in the relationship between the enjoyer and the enjoyed. And the essence of it is acceptance. Whatever may be the situation, if it is acceptable, it is pleasant. If it is not acceptable, it is painful. What makes it acceptable is not important. The cause may be physical, or psychological, or untraceable. Acceptance is the decisive actor. Obviously, suffering is due to non-acceptance. Question, pain is not acceptable. Maharaj, why not? Did you ever try? Do try, and you will find in pain a joy which pleasure cannot yield, for the simple reason that acceptance of pain takes you much deeper than pleasure does. The personal self by its very nature is constantly pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain. The ending of this pattern is the ending of the self. The ending of the self with its desires and fears enables you to return to your real nature, the source of all happiness and peace. The perennial desire for pleasure is the reflection of the timeless harmony within. It is an observable fact that one becomes self-conscious only when caught in the conflict between pleasure and pain, which demands choice and decision. 
It is this clash between desire and fear that causes anger, which is the great destroyer of sanity in life. When pain is accepted for what it is, a lesson and a warning, and deeply looked into and heeded, the separation between pain and pleasure breaks down, both become experience, painful when resisted, joyful when accepted. Question, do you advise shunning pleasure and pursuing pain? Maharaj, no, nor pursuing pleasure and shunning pain. Accept both as they come, enjoy both while they last, let them go, as they must. Question, how can I possibly enjoy pain? Physical pain calls for action. Maharaj, of course. And so does mental. The bliss is in the awareness of it, in not shrinking, or in any way turning away from it. All happiness comes from awareness. The more we are conscious, the deeper the joy. Acceptance of pain, non-resistance, courage and endurance, these open deep and perennial sources of real happiness, true bliss. Question, why should pain be more effective than pleasure? Maharaj, pleasure is readily accepted, while all the powers of the self reject pain. As the acceptance of pain is the denial of the self, and the self stands in the way of true happiness, the wholehearted acceptance of pain releases the springs of happiness. Question, does the acceptance of suffering act the same way? Maharaj, the fact of pain is easily brought within the focus of awareness. With suffering it is not that simple. Focus suffering is not enough, for mental life as we know it, is one continuous stream of suffering. To reach the deeper layers of suffering you must go to its roots and uncover their vast underground network, where fear and desire are closely interwoven and the currents of life's energy oppose, obstruct and destroy each other. Question, how can I set right a tangle which is entirely below the level of my consciousness? Maharaj, by being with yourself, the I am, by watching yourself in your daily life with alert interest, with the intention to understand rather than to judge, in full acceptance of whatever may emerge, because it is there, you encourage the deep to come to the surface, and enrich your life and consciousness with its captive energies. This is the great work of awareness. It removes obstacles and releases energies by understanding the nature of life and mind. Intelligence is the door to freedom, and alert attention is the mother of intelligence. Question, one, more question. Why does pleasure end in pain? Maharaj, everything has a beginning and an end and so does pleasure. Don't anticipate and don't regret, and there will be no pie, it is memory and imagination that cause suffering. Of course pain after pleasure may be due to the misuse of the body or the mind. Body knows its measure, but the mind does not. Its appetites are numberless and limitless. Watch your mind with great diligence, for there lies your bondage and also the key to freedom. Question. My question is not yet fully answered. Why are man's pleasures destructive? Why does he find so much pleasure in destruction? Life's concern lies in protection, perpetuation and expansion of itself. In this it is guided by pain and pleasure. At what point do they become destructive? Maharaj, when the mind takes over, remembers and anticipates, it exaggerates, it distorts, it overlooks. The past is projected into future and the future betrays the expectations. The organs of sensation and action are stimulated beyond capacity and they inevitably break down. The objects of pleasure cannot yield what is expected of them and get worn out or destroyed by misuse. It results in excessive pain where pleasure was looked for. Question, we destroy not only ourselves but others too. Maharaj, naturally, selfishness is always destructive. Desire and fear, both are self-centered states. Between desire and fear anger arises, with anger hatred, with hatred passion for destruction. 
or is hatred in action organized and equipped with all the instruments of death? Question, is there a way to end these horrors? Maharaj, when more people come to know their real nature, their influence, however subtle, will prevail and the world's emotional atmosphere will sweeten up. People follow their leaders, and when among the leaders appear some, great in heart and mind, and absolutely free from self-seeking, their impact will be enough to make the crudities and crimes of the present age impossible. A new golden age may come and last for a time and succumb to its own perfection. Where it begins when the tide is at its highest. Question. Is there no such thing as permanent perfection? Maharaj. Yes there is but it includes all imperfection. It is the perfection of our self-nature which makes everything possible, perceivable, interesting. It knows no suffering, for it neither likes nor dislikes, neither accepts nor rejects. Creation and destruction are the two poles between which it weaves its ever-changing pattern. Be free from predilections and preferences, and the mind with its burden of sorrow will be no more. Question, but I am not alone to suffer. There are others. Maharaj, when you go to them with your desires and fears, you merely add to their sorrows. First be free of suffering yourself, and then only hope of helping others. You do not even need to hope, your very existence will be the greatest help a man can give his fellowmen. Chapter 60, Life Acts Not Fancies Questioner, you say that whatever you see is yourself. You also admit that you see the world as we see it. Here is today's newspaper with all the horrors going on. Since the world is yourself, how can you explain such misbehavior? Maharaj, which world do you have in mind? Question, our common world in which we live. Maharaj, are you sure we live in the same world? I do not mean nature, the sea and the land, plants and animals. They are not the problem, nor the endless space, the infinite time, the inexhaustible power. Do not be misled by my eating and smoking, reading and talking. My mind is not here, my life is not here. Your world of desires and their fulfillments of fears and their escapes is definitely not my world. I do not even perceive it except through what you tell me about it. It is your private dream world and my only reaction to it is to ask you to stop dreaming. Question. Surely wars and revolutions are not dreams. Sick mothers and starving children are not dreams. Wealth, ill-gotten and misused, is not a dream. Maharaj, what else? Question. A dream cannot be shared. Maharaj, nor can the waking state. All the three states of waking, dreaming and sleeping are subjective, personal, intimate. They all happen to and are contained within the little bubble in consciousness called I. The real world lies beyond the self. Question, self or no self facts are real. Maharaj, of course facts are real. I live among them. But you live with fancies, not with facts. Facts never clash while your life and world are full of contradictions. Contradiction is the mark of the false. The real never contradicts itself. For instance, you complain that people are abjectly poor. Yet you do not share your riches with them. You mind the war next door, but you hardly give it a thought when it is in some far-off country. Shifting fortunes of your ego determine your values, I think I want I must are made into absolutes. Question. Nevertheless, the evil is real. Maharaj, not more real than you are. Evil is in the wrong approach to problems created by misunderstanding and misuse. It is a vicious circle. Question. Can the circle be broken? Maharaj, a false circle need not be broken. It is enough to see it as it is non-existent. Question. But real enough to make us submit to and inflict indignities and atrocities. Maharaj, insanity is universal. 
Sanity is rare. Yet there is hope, because the moment we perceive our insanity, we are on the way to sanity. This is the function of the Guru to make us see the madness of our daily living. Life makes you conscious, but the teacher makes you aware. Question, Sir, you are neither the first nor the last. Since immemorial times people were breaking into reality. Yet how little it affected our lives. The Ramas and the Krishnas, the Buddhas and the Christs have come and gone and we are as we were, wallowing in sweat and tears. What have the Great Ones done, whose lives we witnessed? What have you done, sir, to alleviate the world's thrall? Maharaj, you alone can undo the evil you have created. Your own callous selfishness is at the root of it. But first your own house in order and you will see that your work is done. Question. The men of wisdom and of love who came before us did set themselves right, often at a tremendous cost. What was the outcome? A shooting star, however bright, does not make the night less dark. Maharaj, to judge them and their work you must become one of them. Pragana well knows nothing about the birds in the sky. Question, do you mean to say that between good and evil there is no wall? Maharaj, there is no wall because there is no good and no evil. In every concrete situation, there is only the necessary and the unnecessary. The needful is right, the needless is wrong. Question, who decides? Maharaj, the situation decides. Every situation is a challenge which demands the right response. When the response is right, the challenge is met and the problem ceases. If the response is wrong, the challenge is not met and the problem remains unsolved. Your unsolved problems, that is what constitutes your karma. Solve them rightly and be free. Question, you seem to drive me always back into myself. Is there no objective solution to the world's problems? Maharaj, the world problems were created by numberless people like you, each full of his own desires and fears. Who can free you of your past personal and social except yourself? And how will you do it unless you see the urgent need of your being first free of cravings born of illusion? How can you truly help as long as you need help yourself? Question. In what way did the ancient sages help? In what way do you help? A few individuals profit, no doubt. Your guidance and example may mean a lot to them, but in what way do you affect humanity? the totality of life and consciousness. You say that you are the world and the world is you. What impact have you made on it? Maharaj, what kind of impact do you expect? Question, man is stupid, selfish, cruel. Maharaj, man is also wise, affectionate and kind. Question, why does not goodness prevail? Maharaj, it does in my real world. In my world, even what you call evil is the servant of the good, and therefore necessary. It is like boils and fevers that clear the body of impurities. Disease is painful, even dangerous, but if dealt with rightly it heals. Question or kills. Maharaj, in some cases death is the best cure. A life may be worse than death which is but rarely an unpleasant experience, whatever the appearances. Therefore pity the living, never the dead. This problem of things, good and evil in themselves, does not exist in my world. The needful is good, and the needless is evil. In your world the pleasant is good, and the painful is evil. Question, what is necessary? Maharaj, to grow is necessary. To outgrow is necessary. To leave behind the good for the sake of the better is necessary. Question, to what end? Maharaj, the end is in the beginning. You end where you start in the absolute. Question, why all this trouble then? To come back to where I started. Maharaj, whose trouble? Which trouble? Do you pity this seed that is to grow and multiply till it becomes a mighty forest? 
Do you kill an infant to save him from the bother of living? What is wrong with life ever more life? Remove the obstacles to growing and all your personal, social, economic and political problems will just dissolve. The universe is perfect as a whole and the part striving for perfection is a way of joy. Willingly sacrifice the imperfect to the perfect and there will be no more talk about good and evil. Question, yet we are afraid of the better and cling to the worse. Maharaj, this is our stupidity verging on insanity. Chapter 61, Matter is Consciousness Itself. Questioner, I was lucky to have holy company all my life. Is it enough for self-realization? Maharaj, it depends what you make of it. Question, I was told that the liberating action of satsang is automatic. Just like a river carries one to the estuary, so the subtle and silent influence of good people will take me to reality. Maharaj, it will take you to the river, but the crossing is your own. Freedom cannot be gained, nor kept without will to freedom. You must strive for liberation. The least you can do is uncover and remove the obstacles diligently. If you want peace, you must strive for it. You will not get peace just by keeping quiet. Question. A child just grows. He does not make plans for growth, nor has he a pattern, nor does he grow by fragments, a hand here a leg there, he grows integrally and unconsciously. Maharaj, because he's free of imagination. You can also grow like this, but you must not indulge in forecasts and plans born of memory and anticipation. It is one of the peculiarities of a Johnny that he is not concerned with the future. Your concern with future is due to fear of pain and desire for pleasure. To the Johnny all is bliss. He is happy with whatever comes. Question. Surely there are many things that would make even a Johnny miserable. Maharaj. A Johnny may meet with difficulties, but they do not make him suffer. Bringing up a child from birth to maturity may seem a hard task, but to a mother the memories of hardships are a joy. There is nothing wrong with the world. What is wrong is in the way you look at it. It is your own imagination that misleads you. Without imagination there is no world. Your conviction that you are conscious of a world is the world. The world you perceive is made of consciousness, what you call matter is consciousness itself. You are the space akash in which it moves, the time in which it lasts, the love that gives it life. Cut off imagination and attachment and what remains? Question, the world remains. I remain. Maharaj, yes. But how different it is when you can see it as it is, not through the screen of desire and fear. Question, what for are all these distinctions, reality and illusion, wisdom and ignorance, saint and sinner? Everyone is in search of happiness, everyone strives desperately, everyone is a yogi and is life a school of wisdom. Each learns his own way the lessons he needs. Society approves of some, disapproves of others, there are no rules that apply everywhere and for all time. Maharaj, in my world love is the only law. I do not ask for love, I give it. Such is my nature. Question, I see you living your life according to a pattern. You run a meditation class in the morning lecture and have discussions regularly, twice daily, there is worship puja and religious singing bhajan in the evening. You seem to adhere to the routine scrupulously. Maharaj, the worship and the singing are as I found them and I saw no reason to interfere. The general routine is according to the wishes of the people with whom I happen to live or who come to listen. They are working people with many obligations and the timings are for their convenience. Some repetitive routine is inevitable. Even animals and plants have their timetables. Question. Yes, we see a regular sequence in all life. Who maintains the order? Is there an inner ruler who lays down laws and enforces order? 
Maharaj, everything moves according to its nature. Where's the need of a policeman? Every action creates a reaction, which balances and neutralizes the action. Everything happens, but there is a continuous cancelling out, and in the end, it is as if nothing happened. Question. Do not console me with final harmonies. The accounts tally, but the loss is mine. Maharaj, wait and see. You may end up with a profit good enough to justify the outlays. Question. There is a long life behind me and I often wonder whether its many events took place by accident, or there was a plan. Was there a pattern laid down before I was born by which I had to live my life? If yes, who made the plans and who enforced them? Could there be deviations and mistakes? Some say destiny is immutable and every second of life is predetermined. Others say that pure accident decides everything. Maharaj, you can have it as you like. You can distinguish in your life a pattern or see merely a chain of accidents. Explanations are meant to please the mind. They need not be true. Reality is indefinable and indescribable. Question. Sir, you are escaping my question. I want to know how you look at it. Wherever we look we find structure of unbelievable intelligence and beauty. How can I believe that the universe is formless and chaotic? Your world, the world in which you live may be formless, but it need not be chaotic. Maharaj, the objective universe has structure, is orderly and beautiful. Nobody can deny it. But structure and pattern imply constraint and compulsion. My world is absolutely free, everything in it is self-determined. Therefore I keep on saying that all happens by itself. There's order in my world too, but it is not imposed from outside. It comes spontaneously and immediately because of its timelessness. Perfection is not in the future. It is now. Question, does your world affect mine? Maharaj, at one point only, at the point of the now. It gives it momentary being, a fleeting sense of reality. In full awareness the contact is established. It needs effortless, unself-conscious attention. Question, is not attention an attitude of mind? Maharaj, yes, when the mind is eager for reality, it gives attention. There is nothing wrong with your world. It is your thinking yourself to be separate from it that creates disorder. Selfishness is the source of all evil. Question. I am coming back to my question. Before I was born, did my inner self decide the details of my life, or was it entirely accidental and at the mercy of heredity and circumstances? Maharaj, those who claim to have selected their father and mother and decided how they are going to live their next life may know for themselves. I know for myself. I was never born. Question, I see you sitting in front of me and replying my questions. Maharaj, you see the body only which of course was born and will die. Question, it is the life story of thus body mind that I am interested in. Was it laid down by you or somebody else, or did it happen accidentally? Maharaj, there is a catch in your very question. I make no distinction between the body and the universe. Each is the cause of the other, each is the other in truth. But I am out of it all. When I am telling you that I was never born, why go on asking me what were my preparations for the next birth? The moment you allow your imagination to spin, it at once spins out a universe. It is not at all as you imagined and I am not bound by your imaginings. Question. It requires intelligence and energy to build and maintain a living body. Where do they come from? Maharaj, there is only imagination. Intelligence and power are all used up in your imagination. It has absorbed you so completely that you just cannot grasp how far from reality you have wandered. No doubt imagination is richly creative. Universe within universe are built on it. 
yet they are all in space and time past and future, which just do not exist. Question. I have read recently a report about a little girl who was very cruelly handled in her early childhood. He was badly mutilated and disfigured and grew up in an orphanage, completely estranged from its surroundings. This little girl was quiet and obedient, but completely indifferent. One of the nuns who were looking after the children was convinced that the girl was not mentally retarded, but merely withdrawn irresponsive. A psychoanalyst was asked to take up the case, and for full two years he would see the child once a week and try to break the wall of isolation. He was docile and well-behaved, but would give no attention to her doctor. He brought her a toy house, with rooms and movable furniture and dolls representing father, mother and their children. It brought out a response, the girl got interested. One day the old Hertz revived and came to the surface. Gradually she recovered, a number of operations brought back her face and body to normal and she grew into an efficient and attractive young woman. It took the doctor more than five years, but the work was done. He was a real guru. He did not put down conditions nor talk about readiness and eligibility. Without faith, without hope, out of love only he tried and tried again. Maharaj, yes that is the nature of a guru. He will never give up. But to succeed he must not be met with too much resistance. Doubt and disobedience necessarily delay. Given confidence and pliability, he can bring about a radical change in the disciple speedily. Keep insight in the guru and earnestness in the disciple, both are needed. Whatever was her condition, the girl in your story suffered for lack of earnestness in people. The most difficult are the intellectuals. They talk a lot but are not serious. What you call realization is a natural thing. When you are ready, your cure will be wait and sadhana is effortless. When the relationship with your teacher is right you grow. Above all, trust him. He cannot mislead you. Question, even when he asks me to do something patently wrong? Maharaj, do it. A sannyasi had been asked by his guru to marry. He obeyed and suffered bitterly. But his four children were all saints and seers, the greatest in Maharashtra. Be happy with whatever comes from your guru, and you will grow to perfection without striving. Question, sir, have you any wants or wishes? Can I do anything for you? Maharaj, what can you give me that I do not have? Material things are needed for contentment. But I am contented with myself. What else do I need? Question, surely when you are hungry you need food, and when sick you need medicine. Maharaj, hunger brings the food and illness brings the medicine. Is all nature's work? Question, well, if I bring something I believe you need, will you accept it? Maharaj, the love that made you offer will make me accept. Question, if somebody offers to build you a beautiful ashram. Maharaj, let him by all means. Let him spend a fortune, employ hundreds, feed thousands. Question, is it not a desire? Maharaj, not at all. I am only asking him to do it properly, not stingily, half-heartedly. He is fulfilling his own desire, not mine. Let him do it well and be famous among men and gods. Question, but do you want it? Maharaj, I do not want it. Question, will you accept it? Maharaj, I don't need it. Question, will you stay in it? Maharaj, if I am compelled. Question, what can compel you? Maharaj, love of those who are in search of light. Question, yes, I see your point. Now how am I to go into Samadhi? Maharaj, if you are in the right state, whatever you see will put you into Samadhi. After all, Samadhi is nothing unusual. When the mind is intensely interested, it becomes one with the object of interest, the seer and the seen become one in seeing, the hearer and the heard become one in hearing, 
the lover and the loved become one in loving. Every experience can be the ground for samadhi. Question, are you always in a state of samadhi? Maharaj, of course not samadhi is a state of mind after all. I am beyond all experience, even of samadhi. I am the great devourer and destroyer. Whatever I touch dissolves into void akash. Question, I need samadhis for self-realization. Maharaj, you have all the self-realization you need, but you do not trust it. Have courage, trust yourself, go talk, act, give it a chance to prove itself. With some realization comes imperceptibly, but somehow they need convincing. They have changed, but they do not notice it. Such non-spectacular cases are often the most reliable. Question, can one believe himself to be realized and be mistaken? Maharaj, of course. The very idea I am self-realized is a mistake. There is no I am this. I am that in the natural state. Chapter 62, In the Supreme the Witness Appears Questioner, some forty years ago J. Krishnamurti said that there is life only in all talk of personalities and individualities has no foundation in reality. He did not attempt to describe life, he merely said that while life need not and cannot be described, it can be fully experienced if the obstacles to its being experienced are removed. The main hindrance lies in our idea of an addiction to time, in our habit of anticipating a future in the light of the past. The sum total of the past becomes the I was, the hoped for future becomes the I shall be in life is a constant effort of crossing over from what I was to what I shall be. The present moment the now is lost sight of. Maharaj speaks of I am. Is it an illusion like I was and I shall be, or is there something real about it? And if the I am too is an illusion, how does one free oneself from it? The very notion of I am free of I am is an absurdity. Is there something real, something lasting about the I am in distinction from the I was or I shall be, which change with time as added memories create new expectations? Maharaj, the present I am is as false as the I was and I shall be. It is merely an idea in the mind, an impression left by memory, and the separate identity it creates is fouls. This habit of referring to a false center must be done away with. The notion I see, I feel, I think, I do, must disappear from the field of consciousness. What remains when the false is no more is real. Question. What is this big talk about elimination of the self? How can the self eliminate itself? What kind of metaphysical acrobatics can lead to the disappearance of the acrobat? In the end he will reappear, mightily proud of his disappearing. Maharaj, you need not chase the iron to kill it. You cannot. All you need is a sincere longing for reality. We call it Atma Bhakti, the love of the Supreme, or Moksha Sankalpa, the determination to be free from the false. Without love, and will inspired by love, nothing can be done. Merely talking about reality without doing anything about it is self-defeating. There must be love in the relation between the person who says I am and the observer of that I am. As long as the observer, the inner self, the higher self, considers himself apart from the observed, the lower self, despises it and condemns it, the situation is hopeless. It is only when the observer Vyakta accepts the person Vyakti as a projection or manifestation of himself, and so to say, takes the self into the self, the duality of I and this goes, and in the identity of the outer and the inner the supreme reality manifests itself. This union of the seer and the seen happens when the seer becomes conscious of himself as the seer, he is not merely interested in the seen, which he is anyhow, but also interested in being interested, giving attention to attention, aware of being aware. Affectionate awareness is the crucial factor that brings reality into focus. Question. 
According to the Theosophists and Allied Occultists, man consists of three aspects, personality, individuality and spirituality. Beyond spirituality lies divinity. The personality is strictly temporary and valid for one birth only. It begins with the birth of the body and ends with the birth of the next body. Once over it is over for good, nothing remains of it except a few sweet or bitter lessons. The individuality begins with the animal man and ends with the fully human. The split between the personality and individuality is characteristic of our present-day humanity. On one side the individuality with its longing for the true, the good and the beautiful, on the other side an ugly struggle between habit and ambition, fear and greed, passivity and violence. The spirituality aspect is still in abeyance. It cannot manifest itself in an atmosphere of duality. Only when the personality is reunited with the individuality and becomes a limited, perhaps, but true expression of it, that the light and love and beauty of the spiritual come into their own. You teach of the Vyakti Vyakta Aviakta observer observed and ground of observation. Does it tally with the other view? Maharaj, yes, when the Vyakti realizes its non-existence and separation from the Vyakta, and the Vyakta sees the Vyakti as his own expression, then the peace and silence of the Avyakta state come into being. In reality, the three are one. The Vyakta and the Avyakta are inseparable while the Vyakti is the sensing feeling thinking process based on the body made of and fed by the five elements. Question. What is the relation between the Vyakta and the Avyakta? Maharaj. How can there be relation when they are one? All talk of separation and relation is due to the distorting and corrupting influence of I am the body idea. The outer self Vyakti is merely a projection on the body mind of the inner self Vyakta, which again is only an expression of the supreme self Vyakta which is all and none. Question. There are teachers who will not talk of the higher self and lower self. They address the man as if only the lower self existed. Neither Buddha nor Christ ever mentioned a higher self. De Krishnamurti too fights shy of any mention of the higher self. Why is it so? Maharaj, how can there be two selves in one body? The I am is one. There is no higher I am and lower I am. All kinds of states of mind are presented to awareness and there is self-identification with them. The objects of observation are not what they appear to be, and the attitudes they are met with are not what they need be. If you think that Buddha, Christ or Krishnamurti speak to the person, you are mistaken. They know well that the Vyakti, the outer self, is but a shadow of the Vyakta, the inner self, and they address and admonish the Vyakta only. They tell him to give attention to the outer self, to guide and help it, to feel responsible for it, in short, to be fully aware of it. Awareness comes from the Supreme and pervades the inner self. The so-called outer self is only that part of one's being of which one is not aware. One may be conscious for every being is conscious, but one is not aware. What is included in awareness becomes the inner and partakes of the inner. You may put it differently. The body defines the outer self consciousness the inner and in pure awareness the supreme is contacted. Question. You said the body defines the outer self. Since you have a body, do you have also an outer self? Maharaj, I would were I attached to the body and take it to be myself. Question. But you are aware of it and attend to its needs. Maharaj. The contrary is nearer to truth the body knows me and is aware of my needs. But neither is really so. This body appears in your mind, and my mind nothing is. Question. Do you mean to say you are quite unconscious of having a body? Maharaj, on the contrary I am conscious of not having a body. Question. I see you smoking. Maharaj, exactly so. You see me smoking. 
Find out for yourself how did you come to see me smoking, and you will easily realize that it is your I am the body state of mind that is responsible for this I see you smoking idea. Question, there is the body and there is myself. I know the body. Apart from it what am I? Maharaj, there is no I apart from the body nor the world. The three appear and disappear together. At the root is the sense I am. Go beyond it. The idea, I am not the body is merely an antidote to the idea I am the body which is false. What is that I am? Unless you know yourself, what else can you know? Question, from what you say I conclude that without the body there can be no liberation. The idea, I am not the body leads to liberation, the presence of the body is essential. Maharaj, quite right. Without the body how can the idea, I am not the body come into being? The idea I am free is as false as the idea I am in bondage. Find out the I am common to both and go beyond. Question, all is a dream only. Maharaj, all are mere words, of what use are they to you? You are entangled in the web of verbal definitions and formulations. Go beyond your concepts and ideas, in the silence of desire and thought the truth is found. Question, one has to remember not to remember. What a task! Maharaj, it cannot be done of course. It must happen. But it does happen when you truly see the need of it. Again, earnestness is the golden key. Question, at the back of my mind there is a hum going on all the time. Numerous weak thoughts swarm and buzz, and this shapeless cloud is always with me. Is it the same with you? What is at the back of your mind? Maharaj, where there is no mind, there is no back to it. I'm all front, no back. The void speaks, the void remains. Question, is there no memory left? Maharaj, no memory of past pleasure or pain is left. Each moment is newly born. Question. Without memory you cannot be conscious. Maharaj, of course I am conscious and fully aware of it. I am not a block of wood. Compare consciousness and its content to a cloud. You are inside the cloud while I look at. You are lost in it, hardly able to see the tips of your fingers, while I see the cloud and many other clouds and the blue sky too and the sun the moon, the stars. Reality is one for both of us, but for you, it is a prison and for me it is a home. Question, you spoke of the person Vyakti, the witness Vyakta and the Supreme Avyakta. Which comes first? Maharaj, in the Supreme the witness appears. The witness creates the person and thinks itself as separate from it. The witness sees that the person appears in consciousness which again appears in the witness. This realization of the basic unity is the working of the Supreme. It is the power behind the witness, the source from which all flows. It cannot be contacted, unless there is unity and love and mutual help between the person and the witness, unless the doing is in harmony with the being and the knowing. The Supreme is both the source and the fruit of such harmony. As I talk to you, I am in the state of detached but affectionate awareness, Terea. When this awareness turns upon itself, you may call it the Supreme State, Terea Tita. But the fundamental reality is beyond awareness, beyond the three states of becoming, being and not being. Question. How is it that here my mind is engaged in high topics and finds dwelling on them easy and pleasant? When I return home I find myself forgetting all I have learned here, worrying and fretting, unable to remember my real nature even for a moment. What may be the cause? Maharaj, it is your childishness you are returning to. You are not fully grown up. There are levels left undeveloped because unattended. Just give full attention to what in you is crude and primitive, unreasonable and unkind, altogether childish, and you will ripen. It is the maturity of heart and mind that is essential. 
It comes effortlessly when the main obstacle is removed in attention and awareness. In awareness you grow. Chapter 63 Notion of Doership is Bondage Questioner We have been staying at the Satya Sai Baba Ashram for some time. We have also spent two months at Sri Raman Ashram at Turuvanamalai. Now we are on our way back to the United States. Maharaj, did India cause any change in you? Question, we feel we have shed our burden. Three Satya Sai Baba told us to leave everything to him and just live from day to day as righteously as possible. Be good and leave the rest to me, he used to tell us. Maharaj, what were you doing at the Sri Raman Ashram? Question, we were going on with the mantra given to us by the Guru. We also did some meditation. There was not much of thinking or study, we were just trying to keep quiet. We are on the backed eye path and rather poor in philosophy. We have not much to think about, just trust our Kiru and live our lives. Maharaj, most of the Bactas trust their Kiru only as long as all is well with them. When troubles come, they feel let down and go out in search of another Guru. Question. Yes, we were warned against this danger. We are trying to take the heart along with the soft. The feeling, all is grace must be very strong. A sadhu was walking eastwards from where a strong wind started blowing. The sadhu just turned round and walked west. We hope to live just like that, adjusting ourselves to circumstances as sent us by our guru. Maharaj, there is only life. There is nobody who lives a life. Question, that we understand, yet constantly we make attempts to live our lives instead of just living. Making plans for the future seems to be an inveterate habit with us. Maharaj, whether you plan or don't, life goes on. But in life itself a little whirl arises in the mind, which indulges in fantasies and imagines itself dominating and controlling life. Life itself is desireless, but the false self wants to continue pleasantly. Therefore, it is always engaged in ensuring one's continuity. Life is unafraid and free. As long as you have the idea of influencing events, liberation is not for you. The very notion of doership, of being a cause, is bondage. Question. How can we overcome the duality of the doer and the done? Maharaj, contemplate life as infinite, undivided, ever-present, ever-active, until you realize yourself as one with it. It is not even very difficult, for you will be returning only to your own natural condition. Once you realize that all comes from within, that the world in which you live has not been projected onto you but by you, your fear comes to an end. Without this realization you identify yourself with the externals like the body, mind, society, nation, humanity, even God or the Absolute. But these are all escapes from fear. It is only when you fully accept your responsibility for the little world in which you live and watch the process of its creation, preservation and destruction, that you may be free from your imaginary bondage. Question: Why should I imagine myself so wretched? Maharaj, you do it by habit only. Change your ways of feeling and thinking, take stock of them and examine them closely. You are in bondage by inadvertence. Attention liberates. You are taking so many things for granted. Begin to question. The most obvious things are the most doubtful. Ask yourself such questions as, Was I really born? Am I really so and so? How do I know that I exist? Who are my parents? Have they created me, or have I created them? Must I believe all I am told about myself? Who am I anyhow? You have put so much energy into building a prison for yourself. Now spend as much on demolishing it. In fact, demolition is easy for the false dissolves when it is discovered. All hangs on the idea I am. Examine it very thoroughly. It lies at the root of every trouble. It is a sort of skin that separates you from the reality. 
The real is both within and without the skin, but the skin itself is not real. This I am idea was not born with you. You could have lived very well without it. It came later due to your self-identification with the body. It created an illusion of separation where there was none. It made you a stranger in your own world and made the world alien and inimical. Without the sense of I am life goes on. There are moments when we are without the sense of I am at peace and happy. With the return of that I am trouble starts. Question, how is one to be free from thy sense? Maharaj, you must deal with the I sense if you want to be free of it. Watch it in operation and at peace, how it starts and when it ceases, what it wants and how it gets it, till you see clearly and understand fully. After all, all the yogas, whatever their source and character, have only one aim, to save you from the calamity of separate existence, of being a meaningless dot in a vast and beautiful picture. You suffer because you have alienated yourself from reality and now you seek an escape from this alienation. You cannot escape from your own obsessions. You can only cease nursing them. Is because the I am is false that it wants to continue. Reality need not continue, knowing itself indestructible, it is indifferent to the destruction of forms and expressions. Strengthen and stabilize the I am we do all sorts of things, all in vain, for the I am is being rebuilt from moment to moment. It is unceasing work, and the only radical solution is to dissolve the separative sense of I am such and such person once, and for good. Being remains but not self-being. Question. I have definite spiritual ambitions. Must I not work for their fulfillment? Maharaj, no ambition is spiritual. All ambitions are for the sake of the I am. If you want to make real progress you must give up all idea of personal attainment. The ambitions of the so-called yogis are preposterous. A man's desire for a woman is innocence itself compared to the lusting for an everlasting personal bliss. The mind is a cheat. The more pious it seems, the worse the betrayal. Question. People come to you very often with their worldly troubles and ask for help. How do you know what to tell them? Maharaj, I just tell them what comes to my mind at the moment. I have no standardized procedure in dealing with people. Question. You are sure of yourself. But when people come to me for advice, how am I to be sure that my advice is right? Maharaj, watch in what state you are from what level you talk. If you talk from the mind, you may be wrong. If you talk from full insight into the situation, with your own mental habits in abeyance, your advice may be a true response. The main point is to be fully aware that neither you nor the man in front of you are mere bodies. If your awareness is clear and full, a mistake is less probable. Chapter 64 Whatever pleases you keeps you back. Questioner I am a retired chartered accountant and my wife is engaged in social work for poor women. Our son is leaving for the United States and we came to see him off. We are Panjabis but we live in Delhi. We have a guru of the Radhasomi faith and we value satsang highly. We feel very fortunate to be brought here. We have met many holy people and we are glad to meet one more. Maharaj, you have met many anchorites and ascetics, but a fully realized man conscious of his divinity Swarupa is hard to find. The saints and yogis, by immense efforts and sacrifices, acquire many miraculous powers and can do much good in the way of helping people and inspiring faith, yet it does not make them perfect. It is not a way to reality, but merely an enrichment of the false. All effort leads to more effort. Whatever was built up must be maintained, whatever was acquired must be protected against decay or loss. Whatever can be lost is not really one's own, and what is not your own of what use can it be to you? In my world nothing is pushed about, all happens by itself. All existence is in space and time, limited and temporary. 
he who experiences existence is also limited and temporary. I am not concerned either with what exists or with who exists. I take my stand beyond where I am both and neither. The persons who, after much effort and penance, have fulfilled their ambitions and secured higher levels of experience and action, are usually acutely conscious of their standing. They grade people into hierarchies, ranging from the lowest non-achiever to the highest achiever. To me all are equal. Differences in appearance and expression are there, but they do not matter. Just as the shape of a gold ornament does not affect the gold, so does man's essence remain unaffected. Where this sense of equality is lacking it means that reality had not been touched. Mere knowledge is not enough, the nor must be known. The pandits and the yogis may know many things, but of what use is mere knowledge when the self is not known? It will be certainly misused. Without the knowledge of the knower there can be no peace. Question. How does one come to know the knower? Maharaj, I can only tell you what I know from my own experience. When I met my guru, he told me, you are not what you take yourself to be. Find out what you are. Watch the sense I am, find your real self. I obeyed him because I trusted him. I did as he told me. All my spare time I would spend looking at myself in silence. And what a difference it made and how soon. It took me only three years to realize my true nature. My guru died soon after I met him, but it made no difference. I remembered what he told me and persevered. The fruit of it is here with me. Question, what is it? Maharaj, I know myself as I am in reality. I am neither the body, nor the mind, nor the mental faculties. I am beyond all these. Question, are you just nothing? Maharaj, come on be reasonable. Of course I am most tangibly. Only, I am not what you may think me to be. This tells you all. Question, it tells me nothing. Maharaj, because it cannot be told. You must gain your own experience. You are accustomed to deal with things physical and mental. I am not a thing, nor are you. We are neither matter nor energy, neither body nor mind. Once you have a glimpse of your own being, you will not find me difficult to understand. We believe in so many things on hearsay. We believe in distant lands and people in heavens and hells, in gods and goddesses, because we were told. Similarly, we were told about ourselves, our parents' name, position, duties, and so on. We never cared to verify. The way to truth lies through the destruction of the false. To destroy the false, you must question your most inveterate beliefs. Of these the idea that you are the body is the worst. With the body comes the world, with the world God who is supposed to have created the world and thus it starts, fears, religions, prayers, sacrifices, all sorts of systems, all to protect and support the child man, frightened out of his wits by monsters of his own mac and realize that what you are cannot be born nor die and with the fear gone all suffering ends. What the mind invents the mind destroys. But the real is not invented and cannot be destroyed. Hold on to that over which the mind has no power. What I am telling you about is neither in the past nor in the future. Nor is it in the daily life as it flows in the now. It is timeless and the total timelessness of it is beyond the mind. My guru and his words, you or myself are timelessly with me. In the beginning I had to fix my mind on them but now it has become natural and easy. The point when the mind accepts the words of the Guru as true and lives by them spontaneously and in every detail of daily life is the threshold of realization. In a way it is salvation by faith, but the faith must be intense and lasting. However, you must not think that faith itself is enough. Faith expressed in action is a sure means to realization. Of all the means, it is the most effective. There are teachers who deny faith and trust reason only. 
Actually it is not faith they deny, but blind beliefs. Faith is not blind. It is the willingness to try. Question. We were told that of all forms of spiritual practices the practice of the attitude of a mere witness is the most efficacious. How does it compare with faith? Maharaj, the witness attitude is also faith, it is faith in oneself. You believe that you are not what you experience and you look at everything as from a distance. There is no effort in witnessing. You understand that you are the witness only and the understanding acts. You need nothing more, just remember that you are the witness only. In the state of witnessing you ask yourself, who am I? The answer comes at once, though it is wordless and silent. Cease to be the object and become the subject of all that happens, once having turned within, you will find yourself beyond the subject. When you have found yourself, you will find that you are also beyond the object, that both the subject and the object exist in you, but you are neither. Question. You speak of the mind, of the witnessing consciousness beyond the mind and of the supreme, which is beyond awareness. Do you mean to say that even awareness is not real? Maharaj, as long as you deal in terms, real, unreal, awareness is the only reality that can be. But the Supreme is beyond all distinctions and to it the term real does not apply, for in it all is real and therefore need not be labeled as such. It is the very source of reality, it imparts reality to whatever it touches. It just cannot be understood through words. Even a direct experience however sublime merely bears testimony nothing more. Question, but who creates the world? Maharaj, the universal mind Chittakash makes and unmakes everything. The Supreme Paramakash imparts reality to whatever comes into being. To say that it is the universal love may be the nearest we can come to it in words. Just like love it makes everything real beautiful, desirable. Question, why desirable? Maharaj, why not? Wherefrom come all the powerful attractions that make all created things respond to each other, that bring people together, if not from the Supreme? Chun not desire, see only that it flows into the right channels. Without desire you are dead, but with low desires you are a ghost. Question, what is the experience which comes nearest to the Supreme? Maharaj, immense peace and boundless love, realize that whatever there is true, noble and beautiful in the universe, it all comes from you, that you yourself are at the source of it. The gods and goddesses that supervise the world may be most wonderful and glorious beings, yet they are like the gorgeously dressed servants who proclaim the power and the riches of their master. Question, how does one reach the supreme state? Maharaj, by renouncing all lesser desires. As long as you are pleased with the lesser, you cannot have the highest. Whatever pleases you keeps you back. Until you realize the unsatisfactoriness of everything, its transiency and limitation, and collect your energies in one great longing, even the first step is not made. On the other hand, the integrity of the desire for the Supreme is by itself a call from the Supreme. Nothing physical or mental can give you freedom. You are free once you understand that your bondage is of your own making and you cease forging the chains that bind you. Question, how does one find the faith in a Guru? Maharaj, to find the Guru and also the trust in him is rare luck. It does not happen often. Question, is it destiny that ordains? Maharaj, calling it destiny explains little. When it happens you cannot say why it happens, and you merely cover up your ignorance by calling it karma or grace, or the will of God. Question, Krishnamurti says that Guru is not needed. Maharaj, somebody must tell you about the supreme reality and the way that leads to it. Krishnamurti is doing nothing else. In a way he is right, most of the so-called disciples do not trust their gurus, they disobey them and finally abandon them. 
With such disciples, it would have been infinitely better if they had no guru at all and just looked within for guidance to find a living guru is a rare opportunity and a great responsibility. One should not treat these matters lightly. You people are out to buy yourself the heaven and you imagine that the guru will supply it for a price. You seek to strike a bargain by offering little but asking much. You cheat nobody except yourselves. Question, you were told by your guru that you are the supreme and you trusted him and acted on it. What gave you this trust? Maharaj, say I was just reasonable. It would have been foolish to distrust him. What interest could he possibly have in misleading me? Question, you told a questioner that we are the same, that we are equals. I cannot believe it. Since I do not believe it, of what use is your statement to me? Maharaj, your disbelief does not matter. My words are true and they will do their work. This is the beauty of noble company satsang. Question, just sitting near you can it be considered spiritual practice? Maharaj, of course. The river of life is flowing. Some of its water is here, but so much of it has already reached its goal. You know only the present. I see much further into the past and future, into what you are and what you can be. I cannot but see you as myself. It is in the very nature of love to see no difference. Question, how can I come to see myself as you see me? Maharaj, it is enough if you do not imagine yourself to be the body. It is the I am the body idea that is so calamitous. It blinds you completely to your real nature. Even for a moment do not think that you are the body. Give yourself no name, no shape. In the darkness and the silence reality is found. Question, must not I think with some conviction that I am not the body? Where am I to find such conviction? Maharaj, behave as if you were fully convinced and the confidence will come. What is the use of mere words? A formula, a mental pattern will not help you. But unselfish action, free from all concern with the body and its interests will carry you into the very heart of reality. Question, where am I to get the courage to act without conviction? Maharaj, love will give you the courage. When you meet somebody wholly admirable, love-worthy, sublime, your love and admiration will give you the urge to act nobly. Question, not everybody knows to admire the admirable. Most of the people are totally insensitive. Maharaj, life will make them appreciate. The very weight of accumulated experience will give them eyes to see. When you meet a worthy man, you will love and trust him and follow his advice. This is the role of the realized people, to set an example of perfection for others to admire and love. Beauty of life and character is a tremendous contribution to the common good. Question, must we not suffer to grow? Maharaj, it is enough to know that there is suffering that the world suffers. By themselves neither pleasure nor pain enlighten. Only understanding does. Once you have grasped the truth that the world is full of suffering, that to be born is a calamity, you will find the urge and the energy to go beyond it. Pleasure puts you to sleep and pain wakes you up. If you do not want to suffer, don't go to sleep. You cannot know yourself through bliss alone, for bliss is your very nature. You must face the opposite what you are not to find enlightenment. Chapter 65 a quiet mind is all you need. Questioner, I am not well. I feel rather weak. What am I to do? Maharaj, who is unwell, you were the body. Question, my body of course. Maharaj, yesterday you felt well. What felt well? Question, the body. Maharaj, you were glad when the body was well and you are sad when the body is unwell. Who is glad one day and sad the next? Question, the mind. Maharaj, and who knows the variable mind? Question, the mind. Maharaj, the mind is the knower. Who knows the knower? 
Question, does not the nor know itself? Maharaj, the mind is discontinuous. Again and again it blanks out like in sleep or swoon or distraction. There must be something continuous to register discontinuity. Question, the mind remembers. This stands for continuity. Maharaj, memory is always partial, unreliable and evanescent. It does not explain the strong sense of identity pervading consciousness, the sense I am. Find out what is at the root of it. Question, however deeply I look I find only the mind. Your words beyond the mind give me no clue. Maharaj, while looking with the mind you cannot go beyond it. To go beyond, you must look away from the mind and its contents. Question, in what direction am I to look? Maharaj, all directions are within the mind. I am not asking you to look in any particular direction. Just look away from all that happens in your mind and bring it to the feeling I am. The I am is not a direction. It is the negation of all direction. Ultimately even the I am will have to go, for you need not keep on asserting what is obvious. Bringing the mind to the feeling, I am merely helps in turning the mind away from everything else. Question, where does it all lead me? Maharaj, when the mind is kept away from its preoccupations, it becomes quiet. If you do not disturb this quiet and stay in it, you find that it is permeated with a light and a love you have never known, and yet, you recognize it at once as your own nature. Once you have passed through this experience, you will never be the same man again. The unruly mind may break its peace and obliterate its vision, but it is bound to return, provided the effort is sustained, until the day when all bonds are broken, delusions and attachments end and life becomes supremely concentrated in the present. Question, what difference does it make? Maharaj, the mind is no more. There's only love in action. Question, how shall I recognize this state when I reach it? Maharaj, there will be no fear. Question, surrounded by a world full of mysteries and dangers, how can I remain unafraid? Maharaj, your own little body too is full of mysteries and dangers, yet you are not afraid of it for you take it as your own. What you do not know is that the entire universe is your body and you need not be afraid of it. You may say you have two bodies, the personal and the universal. The personal comes and goes, the universal is always with you. The entire creation is your universal body. You are so blinded by what is personal that you do not see the universal. This blindness will not end by itself, it must be undone skillfully and deliberately. When all illusions are understood and abandoned, you reach the error-free and perfect state in which all distinctions between the personal and the universal are no more. Question, I am a person and therefore limited in space and time. I occupy little space and last but a few moments, I cannot even conceive myself to be eternal and all-pervading. Maharaj, nevertheless you are. As you dive deep into yourself in search of your true nature, you will discover that only your body is small and only your memory is short, while the vast ocean of life is yours. Question. The very words I and universal are contradictory. One excludes the other. Maharaj, they don't. The sense of identity pervades the universal. Search and you shall discover the universal person, who is yourself and infinitely more. Anyhow, begin by realizing that the world is in you, not you in the world. Question, how can it be? I'm only a part of the world. How can the whole world be contained in the part, except by reflection mirror-like? Maharaj, what you say is true. Your personal body is a part in which the whole is wonderfully reflected. But you have also a universal body. You cannot even say that you do not know it because you see and experience it all the time. Only you call it the world and are afraid of it. 
question, I feel I know my little body, while the other I do not know except through science. Maharaj, your little body is full of mysteries and wonders which you do not know. There also science is your only guide. Both anatomy and astronomy describe you. Question. Even if I accept your doctrine of the universal body as a working theory, in what way can I test it and of what use is it to me? Maharaj, knowing yourself as the dweller in both the bodies you will disown nothing. All the universe will be your concern, every living thing you will love and help most tenderly and wisely. There will be no clash of interests between you and others. All exploitation will cease absolutely. Your every action will be beneficial, every movement will be a blessing. Question, it is all very tempting, but how am I to proceed to realize my universal being? Maharaj, you have two ways, you can give your heart and mind to self-discovery, or you accept my words on trust and act accordingly. In other words, either you become totally self-concerned, or totally unself-concerned. It is the word totally that is important. You must be extreme to reach the supreme. Question. How can I aspire to such height small and limited as I am? Maharaj, realize yourself as the ocean of consciousness in which all happens. This is not difficult. A little of attentiveness, of close observation of oneself, and you will see that no event is outside your consciousness. Question. The world is full of events which do not appear in my consciousness. Maharaj, even your body is full of events which do not appear in your consciousness. This does not prevent you from claiming your body to be your own. You know the world exactly as you know your body through your senses. It is your mind that has separated the world outside your skin from the world inside and put them in opposition. This created fear and hatred, and all the miseries of living. Question, what I do not follow is what you say about going beyond consciousness. I understand the words, but I cannot visualize the experience. After all, you yourself have said that all experience is in consciousness. Maharaj, you are right, there can be no experience beyond consciousness. Yet there is the experience of just being. There is a state beyond consciousness which is not unconscious. Some call it superconsciousness, or pure consciousness, or supreme consciousness. Is pure awareness free from the subject-object nexus? Question, I have studied the Asophi and I find nothing familiar in what you say. I admit the Asophi deals with manifestation only. It describes the universe and its inhabitants in great details. It admits many levels of matter and corresponding levels of experience, but it does not seem to go beyond. What you say goes beyond all experience. If it is not experienceable, why at all talk about it? Maharaj, consciousness is intermittent, full of gaps. Yet there is the continuity of identity. What does this sense of identity do to, if not to something beyond consciousness? Question, if I am beyond the mind, how can I change myself? Maharaj, where is the need of changing anything? The mind is changing anyhow all the time. Look at your mind dispassionately, this is enough to calm it. When it is quiet, you can go beyond it. Do not keep it busy all the time. Stop it and just be. If you give it rest, it will settle down and recover its purity and strength. Constant thinking makes it decay. Question, if my true being is always with me, how is it that I am ignorant of it? Maharaj, because it is very subtle and your mind is gross full of gross thoughts and feelings. Come and clarify your mind and you will know yourself as you are. Question, do I need the mind to know myself? Maharaj, you are beyond the mind but you know with your mind. It is obvious that the extent, depth and character of knowledge depend on what instrument you use. Improve your instrument and your knowledge will improve. Question. To know perfectly I need a perfect mind. 
Maharaj, a quiet mind is all you need. All else will happen rightly once your mind is quiet. As the sun on rising makes the world active, so does self-awareness affect changes in the mind. In the light of calm and steady self-awareness inner energies wake up and work miracles without any effort on your part. Question, you mean to say that the greatest work is done by not working? Maharaj, exactly. Do understand that you are destined for enlightenment. Cooperate with your destiny, don't go against it, don't thwart it. Allow it to fulfill itself. All you have to do is to give attention to the obstacles created by the foolish mind. Chapter 66 All Search for Happiness is Misery Questioner, I have come frown England and I am on my way to Madras. There I shall meet my father and we shall go by car overland to London. I am to study psychology, but I do not yet know what I shall do when I get my degree. I may try industrial psychology or psychotherapy. My father is a general physician, I may follow the same line. But this does not exhaust my interests. There are certain questions which do not change with time. I understand you have some answers to such questions and this made me come to see you. Maharaj, I wonder whether I am the right man to answer your questions. I know little about things and people. I know only that I am, and that much you also know. We are equals. Question. Of course I know that I am. But I do not know what it means. Maharaj, what you take to be the I in the I am is not you. To know that you are is natural, to know what you are is the result of much investigation. You will have to explore the entire field of consciousness and go beyond it. For this you must find the right teacher and create the conditions needed for discovery. Generally speaking, there are two ways, external and internal. Either you live with somebody who knows the truth and submit yourself entirely to his guiding and molding influence, or you seek the inner guide and follow the inner light wherever it takes you. In both cases your personal desires and fears must be disregarded. You learn either by proximity or by investigation the passive or the active way. You either let yourself be carried by the river of life and love represented by your guru, or you make your own efforts, guided by your inner star. In both cases you must move on, you must be earnest. Rare are the people who are lucky to find somebody worthy of trust and love. Most of them must take the hard way, the way of intelligence and understanding, of discrimination and detachment viveka veragia. This is the way open to all. Question, I am lucky to have come here, though I am leaving tomorrow, one talk with you may affect my entire life. Maharaj, yes once you say I want to find truth all your life will be deeply affected by it. All your mental and physical habits, feelings and emotions, desires and fears, plans and decisions will undergo a most radical transformation. Question. Once I have made up my mind to find the reality, what do I do next? Maharaj, it depends on your temperament. If you are earnest, whatever way you choose will take you to your goal. It is the earnestness that is the decisive factor. Question. What is the source of earnestness? Maharaj, it is the homing instinct which makes the bird return to its nest and the fish to the mountain stream where it was born. The seed returns to the earth when the fruit is ripe. Ripeness is all. Question, and what will ripen me? Do I need experience? Maharaj, you already have all the experience you need otherwise you would not have come here. You need not gather any more rather you must go beyond experience. Whatever effort you make, whatever method sadhana you follow will merely generate more experience, but will not take you beyond. Nor will reading books help you. They will enrich your mind, but the person you are will remain intact. If you expect any benefits from your search material, mental or spiritual, you have missed the point. Truth gives no advantage. It gives you no higher status, no power over others, 
all you get is truth and the freedom from the false. Question. Surely truth gives you the power to help others. Maharaj, this is mere imagination however noble. In truth you do not help others because there are no others. You divide people into noble and ignoble and you ask the noble to help the ignoble. You separate, you evaluate, you judge and condemn in the name of truth you destroy it. Your very desire to formulate truth denies it because it cannot be contained in words. Truth can be expressed only by the denial of the false in action. For this you must see the false as false viveka and rejected veragia. Renunciation of the false is liberating and energizing. It lays open the road to perfection. Question, when do I know that I have discovered truth? Maharaj, when the idea this is true that is true does not arise. Truth does not assert itself, it is in the seeing of the false as false seemed rejecting it. It is useless to search for truth when the mind is blind to the false. It must be purged of the false completely before truth can dawn on it. Question, but what is false? Maharaj, surely what has no being is false. Question, what do you mean by having no being? The false is there, hard as a nail. Maharaj, what contradicts itself has no being. Or it has only momentary being which comes to the same. Or what has a beginning and an end has no middle. It is hollow. It has only the name and shape given to it by the mind but it has neither substance nor essence. Question. If all that passes has no being, then the universe has no being either. Maharaj, whoever denies it? Of course the universe has no being. Question. What has? Maharaj, that which does not depend for its existence, which does not arise with the universe arising, nor set with the universe setting, which does not need any proof, but imparts reality to all it touches. It is the nature of the false that it appears real for a moment. One could say that the true becomes the father of the false. But the false is limited in time and space and is produced by circumstances. Question, how am I to get rid of the false and secure the real? Maharaj, to what purpose? Question, in order to live a better, a more satisfactory life, integrated and happy. Maharaj, whatever is conceived by the mind must be false, for it is bound to be relative and limited. The real is inconceivable and cannot be harnessed to a purpose. It must be wanted for its own sake. Question, how can I want the inconceivable? Maharaj, what else is there worth wanting? Granted, the real cannot be wanted as a thing is wanted. But you can see the unreal as unreal and discard it. It is the discarding the false that opens the way to the true. Question, I understand but how does it look in actual daily life? Maharaj, self-interest and self-concern are the focal points of the false. Your daily life vibrates between desire and fear. Watch it intently and you will see how the mind assumes innumerable names and shapes, like a river foaming between the boulders. Trace every action to its selfish motive and look at the motive intently till it dissolves. Question. To live, one must look after oneself, one must earn money for oneself. Maharaj, you need not earn for yourself, but you may have to for a woman and a child. You may have to keep on working for the sake of others. Even just to keep alive can be a sacrifice. There is no need whatsoever to be selfish. Discard every self-seeking motive as soon as it is seen, and you need not search for truth. Truth will find you. Question. There is a minimum of needs. Maharaj, were they not supplied since you were conceived? Give up the bondage of self-concern and be what you are intelligence and love in action. Question, but one must survive. Maharaj, you can't help surviving. The real you is timeless and beyond birth and death. And the body will survive as long as it is needed. 
it is not important that it should live long. A full life is better than a long life. Question, who is to say what is a full life? It depends on my cultural background. Maharaj, if you seek reality you must set yourself free of all backgrounds, of all cultures, of all patterns of thinking and feeling. Even the idea of being man or woman, or even human, should be discarded. The ocean of life contains all, not only humans. So first of all abandon all self-identification, stop thinking of yourself as such and such, so and so, this or that. Abandon all self-concern, worry not about your welfare, material or spiritual, abandon every desire, gross or subtle, stop thinking of achievement of any kind. You are complete here and now, you need absolutely nothing. It does not mean that you must be brainless and foolhardy, improvident or indifferent, only the basic anxiety for oneself must go. You need some food, clothing and shelter for you and yours, but this will not create problems as long as greed is not taken for a need. Live in tune with things as they are and not as they are imagined. Question, what am I if not human? Maharaj, that which makes you think that you are a human is not human. It is but a dimensionless point of consciousness, a conscious nothing. All you can say about yourself is, I am. You are pure being awareness bliss. To realize that is the end of all seeking. You come to it when you see all you think yourself to be as mere imagination and stand aloof in pure awareness of the transient as transient, imaginary as imaginary, unreal as unreal. It is not at all difficult, but detachment is needed. It is the clinging to the false that makes the true so difficult to see. Once you understand that the false needs time and what needs time is false, you are nearer the reality, which is timeless, ever in the now. Eternity in time is mere repetitiveness, like the movement of a clock. It flows from the past into the future endlessly, an empty perpetuity. Reality is what makes the present so vital, so different from the past and future, which are merely mental. If you need time to achieve something, it must be false. The real is always with you, you need not wait to be what you are. Only you must not allow your mind to go out of yourself in search. When you want something, ask yourself, do I really need it? And if the answer is no, then just drop it. Question. Must I not be happy? I may not need a thing, yet, if it can make me happy, should I not grasp it? Maharaj, nothing can make you happier than you are. All search for happiness is misery and leads to more misery. The only happiness worth the name is the natural happiness of conscious being. Question, don't I need a lot of experience before I can reach such a high level of awareness? Maharaj, experience leaves only memories behind and adds to the burden which is heavy enough. You need no more experiences. The past ones are sufficient. If you feel you need more, look into the hearts of people around you. You will find a variety of experiences which you would not be able to go through in a thousand years. Learn from the sorrows of others and save yourself your own. It is not experience that you need, but the freedom from all experience. Don't be greedy for experience, you need none. Question, don't you pass through experiences yourself? Maharaj, things happen round me, but I take no part in them. An event becomes an experience only when I am emotionally involved. I am in a state which is complete, which seeks not to improve on itself. Of what use is experience to me? Question, one needs knowledge, education. Maharaj, to deal with things, knowledge of things is needed. To deal with people, you need insight, sympathy. To deal with yourself, you need nothing. Be what you are, conscious being and don't stray away from yourself. Question, university education is most useful. Maharaj, no doubt it helps you to earn a living but it does not teach you how to live. You are a student of psychology. It may help you in certain situations. 
But can you live by psychology? Life is worthy of the name only when it reflects reality in action. No university will teach you how to live so that when the time of dying comes you can say, I lived well I do not need to live again. Most of us die wishing we could live again. Though many mistakes committed, so much left undone. Most of the people vegetate but do not live. They merely gather experience and enrich their memory. Experience is the denial of reality, which is neither sensory nor conceptual, neither of the body nor of the mind, though it includes and transcends both. Question, but experience is most useful. By experience you learn not to touch a flame. Maharaj, I have told you already that knowledge is most useful in dealing with things. But it does not tell you how to deal with people and yourself, how to live a life. We are not talking of driving a car or earning money. For this you need experience. But for being a light unto yourself material knowledge will not help you. You need something much more intimate and deeper than mediate knowledge to be yourself in the true sense of the word. Your outer life is unimportant. You can become a night watchman and live happily. It is what you are inwardly that matters. Your inner peace and joy you have to earn. It is much more difficult than earning money. No university can teach you to be yourself. The only way to learn is by practice. Right away begin to be yourself. Discard all you are not and go ever deeper. Just as a man digging a well discards what is not water until he reaches the water-bearing strata, so must you discard what is not your own till nothing is left which you can disown. You will find that what is left is nothing which the mind can hook on to. You are not even a human being. You just are a point of awareness coextensive with time and space and beyond both the ultimate cause itself uncaused. If you ask me, who are you? My answer would be, nothing in particular. Yet I am. Question, if you are nothing in particular then you must be the universal. Maharaj, what is to be universal not as a concept but as a way of life? Not to separate, not to oppose, but to understand and love whatever contacts you is living universally. To be able to say truly, I am the world, the world is me, I am at home in the world, the world is my own. Every existence is my existence, every consciousness is my consciousness, every sorrow is my sorrow and every joy is my joy, this is universal life. Yet, my real being, and yours too, is beyond the universe and therefore beyond the categories of the particular and the universal. It is what it is, totally self-contained and independent. Question, I find it hard to understand. Maharaj, you must give yourself time to brood over these things. The old grooves must be erased in your brain without forming new ones. You must realize yourself as the immovable, behind and beyond the movable, the silent witness of all that happens. Question. Does it mean that I must give up all idea of an active life? Maharaj, not at all. There will be marriage, there will be children, there will be earning money to maintain a family. All this will happen in the natural course of events, for destiny must fulfill itself. You will go through it without resistance, facing tasks as they come, attentive and thorough, both in small things and big. But the general attitude will be of affectionate detachment, enormous goodwill without expectation of return, constant giving without asking. In marriage you are neither the husband nor the wife, you are the love between the two. You are the clarity and kindness that makes everything orderly and happy. It may seem vague to you, but if you think a little, you will find that the mystical is most practical, for it makes your life creatively happy. Your consciousness is raised to a higher dimension, from which you see everything much clearer and with greater intensity. You realize that the person you became at birth and will cease to be at death is temporary and false. 
You are not the sensual, emotional and intellectual person gripped by desires and fears. Find out your real being. What am I? Is the fundamental question of all philosophy and psychology. Go into it deeply. Chapter 67 Experience is not the real thing. Maharaj, the seeker is he who is in search of himself. Soon he discovers that his own body he cannot be. Once the conviction, I am not the body becomes so well grounded that he can no longer feel, think and act for and on behalf of the body, he will easily discover that he is the universal being, knowing, acting, that in him and through him the entire universe is real, conscious and active. This is the heart of the problem. Either you are body conscious and a slave of circumstances, or you are the universal consciousness itself, and in full control of every event. Yet consciousness individual or universal is not my true abode, I am not in it, it is not mine, there is no me in it. I am beyond, though it is not easy to explain how one can be neither conscious, nor unconscious, but just beyond. I cannot say that I am in God or I am God. God is the universal light and love, the universal witness. I am beyond the universal even. Questioner, in that case you are without name and shape. What kind of being have you? Maharaj, I am what I am neither with form nor formless, neither conscious nor unconscious. I am outside all these categories. Question, you are taking the neti neti not this, not this approach. Maharaj, you cannot find me by mere denial. I am as well everything as nothing. Nor both, nor either. These definitions apply to the Lord of the universe, not to me. Question, do you intend to convey that you are just nothing? Maharaj, oh no. I am complete and perfect. I am the beingness of being, the knowingness of knowing, the fullness of happiness. You cannot reduce me to emptiness. Question. If you are beyond words what shall we talk about? Metaphysically speaking what you say holds together, there is no inner contradiction. But there is no food for me in what you say. It is so completely beyond my urgent needs. When I ask for bread, you are giving jewels. They are beautiful no doubt but I am hungry. Maharaj, it is not so. I am offering you exactly what you need awakening. You are not hungry and you need no bread. You need cessation relinquishing disentanglement. What you believe you need is not what you need. Your real need I know, not you. You need to return to the state in which I am, your natural state. Anything else you may think of is an illusion and an obstacle. Believe me, you need nothing except to be what you are. You imagine you will increase your value by acquisition. It is like gold imagining that an addition of copper will improve it. Elimination and purification, renunciation of all that is foreign to your nature is enough. All else is vanity. Question, it is easier said than done. A man comes to you with stomach ache, and you advise him to disgorge his stomach. Of course without the mind there will be no problems. But the mind is there most tangibly. Maharaj, it is the mind that tells you that the mind is there. Don't be deceived. All the endless arguments about the mind are produced by the mind itself, for its own protection, continuation and expansion. It is the blank refusal to consider the convolutions and convulsions of the mind that can take you beyond it. Question, Sir, I am an humble seeker while you are the supreme reality itself. Now the seeker approaches the supreme in order to be enlightened. What does the supreme do? Maharaj, listen to what I keep on telling you and do not move away from it. Think of it all the time and of nothing else. Having reached that far, abandon all thoughts, not only of the world, but of yourself also. Stay beyond all thoughts, in silent being awareness. It is not progress, for what you come to is already there in you waiting for you. 
question, so you say I should try to stop thinking and stay steady in the idea, I am. Maharaj, yes and whatever thoughts come to you in connection with the, I am, empty them of all meaning, pay them no attention. Question, I happen to meet many young people coming from the West and I find that there is a basic difference when I compare them to the Indians. It looks as if their psyche and takarana is different. Concepts like self, reality, pure mind, universal consciousness the Indian mind grasps easily. They ring familiar, they taste sweet. The Western mind does not respond or just rejects them. It concretizes and wants to utilize at once in the service of accepted values. These values are often personal health, well-being, prosperity. Sometimes they are social, a better society, a happier life for all. All are connected with worldly problems, personal or impersonal. Another difficulty one comes across quite often in talking with the Westerners is that to them everything is experience, as they want to experience food, drink and women, art and travels, so do they want to experience yoga, realization and liberation. To them, it is just another experience, to be had for a price. They imagine such experience can be purchased and they bargain about the cost. When one guru quotes too high in terms of time and effort, they go to another who offers installment terms, apparently very easy, but beset with unfulfillable conditions. It is the old story of not thinking of the gray monkey when taking the medicine. In this case it is not thinking of the world, abandoning all selfhood, extinguishing every desire, becoming perfect celibates etc. Naturally there is vast cheating going on all levels and the results are nil. Thumb gurus in sheer desperation abandon all discipline, prescribe no conditions, advise effortlessness, naturalness, simply living in passive awareness, without any pattern of must and must not, and there are many disciples whose past experiences brought them to dislike themselves so badly that they just do not want to look at themselves. They are not disgusted, they are bored. They have surfeit of self-knowledge, they want something else. Maharaj, let them not think of themselves if they do not like it. Let them stay with a guru watch him think of him. Soon they will experience a kind of bliss quite new never experienced before except maybe in childhood. The experience is so unmistakably new that it will attract their attention and create interest. Once the interest is roused, orderly application will follow. Question. These people are very critical and suspicious. It cannot be otherwise having passed through much learning and much disappointment. On one hand they want experience, on the other they mistrust it. How to reach them, God alone knows. Maharaj, true insight and love will reach them. Question, when they have some spiritual experience, another difficulty arises. They complain that the experience does not last, that it comes and goes in a haphazard way. Having got hold of the lollipop, they want to suck it all the time. Maharaj, experience however sublime, is not the real thing. By its very nature it comes and goes. Self-realization is not an acquisition. It is more of the nature of understanding. Once arrived at, it cannot be lost. On the other hand, consciousness is changeful, flowing, undergoing transformation from moment to moment. Do not hold on to consciousness and its contents. Consciousness held, ceases. To try to perpetuate a flash of insight, or a burst of happiness, is destructive of what it wants to preserve. What comes must go. The permanent is beyond all comings and goings. Go to the root of all experience, to the sense of being. Beyond being and not being lies the immensity of the real. Try and try again. Question. To try one needs faith. Maharaj, there must be the desire first. When the desire is strong, the willingness to try will come. You do not need assurance of success when the desire is strong. 
you are ready to gamble. Question, strong desire, strong faith, it comes to the same. These people do not trust either their parents with the society or even themselves. All they touch turn to ashes. Give them one experience, absolutely genuine, indubitable, beyond the argumentations of the mind, and they will follow you to the world's end. Maharaj, but I am doing nothing else. Tirelessly I draw their attention to the one incontrovertible factor, that of being. Being needs no proofs, it proves all else. If only they go deeply into the fact of being and discover the vastness and the glory to which the I am is the door, and cross the door and go beyond, their life will be full of happiness and light. Believe me, the effort needed is as nothing when compared with the discoveries arrived at. Question, what you say is right. These people have neither confidence nor patience. Even a short effort tires them. It is really pathetic to see them groping blindly and yet unable to hold on to the helping hand. They are such nice people fundamentally but totally bewildered. I tell them, you cannot have truth on your own terms. You must accept the conditions. To this they answer, some will accept the conditions and some will not. Acceptance or non-acceptance are superficial and accidental, reality is in all, there must be a way for all to tread, with no conditions attached. Maharaj, there is such a way open to all on every level in every walk of life. Everybody is aware of himself. The deepening and broadening of self-awareness is the royal way. Call it mindfulness or witnessing or just attention, it is for all. None is unripe for it and none can fail. But of course, you must not be merely alert. Your mindfulness must include the mind also. Witnessing is primarily awareness of consciousness and its movements. Chapter 68 Seek the Source of Consciousness Questioner, we were talking the other day about the ways of the modern Western mind and the difficulty it finds in submitting to the moral and intellectual discipline of the Vedanta. One of the obstacles lies in the young Europeans or Americans' preoccupation with the disastrous condition of the world and the urgent need of setting it right. They have no patience with people like you who preach personal improvement as a precondition for the betterment of the world. They say it is neither possible nor necessary. Humanity is ready for a change of systems, social, economic, political. A world government, world police, world planning, and the abolition of all physical and ideological barriers, this is enough, no personal transformation is needed. No doubt people shape society, but society shapes people too. In a humane society people will be humane, besides science provides the answer to many questions which formerly were in the domain of religion. Maharaj, no doubt, Striving for the improvement of the world is a most praiseworthy occupation. Done selflessly, it clarifies the mind and purifies the heart. A zoom man will realize that he pursues a mirage. Local and temporary improvement is always possible and was achieved again and again under the influence of a great king or teacher, but it would soon come to an end, leaving humanity in a new cycle of misery. It is in the nature of all manifestation that the good and the bad follow each other and in equal measure. The true refuge is only in the unmanifested. Question, are you not advising escape? Maharaj, on the contrary. The only way to renewal lies through destruction. You must melt down the old jewelry into formless gold before you can mold a new one. Only the people who have gone beyond the world can change the world. It never happened otherwise. The few whose impact was long-lasting were all knowers of reality. Reach their level and then only talk of helping the world. Question, it is not the rivers and mountains that we want to help but the people. Maharaj, there is nothing wrong with the world but for the people who make it bad. Go and ask them to behave. Question, desire and fear make them behave as they do. Maharaj, 
Exactly. As long as human behavior is dominated by desire and fear, there is not much hope. And to know how to approach the people effectively, you must yourself be free of all desire and fear. Question. Certain basic desires and fears are inevitable, such as are connected with food, sex and death. Maharaj, these are needs and as needs, they are easy to meet. Question. Even death is a need. Maharaj, having lived a long and fruitful life you feel the need to die. Only when wrongly applied, desire and fear are destructive. By all means desire the right and fear the wrong. But when people desire what is wrong and fear what is right, they create chaos and despair. Question, what is right and what is wrong? Maharaj, relatively what causes suffering is wrong, what alleviates it is right. Absolutely, what brings you back to reality is right, and what dims reality is wrong. Question, when we talk of helping humanity, we mean a struggle against disorder and suffering. Maharaj, you merely talk of helping. Have you ever helped, really helped, a single man? Have you ever put one soul beyond the need of further help? Can you give a man character, based on full realization of his duties and opportunities at least, if not on the insight into his true being? When you do not know what is good for yourself, how can you know what is good for others? Question. The adequate supply of means of livelihood is good for all. You may be God himself, but you need a well-fed body to talk to us. Maharaj, it is you that need my body to talk to you. I am not my body, nor do I need it. I am the witness only. I have no shape of my own. You are so accustomed to think of yourselves as bodies having consciousness that you just cannot imagine consciousness as having bodies. Once you realize that bodily existence is but a state of mind, a movement in consciousness, that the ocean of consciousness is infinite and eternal, and that when in touch with consciousness, you are the witness only, you will be able to withdraw beyond consciousness altogether. Question. We are told there are many levels of existences. Do you exit and function on all the levels? While you are on earth are you also in heaven swarga? Maharaj, and nowhere to be found. I am not a thing to be given a place among other things. All things are in me, but I am not among things. You are telling me about the superstructure while I am concerned with the foundations. The superstructures rise and fall, but the foundations last. I am not interested in the transient while you talk of nothing else. Question. Forgive me a strange question. If somebody with a razor-sharp sword would suddenly sever your head, what difference would it make to you? Maharaj, none whatsoever. The body will lose its head, certain lines of communication will be cut, that is all. Two people talk to each other on the phone and the wire is cut. Nothing happens to the people, only they must look for some other means of communication. The Bhagavad Gita says, the sword does not cut it. It is literally so. It is in the nature of consciousness to survive its vehicles. It is like fire. It burns up the fuel, but not itself. Just like a fire can outlast a mountain of fuel, so does consciousness survive innumerable bodies. Question. The fuel affects the flame. Maharaj, as long as it lasts. Change the nature of the fuel and the color and appearance of the flame will change. Now we are talking to each other. For this presence is needed, unless we are present we cannot talk. But presence by itself is not enough. There must also be the desire to talk. Above all, we want to remain conscious. We shall bear every suffering and humiliation, but we shall rather remain conscious. Unless we revolt against this craving for experience and let go the manifested altogether, there can be no relief. We shall remain trapped. Question. You say you are the silent witness and also you are beyond consciousness. Is there no contradiction in it? 
If you are beyond consciousness, what are you witnessing to? Maharaj, I am conscious and unconscious, both conscious and unconscious, neither conscious nor unconscious, to all this I am witness, but really there is no witness, because there is nothing to be a witness to. I am perfectly empty of all mental formations, void of mind, yet fully aware. This I try to express my saying that I am beyond the mind. Question, how can I reach you then? Maharaj, be aware of being conscious and seek the source of consciousness. That is all. Very little can be conveyed in words. It is the doing as I tell you that will bring light, not my telling you. The means do not matter much. It is the desire, the urge, the earnestness that count. Chapter 69 Transiency is proof of unreality. Questioner, my friend is a German and I was born in England from French parents. I am in India since over a year wandering from ashram to ashram. Maharaj, any spiritual practices, sadhanas? Question, studies and meditation. Maharaj, what did you meditate on? Question, on what I read. Maharaj, good. Question, what are you doing, sir? Maharaj, sitting. Question, and what else? Maharaj, talking. Question, what are you talking about? Maharaj, do you want a lecture? Better ask something that really touches you so that you feel strongly about it. Unless you are emotionally involved, you may argue with me, but there will be no real understanding between us. If you say, nothing worries me, I have no problems, it is all right with me, we can keep quiet. But if something really touches you, then there is purpose in talking. Shall I ask you? What is the purpose of your moving from place to place? Question, to meet people, to try to understand them. Maharaj, what people are you trying to understand? What exactly are you after? Question, integration. Maharaj, if you want integration, you must know whom you want to integrate. Question, by meeting people and watching them, one comes to know oneself also. It goes together. Maharaj, it does not necessarily go together. Question, one improves the other. Maharaj, it does not work that way. The mirror reflects the image, but the image does not improve the mirror. You are neither the mirror nor the image in the mirror. Having perfected the mirror so that it reflects correctly, truly, you can turn the mirror round and see in it a true reflection of yourself, true as far as the mirror can reflect. But the reflection is not yourself, you are the seer of the reflection. To understand it clearly whatever you may perceive you are not what you perceive. Question. I am the mirror and the world is the image. Maharaj, you can see both the image and the mirror. You are neither. Who are you? Don't go by formulas. The answer is not in words. The nearest you can say in words is, I am what makes perception possible, the life beyond the experiencer and his experience. Now, can you separate yourself both from the mirror and the image in the mirror and stand completely alone, all by yourself? Question. No, I cannot. Maharaj, how do you know that you cannot? There are so many things you are doing without knowing how to do it. You digest, you circulate your blood and lymph, you move your muscles, all without knowing how. In the same way, you perceive, you feel, you think without knowing the why and how of it. Similarly you are yourself without knowing it. There is nothing wrong with you as the self. It is what it is to perfection. It is the mirror that is not clear and true and therefore gives you false images. You need not correct yourself, only set right your idea of yourself. Learn to separate yourself from the image and the mirror, keep on remembering. I am neither the mind nor its ideas, 
Do it patiently and with convictions, and you will surely come to the direct vision of yourself as the source of being, knowing, loving, eternal, all-embracing, all-pervading. You are the infinite focused in a body. Now you see the body only. Try earnestly, and you will come to see the infinite only. Question. The experience of reality when it comes, does it last? Maharaj, all experience is necessarily transient. But the ground of all experience is immovable. Nothing that may be called an event will last. But some events purify the mind and some stain it. Moments of deep insight and all-embracing love purify the mind while desires and fears, envies and anger, blind beliefs and intellectual arrogance pollute and dull the psyche. Question. Is self-realization so important? Maharaj, without it you will be consumed by desires and fears, repeating themselves meaninglessly in endless suffering. Most of the people do not know that there can be an end to pain. But once they have heard the good news, obviously going beyond all strife and struggle is the most urgent task that can be. You know that you can be free and now it is up to you. Either you remain forever hungry and thirsty, longing, searching, grabbing, holding, ever losing and sorrowing, or go out wholeheartedly in search of the state of timeless perfection to which nothing can be added, from which nothing taken away. Yet all desires and fears are absent, not because they were given up, but because they have lost their meaning. Question. So far I have been following you. Now what am I expected to do? Maharaj, there is nothing to do. Just be. Do nothing. Be. No climbing mountains and sitting in caves. I do not even say, be yourself since you do not know yourself. Just be. Having seen that you are neither the outer world of perceivables nor the inner world of thinkables, that you are neither body nor mind, just be. Question. Surely there are degrees of realization. Maharaj, there are no steps to self-realization. There's nothing gradual about it. It happens suddenly and is irreversible. You rotate into a new dimension, seen from which the previous ones are mere abstractions. Just like on sunrise, you see things as they are, so on self-realization you see everything as it is. The world of illusions is left behind. Question. In the state of realization do things change? They become colorful and full of meaning? Maharaj, the experience is quite right, but it is not the experience of reality Sadhanabhav, but of harmony Sadhanabhav of the universe. Question, nevertheless there is progress. Maharaj, there can be progress only in the preparation Sadhana. Realization is sudden. The fruit ripens slowly, but falls suddenly and without return. Question, I am physically and mentally at peace. What more do I need? Maharaj, yours may not be the ultimate state. You will recognize that you have returned to your natural state by a complete absence of all desire and fear. After all, at the root of all desire and fear is the feeling of not being what you are. Just as a dislocated joint pains only as long as it is out of shape, and is forgotten as soon as it is set right, so is all self-concern a symptom of mental distortion which disappears as soon as one is in the normal state. Question. Yes, but what is the sadhana for achieving the natural state? Maharaj, hold on to the sense I am to the exclusion of everything else. When thus the mind becomes completely silent, it shines with a new light and vibrates with new knowledge. It all comes spontaneously, you need only hold on to the I am. Just like emerging from sleep or a state of rapture you feel rested and yet you cannot explain why and how you come to feel so well, in the same way on realization you feel complete, fulfilled, free from the pleasure-pain complex, and yet not always able to explain what happened, why and how. You can put it only in negative terms. Nothing is wrong with me any longer. It is only by comparison with the past that you know that you are out of it. 
otherwise you are just yourself. Don't try to convey it to others. If you can, it is not the real thing. Be silent and watch it expressing itself in action. Question. If you could tell me what I shall become, it may help me to watch over my development. Maharaj, how can anybody tell you what you shall become when there is no becoming? You merely discover what you are. All molding oneself to a pattern is a grievous waste of time. Think neither of the past nor of the future, just be. Question, how can I just be? Changes are inevitable. Maharaj, changes are inevitable in the changeful, but you are not subject to them. You are the changeless background against which changes are perceived. Question. Everything changes, the background also changes. There is no need of a changeless background to notice changes. The self is momentary, it is merely the point where the past meets the future. Maharaj, of course the self based on memory is momentary. But such self demands unbroken continuity behind it. You know from experience that there are gaps when your self is forgotten. What brings it back to life? What wakes you up in the morning? There must be some constant factor bridging the gaps in consciousness. If you watch carefully, you will find that even your daily consciousness is in flashes, with gaps intervening all the time. What is in the gaps? What can there be but your real being that is timeless? Mind and mindlessness are one to it. Question. Is there any particular place you would advise me to go to for spiritual attainment? Maharaj, the only proper place is within. The outer world neither can help nor hinder. No system, no pattern of action will take you to your goal. Give up all working for a future, concentrate totally on the now, be concerned only with your response to every movement of life as it happens. Question. What is the cause of the urge to roam about? Maharaj, there is no cause. You merely dream that you roam about. In a few years your stay in India will appear as a dream to you. You will dream some other dream at that time. Do realize that it is not you who moves from dream to dream, but the dreams flow before you and you are the immutable witness. No happening affects your real being, this is the absolute truth. Question, cannot I move about physically and keep steady inwardly? Maharaj, you can but what purpose does it serve? If you are earnest, you will find that in the end, you will get fed up with roaming and regret the waste of energy and time. To find yourself you need not take a single step. Question, is there any difference between the experience of the self-atman and of the absolute Brahman? Maharaj, there can be no experience of the Absolute as it is beyond all experience. On the other hand, the Self is the experiencing factor in every experience and thus, in a way, validates the multiplicity of experiences. The world may be full of things of great value, but if there is nobody to buy them, they have no price. The Absolute contains everything experienceable, but without the experience they are as nothing. That which makes the experience possible is the Absolute. That which makes it actual is the Self. Question. Don't we reach the Absolute through a gradation of experiences? Beginning with the grossest, we end with the most sublime. Maharaj, there can be no experience without desire for it. There can be gradation between desires, but between the most sublime desire and the freedom from all desire there is an abyss which must be crossed. The unreal may look real, but it is transient. The real is not afraid of time. Question. Is not the unreal the expression of the real? Maharaj, how can it be? It is like saying that truth expresses itself in dreams. To the real the unreal is not. It appears to be real only because you believe in it. Doubt it and it ceases. When you are in love with somebody, you give it reality, you imagine your love to be all-powerful and everlasting. When it comes to an end you say, I thought it was real, but it wasn't. 
Transiency is the best proof of unreality. What is limited in time and space and applicable to one person only is not real. The real is for all and forever. Above everything else you cherish yourself. You would accept nothing in exchange for your existence. The desire to be is the strongest of all desires and will go only on the realization of your true nature. Question, even in the unreal there is a touch of reality. Maharaj, yes the reality you impart to it by taking it to be real. Having convinced yourself, you are bound by your conviction. When the sun shines colors appear. When it sets they disappear. Where are the colors without the light? Question. This is thinking in terms of duality. Maharaj, all thinking is in duality. Identity no thought survives. Chapter 70. God is the end of all desire and knowledge. Maharaj, where are you coming from? What have you come for? Questioner, I come from America and my friend is from the Republic of Ireland. I came about six months ago, and I was traveling from ashram to ashram. My friend came on his own. Maharaj, what have you seen? Question, I have been at Sri Ramanashram and also I have visited Rishikesh. Can I ask you, what is your opinion of Sri Ramana Maharshi? Maharaj, we are both in the same ancient state. But what do you know of Maharshi? You take yourself to be a name and a body, so all you perceive are names and bodies. Question, were you to meet the Maharshi what would happen? Maharaj, probably we would feel quite happy. We may even exchange a few words. Question, but would he recognize you as a liberated man? Maharaj, of course. As a man recognizes a man, so a Jani recognizes a Jani. You cannot appreciate what you have not experienced. You are what you think yourself to be, but you cannot think yourself to be what you have not experienced. Question. To become an engineer, I must learn engineering. To become God, what must I learn? Maharaj, you must unlearn everything. God is the end of all desire and knowledge. Question. You mean to say that I become God merely by giving up the desire to become God? Maharaj, all desires must be given up, because by desiring you take the shape of your desires. When no desires remain, you revert to your natural state. Question, how do I come to know that I have achieved perfection? Maharaj, you cannot know perfection, you can know only imperfection. For knowledge to be, there must be separation and disharmony. You can know what you are not, but you cannot know your real being. You can be only what you are. The entire approach is through understanding, which is in the seeing of the false as false. But to understand, you must observe from outside. Question. The Vedantic concept of Maya, illusion, applies to the manifested. Therefore our knowledge of the manifested is unreliable. But we should be able to trust our knowledge of the unmanifested. Maharaj, there can be no knowledge of the unmanifested. The potential is unknowable. Only the actual can be known. Question, why should the knower remain unknown? Maharaj, the knower knows the known. Do you know the knower? Who is the knower of the knower? You want to know the unmanifested. Can you say you know the manifested? Question. I know things and ideas and their relations. It is the sum total of all my experiences. Maharaj, all? Question. Well, all actual experiences. I admit, I cannot know what did not happen. Maharaj. If the manifested is the sum total of all actual experiences, including their experiencers, how much of the total do you know? A very small part indeed. And what is the little you know? Question. Some sensory experiences as related to myself. Maharaj, not even that. You only know that you react. Who reacts into what you do not know? 
you know on contact that you exist I am. I am this I am that are imaginary. Question, I know the manifested because I participate in it. I admit my part in it is very small, yet it is as real as the totality of it. And what is more important, I give it meaning. Without me the world is dark and silent. Maharaj, a firefly illumining the world. You don't give meaning to the world, you find it. Dive deep into yourself and find the source from where all meaning flows. Surely it is not the superficial mind that can give meaning. Question, what makes me limited and superficial? Maharaj, the total is open and available but you will not take it. You are attached to the little person you think yourself to be. Your desires are narrow, your ambitions petty. After all, without a center of perception where would be the manifested? Unperceived, the manifested is as good as the unmanifested. And you are the perceiving point, the non-dimensional source of all dimensions. Know yourself as the total. Question, how can a point contain a universe? Maharaj, there is enough space in a point for an infinity of universes. There is no lack of capacity. Self-limitation is the only problem. But you cannot run away from yourself. However far you go, you come back to yourself and to the need of understanding this point, which is as nothing and yet the source of everything. Question. I came to India in search of a yoga teacher. I am still in search. Maharaj, what kind of yoga do you want to practice the yoga of getting, or the yoga of giving up? Question. Don't they come to the same in the end? Maharaj, how can they? One enslaves, the other liberates. The motive matters supremely. Freedom comes through renunciation. All possession is bondage. Question, would I have the strength and the courage to hold on to, why should I give up? And if I have not the strength, how can I give up? I do not understand this need of giving up. When I want something, why should I not pursue it? Renunciation is for the weak. Maharaj, if you do not have the wisdom and the strength to give up, just look at your possessions. Your mere looking will burn them up. If you can stand outside your mind, you will soon find that total renunciation of possessions and desires is the most obviously reasonable thing to do. You create the world and then worry about it. Becoming selfish makes you weak. If you think you have the strength and courage to desire, it is because you are young and inexperienced. Invariably the object of desire destroys the means of acquiring it, and then itself withers away. It is all for the best because it teaches you to shun desire like poison. Question, how am I to practice desirelessness? Maharaj, no need of practice. No need of any acts of renunciation. Just turn your mind away, that is all. Desire is merely the fixation of the mind on an idea. Get out of its groove by denying it attention. Question, that is all. Maharaj, yes, that is all. Whatever may be the desire or fear, don't dwell upon it. Try and see for yourself. Here and there you may forget, it does not matter. Go back to your attempts, to the brushing away of every desire and fear, of every reaction becomes automatic. Question. How can one live without emotions? Maharaj, you can have all the emotions you want, but beware of reactions, of induced emotions. Be entirely self-determined and ruled from within, not from without. Merely giving up a thing to secure a better one is not true relinquishment. Give it up because you see its valuelessness. As you keep on giving up, you will find that you grow spontaneously in intelligence and power and inexhaustible love and joy. Question, why so much insistence on relinquishing all desires and fears? Are they not natural? Maharaj, they are not. They are entirely mind-made. You have to give up everything to know that you need nothing, not even your body. Your needs are unreal and your efforts are meaningless. 
You imagine that your possessions protect you. In reality they make you vulnerable, realize yourself as away from all that can be pointed at as this or that. You are unreachable by any sensory experience or verbal construction. Turn away from them. Refuse to impersonate. Question, after I have heard you, what am I to do? Maharaj, only hearing will not help you much. You must keep it in mind and ponder over it and try to understand the state of mind which makes me say what I say. I speak from truth, stretch your hand and take it. You are not what you think yourself to be, I assure you. The image you have of yourself is made up from memories and is purely accidental. Question, what I am is the result of my karma. Maharaj, what you appear to be you are not. Karma is only a word you have learned to repeat. You have never been nor shall ever be a person. Refuse to consider yourself as one. But as long as you do not even doubt yourself to be a mistress zero and so, there is little hope. When you refuse to open your eyes, what can you be shown? Question. I imagine karma to be a mysterious power that urges me towards perfection. Maharaj, that's what people told you. You are already perfect here and now. The perfectible is not you. You imagine yourself to be what you are not stop it. It is the cessation that is important, not what you are going to stop. Question, did not karma compel me to become what I am? Maharaj, nothing compels. You are as you believe yourself to be. Stop believing. Question. Here you are sitting on your seat and talking to me. What compels you is your karma. Maharaj, nothing compels me. I do what needs doing. But you do so many unnecessary things. It is your refusal to examine that creates karma. It is the indifference to your own suffering that perpetuates it. Question. Yes, it is true. What can put an end to this indifference? Maharaj, the urge must come from within as a wave of detachment or compassion. Question, could I meet this urge halfway? Maharaj, of course. To your own condition, see the condition of the world. Question, we were told about karma and reincarnation, evolution and yoga masters and disciples. What are we to do with all this knowledge? Maharaj, leave it all behind you. Forget it. Go forth unburdened with ideas and beliefs. Abandon all verbal structures, all relative truth, all tangible objectives. The absolute can be reached by absolute devotion only. Don't be half-hearted. Question. I must begin with some absolute truth. Is there any? Maharaj. Yes, there is the feeling. I am. Begin with that. Question. Nothing else is true. Maharaj, all else is neither true nor false. It seems real when it appears, it disappears when it is denied. A transient thing is a mystery. Question. I thought the real is the mystery. Maharaj, how can it be? The real is simple, open, clear and kind, beautiful and joyous. It is completely free of contradictions. It is ever new, ever fresh, endlessly creative. Being and non-being, life and death, all distinctions merge in it. Question. I can admit that all is false. But does it make my mind non-existent? Maharaj, the mind is what it thinks. To make it true, think true. Question. If the shape of things is mere appearance, what are they in reality? Maharaj, in reality there is only perception. The perceiver and the perceived are conceptual, the fact of perceiving is actual. Question, where does the absolute come in? Maharaj, the absolute is the birthplace of perceiving. It makes perception possible. But too much analysis leads you nowhere. There is in you the core of being which is beyond analysis, beyond the mind. You can know it in action only. 
express it in daily life and its light will grow ever brighter. The legitimate function of the mind is to tell you what is not. But if you want positive knowledge, you must go beyond the mind. Question, in all the universe is there one single thing of value? Maharaj, yes, the power of love. Chapter 71, in self-awareness you learn about yourself. Questioner, it is our repeated experience that the disciples do much harm to their gurus. They make plans and carry them out without considering the guru's wishes. In the end there is only endless worry for the guru and bitterness for his disciples. Maharaj, yes, it does happen. Question, who compels the guru to submit to these indignities? Maharaj, the guru is basically without desire. He sees what happens but feels no urge to interfere. He makes no choices, takes no decisions. As pure witness, he watches what is going on and remains unaffected. Question, but his work suffers. Maharaj, victory is always his in the end. He knows that if the disciples do not learn from his words, they will learn from their own mistakes. Inwardly he remains quiet and silent. He has no sense of being a separate person. The entire universe is his own, including his disciples with their petty plans. Nothing in particular affects him, or which comes to the same the entire universe affects him in equal measure. Question. Is there no such thing as the Guru's grace? Maharaj, his grace is constant and universal. It is not given to one and denied to another. Question. How does it affect me personally? Maharaj, it is by the Guru's grace that your mind is engaged in search for truth, and it is by his grace that you will find it. It works unwearingly towards your ultimate good. And it is for all. Question, some disciples are ready mature and some are not. Must not the Guru exercise choice and make decisions? Maharaj, the Guru knows the ultimate and relentlessly propels the disciple towards it. The disciple is full of obstacles, which he himself must overcome. The Guru is not very much concerned with the superficialities of the disciple's life. It is like gravitation the fruit must fall when no longer held back. Question. If the disciple does not know the goal, how can he make out the obstacles? Maharaj, the goal is shown by the Guru obstacles are discovered by the disciple. The Guru has no preferences, but those who have obstacles to overcome seem to be lagging behind. In reality the disciple is not different from the Guru. He is the same dimensionless center of perception and love in action. It is only his imagination and self-identification with the imagined that encloses him and converts him into a person. The Guru is concerned little with the person. His attention is on the inner watcher. It is the task of the watcher to understand and thereby eliminate the person. While there is grace on one side, there must be dedication to the task on the other. Question, but the person does not want to be eliminated. Maharaj, the person is merely the result of a misunderstanding. In reality there is no such thing. Feelings, thoughts and actions race before the watcher in endless succession, leaving traces in the brain and creating an illusion of continuity. A reflection of the watcher in the mind creates the sense of I and the person acquires an apparently independent existence. In reality there is no person, only the watcher identifying himself with the I and the mind. Teacher tells the watcher, you are not this, there is nothing of yours in this, except the little point of I am, which is the bridge between the watcher and his dream. I am this I am that is dream, while pure I am has the stamp of reality on it. You have tasted so many things all came to naught. Only the sense I am persisted unchanged. Stay with the changeless among the changeful until you are able to go beyond. Question, when will it happen? Maharaj, it will happen as soon as you remove the obstacles. 
question with obstacles. Maharaj, desire for the false and fear of the true. You, as the person, imagine that the Guru is interested in you as a person. Not at all. To him you are a nuisance and a hindrance to be done away with. He actually aims at your elimination as a factor in consciousness. Question. If I am eliminated, what will remain? Maharaj, nothing will remain, all will remain. The sense of identity will remain, but no longer identification with a particular body. Being awareness, love will shine in full splendor. Liberation is never of the person, it is always from the person. Question, and no trace remains of the person. Maharaj, a vague memory remains like the memory of a dream or early childhood. After all, what is there to remember? A flow of events, mostly accidental and meaningless. A sequence of desires and fears and inane blunders. Is there anything worth remembering? The person is but a shell imprisoning you. Break the shell. Question, whom are you asking to break the shell? Who is to break the shell? Maharaj, break the bonds of memory and self-identification and the shell will break by itself. There is a center that imparts reality to whatever it perceives. All you need is to understand that you are the source of reality, that you give reality instead of getting it, that you need no support and no confirmation. Things are as they are because you accept them as they are. Stop accepting them and they will dissolve. Whatever you think about with desire or fear appears before you as real. Look at it without desire or fear and it does lose substance. Pleasure and pain are momentary. It is simpler and easier to disregard them than to act on them. Question. If all things come to an end, why do they appear at all? Maharaj, creation is in the very nature of consciousness. Consciousness causes appearances. Reality is beyond consciousness. Question, while we are conscious of appearances, how is it that we are not conscious that these are mere appearances? Maharaj, the mind covers up reality without knowing it. To know the nature of the mind, you need intelligence, the capacity to look at the mind in silent and dispassionate awareness. Question. If I am of the nature of all-pervading consciousness, how could ignorance and illusion happen to me? Maharaj, neither ignorance nor illusion ever happened to you. Find the self to which you ascribe ignorance and illusion and your question will be answered. You talk as if you know the self and see it to be under the sway of ignorance and illusion. But in fact, you do not know the self, nor are you aware of ignorance. By all means become aware, this will bring you to the self and you will realize that there is neither ignorance nor delusion in it. It is like saying, if there is sun, how can darkness be? As under a stone, there will be darkness, however strong the sunlight. So in the shadow of the, I am the body consciousness, there must be ignorance and illusion. Question, but why did the body consciousness come into being? Maharaj, don't ask why ask how. It is in the nature of creative imagination to identify itself with its creations. You can stop at any moment by switching off attention. Or through investigation. Question. Does creation come before investigation? Maharaj, first you create a world, then the I am becomes a person who is not happy for various reasons. He goes out in search of happiness, meets a guru who tells him, you are not a person, find who you are. He does it and goes beyond. Question, why did he not do it at the very start? Maharaj, it did not occur to him. He needed somebody to tell him. Question, was that enough? Maharaj, it was enough. Question, why does it not work in my case? Maharaj, you do not trust me. Question, why is my faith weak? Maharaj, desires and fears have dulled your mind. 
it needs some scrubbing. Question, how can I clear my mind? Maharaj, by watching it relentlessly. Inattention obscures, attention clarifies. Question, why do the Indian teachers advocate inactivity? Maharaj, most of people's activities are valueless, if not outright destructive. Dominated by desire and fear, they can do nothing good. Ceasing to do evil precedes beginning to do good. Hence the need for stopping all activities for a time, to investigate one's urges and their motives, see all that is false in one's life, purge the mind of all evil, and then only restart work, beginning with one's obvious duties. Of course, if you have a chance to help somebody, by all means do it and promptly too, don't keep him waiting till you are perfect. But do not become a professional do-gooder. Question. I do not feel there are too many do-gooders among disciples. Most of those I met are too absorbed in their own petty conflicts. They have no heart for others. Maharaj, such self-centeredness is temporary. Be patient with such people. For so many years they gave attention to everything but themselves. Let them turn to themselves for a change. Question, what are the fruits of self-awareness? Maharaj, you grow more intelligent. In awareness you learn. In self-awareness you learn about yourself. Of course, you can only learn what you are not. To know what you are, you must go beyond the mind. Question, is not awareness beyond the mind? Maharaj, awareness is the point at which the mind reaches out beyond itself into reality. In awareness you seek not what pleases, but what is true. Question, I find that awareness brings about a state of inner silence, a state of psychic void. Maharaj, it is all right as it goes, but it is not enough. Have you felt the all-embracing emptiness in which the universe swims like a cloud in the blue sky? Question, sir, let me first come to know well my own inner space. Maharaj, destroy the wall that separates, the I am the body idea and the inner and the outer will become one. Question, am I to die? Maharaj, physical destruction is meaningless. It is the clinging to sensate life that binds you. If you could experience the inner void fully, the explosion into the totality would be near. Question, my own spiritual experience has its seasons. Sometimes I feel glorious, then again I am down. I'm like a little boy going up, going down, going up, going down. Maharaj, all changes in consciousness are due to the I am the body idea. Divested of this idea the mind becomes steady. There is pure being free of experiencing anything in particular. But to realize it, you must do what your teacher tells you. Mere listening, even memorizing, is not enough. You do not struggle hard to apply every word of it in your daily life. Don't complain that you made no progress. All real progress is irreversible. Ups and downs merely show that the teaching has not been taken to heart and translated into action fully. Question. The other day, you told us that there is no such thing as karma. Yet we see that everything has a cause and the sum total of all the causes may be called karma. Maharaj, as long as you believe yourself to be a body, you will ascribe causes to everything. I do not say things have no causes. Each thing has innumerable causes. It is as it is because the world is as it is. Every cause in its ramifications covers the universe. When you realize that you are absolutely free to be what you consent to be, that you are what you appear to be because of ignorance or indifference, you are free to revolt and change. You allow yourself to be what you are not. You are looking for the causes of being what you are not. It is a futile search. There are no causes, but your ignorance of your real being, which is perfect and beyond all causation. For whatever happens, all the universe is responsible and you are the source of the universe. Question. I know nothing about being the cause of the universe. 
Maharaj, because you do not investigate. Inquire, search within and you will know. Question, how can a speck like me create the vast universe? Maharaj, when you are infected with the, I am the body virus, a whole universe springs into being. But when you have had enough of it, you cherish some fanciful ideas about liberation and pursue lines of action totally futile. You concentrate, you meditate, you torture your mind and body, you do all sorts of unnecessary things, but you miss the essential which is the elimination of the person. Question. In the beginning we may have to pray and meditate for some time before we are ready for self-inquiry. Maharaj, if you believe so go on. To me all delay is a waste of time. You can skip all the preparation and go directly for the ultimate search within. Of all the yogas, it is the simplest and the shortest. Chapter 72 What is pure, unalloyed, unattached is real. Maharaj, you are back in India. Where have you been? What have you seen? Questioner, I come from Switzerland. I stayed there with a remarkable man who claims to have realized. He has done many yogas in his past and had many experiences that passed away. Now he claims no special abilities nor knowledge. The only unusual thing about him is connected with sensations. He is unable to separate the seer from the seen. For instance, when he sees a car rushing at him, he does not know whether the car is rushing at him or he at a car. He seems to be both at the same time the seer and the seen. They become one. Whatever he sees, he sees himself. When I asked him some Vedantic questions, he said, I really cannot answer. I do not know. All I know is this strange identity with whatever I perceive. You know, I expected anything but this. He's on the whole a humble man, he makes no disciples and in no way puts himself on a pedestal. He's willing to talk about his strange condition, but that is all. Maharaj, now he knows what he knows. All else is over. At least he still talks. Soon he may cease talking. Question, what will he do then? Maharaj, immobility and silence are not inactive. The flower fills the space with perfume, the candle with light. They do nothing yet they change everything by their mere presence. You can photograph the candle, but not its light. You can know the man, his name and appearance, but not his influence. His very presence is action. Question. Is it not natural to be active? Maharaj, everybody wants to be active, but where do his actions originate? There is no central point each action begets another meaninglessly and painfully, in endless succession. The alternation of work and pause is not there. First find the immutable center where all movement takes birth. Just like a wheel turns round an axle, so must you be always at the axle in the center, and not whirling at the periphery. Question, how do I go about it in practice? Maharaj, whenever a thought or emotion of desire or fear comes to your mind, just turn away from it. Question, by suppressing my thoughts and feelings I shall provoke a reaction. Maharaj, I am not talking of suppression. Just refuse attention. Question. Must I not use effort to arrest the movements of the mind? Maharaj, it has nothing to do with effort. Just turn away, look between the thoughts rather than at the thoughts. When you happen to walk in a crowd, you do not fight every man you meet, you just find your way between. Question. If I use my will to control the mind, it only strengthens the ego. Maharaj, of course. When you fight, you invite a fight. But when you do not resist, you meet with no resistance. When you refuse to play the game, you are out of it. Question, how long will it take me to get free of the mind? Maharaj, it may take a thousand years, but really no time is required. All you need is to be in dead earnest. Here the will is the deed. If you are sincere, you have it. After all, 
It is a matter of attitude. Nothing stops you from being a Johnny here and now except fear. You are afraid of being impersonal, of impersonal being. It is all quite simple. Turn away from your desires and fears and from the thoughts they create and you are at once in your natural state. Question. No question of reconditioning, changing, or eliminating the mind. Maharaj, absolutely none. Leave your mind alone, that is all. Don't go along with it. After all, there is no such thing as mind apart from thoughts which come and go obeying their own laws, not yours. They dominate you only because you are interested in them. It is exactly as Christ said, resist not evil. By resisting evil you merely strengthen it. Question. Yes I see now. All I have to do is to deny existence to evil. Then it fades away. But does it not boil down to some kind of auto-suggestion? Maharaj, the auto-suggestion is in full swing now when you think yourself to be a person caught between good and evil. What I am asking you to do is to put an end to it to wake up and see things as they are. About your stay in Switzerland with that strange friend of yours, what did you gain in his company? Question. Nothing absolutely. His experience did not affect me at all. One thing I have understood, there is nothing to search for. Wherever I may go, nothing waits for me at the end of the journey. Discovery is not the result of transportation. Maharaj, yes, you are quite apart from anything that can be gained or lost. Question, do you call it varagia, relinquishment, renunciation? Maharaj, there is nothing to renounce. Enough if you stop acquiring. To give you must have, and to have you must take. Better don't take. It is simpler than to practice renunciation, which leads to a dangerous form of spiritual pride. All this weighing, selecting, choosing, exchanging, it is all shopping in some spiritual market. What is your business there? What deal are you out to strike? When you are not out for business, what is the use of this endless anxiety of choice? Restlessness takes you nowhere. Something prevents you from seeing that there is nothing you need. Find it out and see its falseness. It is like having swallowed some poison and suffering from unquenchable craving for water. Instead of drinking beyond all measure, why not eliminate the poison and be free of this burning thirst? Question. I shall have to eliminate the ego. Maharaj, the sense I am a person in time and space is the poison. In a way time itself is the poison. In time all things come to an end and you are born to be devoured in their turn. Do not identify yourself with time. Do not ask anxiously, what next, what next? Step out of time and see it devour the world. Say, well, it is in the nature of time to put an end to everything. Let it be. It does not concern me. I am not combustible, nor do I need to collect fuel. Question. Can the witness be without the things to witness? Maharaj, there is always something to witness. If not a thing then, it's absence. Witnessing is natural and no problem. The problem is excessive interest, leading to self-identification. Whatever you are engrossed in you take to be real. Question. Is the I am real or unreal? Is I am the witness? Is the witness real or unreal? Maharaj, what is pure unalloyed unattached is real. What is tainted mixed up, dependent and transient is unreal. Do not be misled by words, one word may convey several and even contradictory meanings. The I am that pursues the pleasant and shuns the unpleasant is false. The I am that sees pleasure and pain as inseparable sees rightly. The witness that is enmeshed in what he perceives is the person. The witness who stands aloof, unmoved and untouched, is the watchtower of the real, the point at which awareness, inherent in the unmanifested, contacts the manifested. 
There can be no universe without the witness. There can be no witness without the universe. Question: Time consumes the world. Who is the witness of time? Maharaj, he who is beyond time, the unnameable. A glowing ember moved round and round quickly enough appears as a glowing circle. When the movement ceases, the ember remains. Similarly, the I am in movement creates the world. The I am at peace becomes the absolute. You are like a man with an electric torch walking through a gallery. You can see only what is within the beam. The rest is in darkness. Question: If I project the world, I should be able to change it. Maharaj, of course you can. But you must cease identifying yourself with it and go beyond. Then you have the power to destroy and recreate. Question: All I want is to be free. Maharaj, you must know two things: what are you to be free from, and what keeps you bound. Question: Why do you want to annihilate the universe? Maharaj, I am not concerned with the universe. Let it be or not be. It is enough if I know myself. Question: If you are beyond the world, then you are of no use to the world. Maharaj, pity the self that is not the world that is not. Engrossed in a dream, you have forgotten your true self. Question: Without the world, there is no place for love. Maharaj, quite so. All these attributes, being consciousness, love, and beauty, are reflections of the real in the world. No real, no reflection. Question: The world is full of desirable things and people. How can I imagine it non-existent? Maharaj, leave the desirable to those who desire. Change the current of your desire from taking to giving. The passion for giving, for sharing, will naturally wash the idea of an external world out of your mind, and of giving as well. Only the pure radiance of love will remain beyond giving and receiving. Question: In love, there must be duality, the lover and the beloved. Maharaj, in love there is not the one even. How can there be two? Love is the refusal to separate, to make distinctions. Before you can think of unity, you must first create duality. When you truly love, you do not say, "I love you." Where there is mentation, there is duality. Question: What is it that brings me again and again to India? It cannot be only the comparative cheapness of life here, nor the colorfulness and variety of impressions. There must be some more important factor. Maharaj, there is also the spiritual aspect. The division between the outer and the inner is less in India. It is easier here to express the inner and the outer. Integration is easier. Society is not so oppressive. Question: Yes, in the West it is all tamas and rajas. In India there is more of sava, of harmony and balance. Maharaj, can't you go beyond the gunas? Why choose the sattva? Be what you are, wherever you are, and worry not about gunas. Question: I have not the strength, Maharaj. It merely shows that you have gained little in India. What you truly have, you cannot lose. We well grounded in yourself. Change of place would not affect it. Question: In India, spiritual life is easy. It is not so in the West. One has to conform to environment to a much greater extent. Maharaj, why don't you create your own environment? The world has only as much power over you as you give it. Rebel, go beyond duality. Make no difference between east and west. Question: What can one do when one finds oneself in a very unspiritual environment? Maharaj, do nothing. Be yourself. Stay out. Look beyond. Question: There may be clashes at home. Parents rarely understand. Maharaj, when you know your true being, you have no problems. You may please your parents or not marry or not make a lot of money or not. It is all the same to you. Just act according to circumstances. 
yet in close touch with the facts, with the reality in every situation. Question, is it not a very high state? Maharaj, oh no, it is the normal state. You call it high because you are afraid of it. First be free from fear. See that there is nothing to be afraid of. Fearlessness is the door to the supreme. Question, no amount of effort can make me fearless. Maharaj, fearlessness comes by itself when you see that there is nothing to be afraid of. When you walk in a crowded street, you just bypass people. Some you see, some you just glance at, but you do not stop. It is the stopping that creates the bottleneck. Keep moving. Disregard names and shapes, don't be attached to them, your attachment is your bondage. Question, what should I do when a man slaps me on my face? Maharaj, you will react according to your character inborn or acquired. Question, is it inevitable? Am I, is the world condemned to remain as we are? Maharaj, a jeweler who wants to refashion an ornament first melts it down to shapeless gold. Similarly, one must return to one's original state before a new name and form can emerge. Death is essential for renewal. Question, you are always stressing the need of going beyond, of aloofness, of solitude. You hardly ever use the words right and wrong. Why is it so? Maharaj, it is right to be oneself, it is wrong not to be. All else is conditional. You are eager to separate right from wrong because you need some basis for action. You are always after doing something or other. But personally motivated action, based on some scale of values, aiming at some result is worse than inaction, for its fruits are always bitter. Question, are awareness and love one and the same? Maharaj, of course. Awareness is dynamic, love is being. Awareness is love in action. By itself the mind can actualize any number of possibilities, but unless they are prompted by love, they are valueless. Love precedes creation. Without it there is only chaos. Question, where is the action in awareness? Maharaj, you are so incurably operational. Unless there is movement restlessness turmoil, you do not call it action. Chaos is movement for movement's sake. True action does not displace, it transforms. A change of place is mere transportation. A change of heart is action. Just remember nothing perceivable is real. Activity is not action. Action is hidden, unknown, unknowable. You only know the fruit. Question. Is not God the all-doer? Maharaj, why do you bring in an outer doer? The world recreates itself out of itself. It is an endless process, the transitory begetting the transitory. It is your ego that makes you think that there must be a doer. You create a god to your own image, however dismal the image. Through the film of your mind you project a world and also a god to give it cause and purpose. It is all imagination, step out of it. Question, how difficult it is to see the world as purely mental. The tangible reality of it seems so very convincing. Maharaj, this is the mystery of imagination that it seems to be so real. You may be celibate or married, a monk or a family man, that is not the point. Are you a slave of your imagination or are you not? Whatever decision you take, whatever work you do, it will be invariably based on imagination, on assumptions parading as facts. Question, here I am sitting in front of you. What part of it is imagination? Maharaj, the whole of it. Even space and time are imagined. Question, does it mean that I don't exist? Maharaj, I too do not exist. All existence is imaginary. Question, is being too imaginary? Maharaj, pure being, filling all and beyond all, is not existence which is limited. 
All limitation is imaginary, only the unlimited is real. Question, when you look at me what do you see? Maharaj, I see you imagining yourself to be. Question, there are many like me. Yet each is different. Maharaj, the totality of all projections is what is called Mahamaya, the great illusion. Question, but when you look at yourself what do you see? Maharaj, it depends how I look. When I look through the mind I see numberless people. When I look beyond the mind I see the witness. Beyond the witness there is the infinite intensity of emptiness and silence. Question, how to deal with people? Maharaj, why make plans and what for? Such questions show anxiety. Relationship is a living thing. Be at peace with your inner self and you will be at peace with everybody. Realize that you are not the master of what happens, you cannot control the future except in purely technical matters. Human relationship cannot be planned, it is too rich and varied. Just be understanding and compassionate, free of all self-seeking. Question, surely, I am not the master of what happens. It's slave rather. Maharaj, be neither master nor slave. Stand aloof. Question, does it imply avoidance of action? Maharaj, you cannot avoid action. It happens like everything else. Question, my actions surely I can control. Maharaj, try. You will soon see that you do what you must. Question, I can act according to my will. Maharaj, you know your will only after you have acted. Question, I remember my desires, the choices made, the decisions taken and act accordingly. Maharaj, then your memory decides not you. Question, where do I come in? Maharaj, you make it possible by giving it attention. Question, is there no such thing as free will? Am I not free to desire? Maharaj, oh no, you are compelled to desire. In Hinduism the very idea of free will is non-existent, so there is no word for it. Will is commitment fixation bondage? Question, I am free to choose my limitations. Maharaj, you must be free first. To be free in the world, you must be free of the world. Otherwise your past decides for you and your future. Between what had happened and what must happen you are caught. Call it destiny or karma, but never freedom. First return to your true being and then act from the heart of love. Question. Within the manifested what is the stamp of the unmanifested? Maharaj, there is none. The moment you begin to look for the stamp of the unmanifested, the manifested dissolves. If you try to understand the unmanifested with the mind, you at once go beyond the mind like when you stir the fire with a wooden stick, you burn the stick. Use the mind to investigate the manifested. Be like the chick that pecks at the shell. Speculating about life outside the shell would have been of little use to it, but pecking at the shell breaks the shell from within and liberates the chick. Similarly, Break the mind from within by investigation and exposure of its contradictions and absurdities. Question, the longing to break the shell, where does it come from? Maharaj, from the unmanifested. Chapter 73, Death of the Mind, is Birth of Wisdom. Questioner, before one can realize one's true nature need not one be a person? Does not the ego have its value? Maharaj, the person is of little use. It is deeply involved in its own affairs and is completely ignorant of its true being. Unless the witnessing consciousness begins to play on the person and it becomes the object of observation rather than the subject, realization is not feasible. It is the witness that makes realization desirable and attainable. Question. There comes a point in a person's life when it becomes the witness. Maharaj, oh no! Person by itself will not become the witness. 
it is like expecting a cold candle to start burning in the course of time. A person can stay in the darkness of ignorance forever unless the flame of awareness touches it. Question: Who lights the candle? Maharaj, the Guru. His words, his presence. In India, it is very often the mantra. Once the candle is lighted, the flame will consume the candle. Question: Why is the mantra so effective? Maharaj, constant repetition of the mantra is something the person does not do for one's own sake. The beneficiary is not the person. Just like the candle, which does not increase by burning. Question: Can the person become aware of itself by itself? Maharaj, yes, it happens sometimes as a result of much suffering. The Guru wants to save you the endless pain. Such is his grace. Even when there is no discoverable outer Guru, there is always the sad Guru, the inner Guru who directs and helps from within. The words outer and inner are relative to the body only. In reality, all is one. The outer being merely a projection of the inner. Awareness comes as if from a higher dimension. Question: Before the spark is lit and after, what is the difference? Maharaj, before the spark is lit, there is no witness to perceive the difference. Person may be conscious, but is not aware of being conscious. It is completely identified with what it thinks and feels and experiences. The darkness that is in it is of its own creation. When the darkness is questioned, it dissolves. The desire to question is planted by the guru. In other words, the difference between the person and the witness is as between not knowing and knowing oneself. The world seen in consciousness is to be of the nature of consciousness when there is harmony, sattva. But when activity and passivity rages and tamas appear, they obscure and distort, and you see the false as real. Question: What can the person do to prepare itself for the coming of the guru? Maharaj, the very desire to be ready means that the guru had come and the flame is lighted. It may be a stray word or a page in a book. The guru's grace works mysteriously. Question. Is there no such thing as self-preparation? We hear so much about yoga sadhana, Maharaj. It is not the person that is doing sadhana. The person is in unrest and resistance to the very end. It is the witness that works on the person, on the totality of its illusions, past, present, and future. Question: How can we know that what you say is true? While it is self-contained and free from inner contradictions, how can we know that it is not a product of fertile imagination, nurtured and enriched by constant repetition? Maharaj, the proof of the truth lies in its effect on the listener. Question: Words can have a most powerful effect. By hearing or repeating words, one can experience various kinds of trances. The listener's experiences may be induced and cannot be considered as a proof. Maharaj, the effect need not necessarily be an experience. It can be a change in character, in motivation, in relationship to people and oneself. Trances and visions induced by words or drugs or any other sensory or mental means are temporary and inconclusive. The truth of what is said here is immovable and everlasting, and the proof of it is in the listener, in the deep and permanent changes in his entire being. It is not something he can doubt unless he doubts his own existence, which is unthinkable. When my experience becomes your own experience, also, what better proof do you want? Question: The experiencer is the proof of his experience, Maharaj. Quite, but the experiencer needs no proof. I am, and I know I am. You cannot ask for further proofs. Question: Can there be true knowledge of things? Maharaj, relatively, yes. Absolutely, there are no things. To know that nothing is is true knowledge. Question: What is the link between the relative and the absolute? Maharaj, they are identical. Question: 
from which point of view are they identical? Maharaj, when the words are spoken, there is silence. When the relative is over, the absolute remains. The silence before the words were spoken, is it different from the silence that comes after? The silence is one, and without it the words could not have been heard. It is always there, at the back of the words. Shift your attention from words to silence, and you will hear it. The mind craves for experience, the memory of which it takes for knowledge. The jhani is beyond all experience, and his memory is empty of the past. He is entirely unrelated to anything in particular. But the mind craves for formulations and definitions, always eager to squeeze reality into a verbal shape. Of everything it wants an idea, for without ideas the mind is not. Reality is essentially alone, but the mind will not leave it alone and deals instead with the unreal. And yet, it is all the mind can do discover the unreal as unreal. Question, and seeing the real as real. Maharaj, there is no such state as seeing the real. Who is to see what? You can only be the real which you are anyhow. The problem is only mental. Abandon false ideas, that is all. There is no need of true ideas. There aren't any. Question, why then are we encouraged to seek the real? Maharaj, the mind must have a purpose. To encourage it to free itself from the unreal, it is promised something in return. In reality, there is no need of purpose. Being free from the false is good in itself, it wants no reward. It is just like being clean which is its own reward. Question, is not self-knowledge the reward? Maharaj, the reward of self-knowledge is freedom from the personal self. You cannot know the knower, for you are the knower. Act of knowing proves the knower. You need no other proof. The knower of the known is not knowable. Just like the light is known in colors only, so is the knower known in knowledge. Question, is the knower an inference only? Maharaj, you know your body, mind and feelings. Are you an inference only? Question, I am an inference to other, but not to myself. Maharaj, so am I. An inference to you, but not to myself. I know myself by being myself. As you know yourself to be a man by being one. You do not keep on reminding yourself that you are a man. It is only when your humanity is questioned that you assert it. Similarly I know that I am all. I do not need to keep on repeating, I am all, I am all. Only when you take me to be a particular, a person I protest. As you are a man all the time, so I am what I am, all the time. Whatever you are changelessly, that you are beyond all doubt. Question, when I ask how do you know that you are a Johnny, you answer, I find no desire in me. Is this not a proof? Maharaj, were I full of desires I would have still been what I am. Question, myself full of desires and you full of desires, what difference would there be? Maharaj, you identify yourself with your desires and become their slave. To me desires are things among other things, mere clouds in the mental sky, and I do not feel compelled to act on them. Question, the knower and his knowledge, are they one or two? Maharaj, they are both. The knower is the unmanifested, the known is the manifested. The known is always on the move, it changes, it has no shape of its own, no dwelling place. The knower is the immutable support of all knowledge, each needs the other, but reality lies beyond. The Johnny cannot be known because there is nobody to be known. When there is a person, you can tell something about it, but when there is no self-identification with the particular what can be said. You may tell a Johnny anything, his question will always be, about whom are you talking? There is no such person. Just as you cannot say anything about the universe because it includes everything, so nothing can be said about a Johnny, for he is all and yet nothing in particular. You need a hook to hang your picture on when there is no hook, on what will the picture hang? 
To locate a thing you need space, to place an event you need time, but the timeless and spaceless defies all handling. It makes everything perceivable, yet itself it is beyond perception. The mind cannot know what is beyond the mind, but the mind is known by what is beyond it. Johnny knows neither birth nor death, existence and non-existence are the same to him. Question, when your body dies, you remain. Maharaj, nothing dies. The body is just imagined. There is no such thing. Question, before another century will pass, you will be dead to all around you. Your body will be covered with flowers, then burnt and the ashes scattered. That will be our experience. What will be yours? Maharaj, time will come to an end. This is called the great death Mahamrichu, the death of time. Question, does it mean that the universe and its contents will come to an end? Maharaj, the universe is your personal experience. How can it be affected? You might have been delivering a lecture for two hours, where has it gone when it is over? Has merged into silence in which the beginning, middle and end of the lecture are all together. Time has come to a stop, it was but is no more. The silence after a life of talking, and the silence after a life of silence is the same silence. Immortality is freedom from the feeling, I am. Yet, it is not extinction. On the contrary, it is a state infinitely more real, aware and happy than you can possibly think of. Only self-consciousness is no more. Question, why does the great death of the mind coincide with the small death of the body? Maharaj, it does not. You may die a hundred deaths without a break in the mental turmoil. Or, you may keep your body and die only in the mind. The death of the mind is the birth of wisdom. Question. The person goes and only the witness remains. Maharaj, who remains to say, I am the witness. When there is no I am, where is the witness? In the timeless state, there is no self to take refuge in. The man who carries a parcel is anxious not to lose it, he is parcel conscious. The man who cherishes the feeling I am is self-conscious. Ajani holds on to nothing and cannot be said to be conscious. And yet he is not unconscious. He is the very heart of awareness. We call him Digambara clothed in space, the naked one, beyond all appearance. There is no name and shape under which he may be said to exist, yet he is the only one that truly is. Question, I cannot grasp it. Maharaj, who can? The mind has its limits. It is enough to bring you to the very frontiers of knowledge and make you face the immensity of the unknown. To dive in it is up to you. Question, what about the witness? Is it real or unreal? Maharaj, it is both. The last remnant of illusion, the first touch of the real. To say, I am only the witness is both false and true, false because of the I am, true because of the witness. It is better to say, there is witnessing. The moment you say, I am, the entire universe comes into being along with its creator. Question, another question. Can we visualize the person and the self as two brothers small and big? The little brother is mischievous and selfish, rude and restless, while the big brother is intelligent and kind, reasonable and considerate, free from body consciousness with its desires and fears. The big brother knows the little on, but the small one is ignorant of the big one and thinks itself to be entirely on its own. Guru comes and tells the smaller one, you are not alone, you come from a very good family, your brother is a very remarkable man, wise and kind, and he loves you very much. Remember him, think of him, find him, serve him, and you will become one with him. Now the question is are there two in us, the personal and the individual, the false self and the true self, or is it only a simile? Maharaj, it is both. They appear to be two, but on investigation they are found to be one. 
Duality lasts only as long as it is not questioned. The Trinity, mind, self, and spirit, viacti, viacta, aviacta, when looked into, becomes unity. These are only modes of experiencing, of attachment, of detachment, of transcendence. Question. Your assumption that we are in a dream state makes your position unassailable. Whatever objection we raise, you just deny its validity. One cannot discuss with you. Maharaj, the desire to discuss is also mere desire. The desire to know to have the power, even the desire to exist are desires only. Everybody desires to be to survive to continue, for no one is sure of himself. But everybody is immortal. You make yourself mortal by taking yourself to be the body. Question. Since you have found your freedom, will you not give me a little of it? Maharaj, why little? Take the whole. Take it, it is there for the taking. But you are afraid of freedom. Question. Swami Ramdas had to deal with a similar request. Some devotees collected round him one day and began to ask for liberation. Ramdas listened smilingly and then suddenly he became serious and said, you can have it, here and now, freedom absolute and permanent. Who wants it, come forward? Nobody moved. Price he repeated the offer. None accepted. Then he said, the offer is withdrawn. Maharaj, attachment destroys courage. The giver is always ready to give. The taker is absent. Freedom means letting go. People just do not care to let go everything. They do not know that the finite is the price of the infinite, as death is the price of immortality. Spiritual maturity lies in the readiness to let go everything. The giving up is the first step. But the real giving up is in realizing that there is nothing to give up, for nothing is your own. It is like deep sleep, you do not give up your bed when you fall asleep, you just forget it. Chapter 74 Truth is Here and Now Questioner, my question is, what is the proof of truth? Followers of every religion, metaphysical or political, philosophical or ethical, are convinced that theirs is the only truth, that all else is false, and they take their own unshakable conviction for the proof of truth. I am convinced so it must be true, they say. It seems to me, that no philosophy or religion, no doctrine or ideology, however complete, free from inner contradictions and emotionally appealing, can be the proof of its own truth. They are like clothes men put on, which vary with times and circumstances, and follow the fashion trends. Now, can there be a religion or philosophy which is true and which does not depend on somebody's conviction? Nor on scriptures, because they again depend on somebody's faith in them? Is there a truth which does not depend on trusting, which is not subjective? Maharaj, what about science? Question. Science is circular, it ends where it starts with the senses. It deals with experience and experience is subjective. No two persons can have the same experience, though they may express it in the same words. Maharaj, you must look for truth beyond the mind. Question, sir, I've had enough of trances. Any drug can induce them cheaply and quickly. Even the classical samadhis, caused by breathing or mental exercises, are not much different. There are oxygen samadhis and carbon dioxide samadhis and self-induced samadhis, caused by repetition of a formula or a chain of thoughts. Monotony is soporific. I cannot accept samadhi, however glorious, as a proof of truth. Maharaj, samadhi is beyond experience. It is a qualitative estate. Question, the absence of experience is due to inattention. It reappears with attention. Closing one's eyes does not disprove light. Attributing reality to negative states will not take us far. Very negation contains an affirmation. Maharaj, in a way you are right. 
But don't you see, you are asking for the proof of truth without explaining what is the truth you have in mind, and what proof will satisfy you? You can prove anything, provided you trust your proof. But what will prove that your proof is true? I can easily drive you into an admission that you know only that you exist, that you are the only proof you can have of anything. But I do not identify mere existence with reality. Existence is momentary, always in time and space, while reality is changeless and all-pervading. Question, sir, I do not know what is truth and what can prove it. Do not throw me on my own resources. I have none. Here you are the truth knower, not me. Maharaj, you refuse testimony as the proof of truth. The experience of others is of no use to you. You reject all inference from the concurring statements of a vast number of independent witnesses. So, it is for you to tell me what is the proof that will satisfy you. What is your test of a valid proof? Question. Honestly, I do not know what makes a proof. Maharaj, not even your own experience. Question. Neither my experience, nor even existence. They depend on my being conscious. Maharaj, and your being conscious depends on what? Question. I do not know. Formerly I would have said, on my body, now I can see that the body is secondary, not primary, and cannot be considered as an evidence of existence. Maharaj, I am glad you have abandoned the I am the body idea the main source of error and suffering. Question. I have abandoned it intellectually, but the sense of being the particular, a person is still with me. I can say, I am, but what I am I cannot say. I know, I exist, but I do not know what exists. Whichever way I put it, I face the unknown. Maharaj, your very being is the real. Question, surely we are not talking of the same thing. I am not some abstract being. I am a person limited and aware of its limitations. I am a fact, but a most unsubstantial fact I am. There is nothing I can build on my momentary existence as a person. Maharaj, your words are wiser than you are. As a person your existence is momentary. But are you a person only? Are you a person at all? Question, how am I to answer? My sense of being proves only that I am, it does not prove anything which is independent of me. I am relative both creature and creator of the relative. The absolute proof of the absolute truth, what is it, where is it? Can the mere feeling I am be the proof of reality? Maharaj, of course not. I am and the world is a related and conditional. They are due to the tendency of the mind to project names and shapes. Question, names and shapes and ideas and convictions but not truth. But for you, I would have accepted the relativity of everything, including truth, and learned to live by assumptions. But then I meet you and hear you talking of the absolute as within my reach and also as supremely desirable. Words like peace, bliss, eternity, immortality, catch my attention as offering freedom from pain and fear. My inborn instincts, pleasure-seeking and curiosity are roused, and I begin to explore the realm you have opened. All seems most attractive and naturally I ask. Is it attainable? Is it real? Maharaj, you are like a child that says, prove that the sugar is sweet then only I shall have it. The proof of the sweetness is in the mouth not in the sugar. To know it is sweet, you must taste it, there is no other way. Of course you begin by asking, is it sugar? Is it sweet? And you accept my assurance until you taste it. Then only all doubts dissolve and your knowledge becomes first-hand and unshakable. I do not ask you to believe me. Just trust me enough to begin with. Every step proves or disproves itself. You seem to want the proof of truth to precede truth. And what will be the proof of the proof? You see, you are falling into a regress. 
to cut it you must put a stop to asking for proofs and accept for a moment only something is true. It does not really matter what it is. It may be God or me or your own self. In each case you accept something or somebody unknown as true. Now if you act on the truth you have accepted, even for a moment, very soon you will be brought to the next step. It is like climbing a tree in the dark, you can get hold of the next branch only when you are perched on the previous one. In science it is called the experimental approach. To prove a theory you carry out an experiment according to the operational instructions left by those who have made the experiment before you. Search will search the chain of experiments one has to make is called yoga. Question, there are so many yogas which to choose. Maharaj, of course every jhani will suggest the path of his own attainment as the one he knows most intimately. But most of them are very liberal and adapt their advice to the needs of the inquirer. All the paths take you to the purification of the mind. The impure mind is opaque to truth, the pure mind is transparent. Truth can be seen through it easily and clearly. Question, I am sorry but I seem unable to convey my difficulty. I am asking about the proof of truth and am being given the methods of attaining it. Assuming I follow the methods and attain some most wonderful and desirable state, how do I come to know that my state is true? Every religion begins with faith and promises some ecstasy. Is the ecstasy of the real or the product of faith? For if it is an induced state I shall have nothing to do with it. Take Christianity that says, Jesus is your Savior, believe and be saved from sin. When I ask a sinning Christian how is it that he has not been saved from sin in spite of his faith in Christ, he answers, my faith is not perfect. Again, we are in the vicious circle, without perfect faith, no salvation, without salvation, no perfect faith, hence no salvation. Conditions are imposed which are unfulfillable and then we are blamed for not fulfilling them. Maharaj, you do not realize that your present waking state is one of ignorance. Your question about the proof of truth is born from ignorance of reality. You are contacting your sensory and mental states in consciousness at the point of I am, while reality is not mediated, not contacted, not experienced. You are taking duality so much for granted, that you do not even notice it while to me variety and diversity do not create separation. You imagine reality to stand apart from names and forms while to me names and forms are the ever-changing expressions of reality and not apart from it. You ask for the proof of truth while to me all existence is the proof. You separate existence from being and being from reality while to me it is all one. However much you are convinced of the truth of your waking state, you do not claim it to be permanent and changeless, as I do when I talk of mine. Yet I see no difference between us, except that you are imagining things while I do not. Question. First you disqualify me from asking about truth, then you accuse me of imagination. What is imagination to you is reality to me. Maharaj, until you investigate. I am not accusing you of anything. I am only asking you to question wisely. Instead of searching for the proof of truth which you do not know, go through the proofs you have of what you believe to know. You will find you know nothing for sure, you trust on hearsay. To know the truth, you must pass through your own experience. Question, I am mortally afraid of samadhis and other trances, whatever their cause. A drink, a smoke, a fever, a drug, breathing, singing, shaking, dancing, whirling, praying, sex or fasting, mantras or some vertiginous abstraction can dislodge me from my waking state and give me some experience, extraordinary because unfamiliar. But when the cause ceases, the effect dissolves and only a memory remains, haunting but fading. Let us give up all means and their results, for the results are bound by the means, let us put the question anew, can truth be found? Maharaj, where is the dwelling place of truth where you could go in search of it? And how will you know that you have found it? 
What touchstone do you bring with you to test it? You are back at your initial question, what is the proof of truth? There must be something wrong with the question itself, for you tend to repeat it again and again. Why do you ask what are the proofs of truth? Is it not because you do not know truth firsthand, and you are afraid that you may be deceived? You imagine that truth is a thing which carries the name truth, and that it is advantageous to have it, provided it is genuine. Hence your fear of being cheated. You are shopping for truth, but you do not trust the merchants. You are afraid of forgeries and imitations. Question, I am not afraid of being cheated. I am afraid of cheating myself. Maharaj, but you are cheating yourself in your ignorance of your true motives. You are asking for truth, but in fact you merely seek comfort, which you want to last forever. Now, nothing, no state of mind, can last forever. In time and space there is always a limit, because time and space themselves are limited. And in the timeless the words forever have no meaning. The same with the proof of truth. In the realm of non-duality, everything is complete, its own proof, meaning and purpose. Where all is one, no supports are needed. You imagine that permanence is the proof of truth, that what lasts longer is somehow more true. Time becomes the measure of truth. And since time is in the mind, the mind becomes the arbiter and searches within itself for the proof of truth, a task altogether impossible and hopeless. Question, sir, were you to say, nothing is true, all is relative, I would agree with you. But you maintain there is truth, reality, perfect knowledge, therefore I ask, what is it and how do you know? And what will make me say, yes, Maharaj was right? Maharaj, you are holding on to the need for a proof, a testimony, an authority. You still imagine that truth needs pointing at and telling you, look here is truth. It is not so. Truth is not the result of an effort, the end of a road. It is here and now, in the very longing and the search for it. It is nearer than the mind and the body, nearer than the sense I am. You do not see it because you look too far away from yourself, outside your innermost being. You have objectified truth and insist on your standard proofs and tests, which apply only to things and thoughts. Question. All I can make out from what you say is that truth is beyond me and I am not qualified to talk about it. Maharaj, you are not only qualified but you are truth itself. Only you mistake the false for the true. Question, you seem to say, don't ask for proofs of truth. Concern yourself with untruth only. Maharaj, the discovery of truth is in the discernment of the false. You can know what is not. What is you can only be. Knowledge is relative to the known. In a way it is the counterpart of ignorance. Where ignorance is not, where is the need of knowledge? By themselves neither ignorance nor knowledge have being. They are only states of mind, which again is but an appearance of movement in consciousness which is in its essence immutable. Question. Is truth within the realm of the mind or beyond? Maharaj, it is neither, it is both. It cannot be put into words. Question. This is what I hear all the time, inexpressible anivakinia. It does not make me wiser. Maharaj, it is true that it often covers sheer ignorance. The mind can operate with terms of its own making, it just cannot go beyond itself. That which is neither sensory nor mental, and yet without which neither sensory nor the mental can exist, cannot be contained in them. To understand that the mind has its limits, to go beyond you must consent to silence. Question. Can we say that action is the proof of truth? It may not be verbalized, but it may be demonstrated. Maharaj, neither action nor inaction it is beyond both. Question, can a man ever say, yes, this is true? Or is he limited to the denial of the false? In other words, is truth pure negation? Or does a moment come when it becomes assertion? 
Maharaj, truth cannot be described but it can be experienced. Question. Experience is subjective, it cannot be shared. Your experiences leaves me where I am. Maharaj, truth can be experienced, but it is not mere experience. I know it and I can convey it, but only if you are open to it. To be open means to want nothing else. Question, I am full of desires and fears. Does it mean that I am not eligible for truth? Maharaj, truth is not a reward for good behavior, nor a prize for passing some tests. It cannot be brought about. It is the primary, the unborn, the ancient source of all that is. You are eligible because you are. You need not merit truth. It is your own. To stop running away by running after. Stand still, be quiet. Question, sir, if you want the body to be still and the mind quiet, tell me how it is done. In self-awareness I see the body and the mind moved by causes beyond my control. Heredity and environment dominate me absolutely. The mighty I am, the creator of the universe, can be wiped out by a drug temporarily or a drop of poison permanently. Maharaj, again, you take yourself to be the body. Question. Even if I dismiss this body of bones, flesh and blood is not me, still I remain with the subtle body made up of thoughts and feelings, memories and imaginations. If I dismiss these also as not me, I still remain with consciousness, which also is a kind of body. Maharaj, you are quite right but you need not stop there. Go beyond. Neither consciousness, nor the I am at the center of it are you. Your true being is entirely unself-conscious, completely free from all self-identification with whatever it may be gross, subtle or transcendental. Question. I can imagine myself to be beyond. But what proof have I? To be I must be somebody. Maharaj, it is the other way round. To be you must be nobody. Think yourself to be something or somebody is death and hell. Question. I have read that in ancient Egypt people were admitted to some mysteries where under the influence of drugs or incantations, they would be expelled from their bodies and could actually experience standing outside and looking at their own prostrate forms. This was intended to convince them of the reality of the after-death existence and create in them a deep concern with their ultimate destiny, so profitable to the state and temple. The self-identification with the person owning the body remained. Maharaj, the body is made of food as the mind is made of thoughts. See them as they are. Non-identification, when natural and spontaneous, is liberation. You need not know what you are. Enough to know what you are not. What you are you will never know, for every discovery reveals new dimensions to conquer. The unknown has no limits. Question. Does it imply ignorance forever? Maharaj, it means that ignorance never was. Truth is in the discovery not in the discovered. And to discovery there is no beginning and no end. Question the limits. Go beyond. Set yourself tasks apparently impossible. This is the way. Chapter 75. In peace and silence you grow. Questioner, the Indian tradition tells us that the Guru is indispensable. What is he indispensable for? A mother is indispensable for giving the child a body. But the soul she does not give. Her role is limited. How is it with the Guru? Is his role also limited and if so to what? Or is he indispensable generally, even absolutely? Maharaj, the innermost light shining peacefully and timelessly in the heart is the real guru. All others merely show the way. Question. I am not concerned with the inner gur, only with the one that shows the way. There are people who believe that without a guru yoga is inaccessible. They are ever in search of the right guru changing one for another. Of what value are such gurus? Maharaj, they are temporary time-bound gurus. 
You find them in every walk of life. You need them for acquiring any knowledge or skill. Question. A mother is only for a lifetime. She begins at birth and ends at death. She is not forever. Maharaj. Similarly, the time-bound guru is not forever. He fulfills his purpose and yields his place to the next. He is quite natural and there is no blame attached to it. Question. For every kind of knowledge or skill, do I need a separate guru? Maharaj, there can be no rule in these matters, except one the outer is transient, the innermost permanent and changeless, though ever new in appearance and action. Question. What is the relation between the inner and the outer gurus? Maharaj, the outer represent the inner, the inner accepts the outer for a time. Question. Whose is the effort? Maharaj, the disciples, of course. The outer guru gives the instructions, the inner sends the strength, the alert application is the disciples. Without will, intelligence and energy on the part of the disciple the outer guru is helpless. The inner guru bids his chance. Atuseness and wrong pursuits bring about a crisis, and the disciple wakes up to his own plight. Wise is he who does not wait for a shock, which can be quite rude. Question. Is it a threat? Maharaj, not a threat, a warning. The inner guru is not committed to non-violence. He can be quite violent at times, to the point of destroying the obtuse or perverted personality. Suffering and death, as life and happiness, are his tools of work. It is only in duality that non-violence becomes the unifying law. Question, has one to be afraid of his own self? Maharaj, not afraid for the self means well. But it must be taken seriously. Calls for attention and obedience, when it is not listened to, it turns from persuasion to compulsion, for while it can wait, it shall not be denied. The difficulty lies not with the guru inner or outer. The guru is always available. It is the ripe disciple that is lacking. When a person is not ready, what can be done? Question, ready or willing? Maharaj, both. It comes to the same. In India we call it a dikari. It means both capable and entitled. Question. Can the outer guru grant initiation diksha? Maharaj, he can give all kinds of initiations, but the initiation into reality must come from within. Question. Who gives the ultimate initiation? Maharaj, it is self-given. Question. I feel we are running in circles. After all I know oneself only, the present empirical self. The inner or higher self is but an idea conceived to explain and encourage. We talk of it as having independent existence. It hasn't. Maharaj, the outer self and the inner both are imagined. The obsession of being an I needs another obsession with a super I it cured, as one needs another thorn to remove a thorn, or another poison to neutralize a poison. All assertion calls for a denial, but this is the first step only. The next is to go beyond both. Question. I do understand that the outer guru is needed to call my attention to myself and to the urgent need of doing something about myself. I also understand how helpless he is when it comes to any deep change in me. But here you bring in the sad guru, the inner guru, beginningless, changeless, the root of being, the standing promise, the certain goal. Is he a concept or a reality? Maharaj, he is the only reality. All else is shadow cast by the body-mind on the face of time. Of course, even a shadow is related to reality, but by itself it is not real. Question. I am the only reality I know. The sad guru is there as long as I think of him. What do I gain by shifting reality to him? Maharaj, your loss is your gain. When the shadow is seen to be a shadow only, you stop following it. 
you turn round and discover the sun which was there all the time behind your back. Question, does the inner guru also teach? Maharaj, he grants the conviction that you are the eternal, changeless, reality consciousness love, within and beyond all appearances. Question, a conviction is not enough. There must be certainty. Maharaj, quite right. But in this case, certainty takes the shape of courage. Fear ceases absolutely. This state of fearlessness is so unmistakably new, yet felt deeply as one's own, that it cannot be denied. It is like loving one's own child. Who can doubt it? Question. We hear of progress in our spiritual endeavors. What kind of progress do you have in mind? Maharaj, when you go beyond progress, you will know what is progress. Question, what makes us progress? Maharaj, silence is the main factor. In peace and silence you grow. Question, the mind is so absolutely restless. For quieting it, what is the way? Maharaj, trust the teacher. Take my own case. My guru ordered me to attend to the sense I am and to give attention to nothing else. I just obeyed. I did not follow any particular course of breathing or meditation or study of scriptures. Whatever happened, I would turn away my attention from it and remain with the sense I am. It may look too simple, even crude. My only reason for doing it was that my guru told me so. Yet it worked. Obedience is a powerful solvent of all desires and fears. Just turn away from all that occupies the mind, do whatever work you have to complete but avoid new obligations, keep empty, keep available, resist not what comes uninvited. In the end you reach a state of non-grasping, of joyful non-attachment, of inner ease and freedom indescribable, yet wonderfully real. Question. When a truth seeker earnestly practices his yogas, does his inner guru guide and help him or does he leave him to his own resources, just waiting for the outcome? Maharaj, all happens by itself. Neither the Sikh nor the guru do anything. Things happen as they happen, blame or praise are apportioned later after the sense of doership appearing. Question, how strange. Truly the doer comes before the deed. Maharaj, it is the other way round, the deed is a fact, the doer a mere concept. Your very language shows that while the deed is certain, the doer is dubious, shifting responsibility is a game peculiarly human. Considering the endless list of factors required for anything to happen, one can only admit that everything is responsible for everything however remote. Doership is a myth born from the illusion of me and the mine. Question, how powerful the illusion? Maharaj, no doubt, because based on reality. Question, what is real in it? Maharaj, find out by discerning and rejecting all that is unreal. Question, I have not understood well the role of the inner self in spiritual endeavor. Who makes the effort? Is it the outer self or the inner? Maharaj, you have invented words like effort, inner, outer self, etc., and seek to impose them on reality. Things just happen to be as they are, but we want to build them into a pattern laid down by the structure of our language. Though strong is this habit that we tend to deny reality to what cannot be verbalized. We just refuse to see that words are mere symbols, related by convention and habit to repeated experiences. Question, what is the value of spiritual books? Maharaj, they help in dispelling ignorance. They are useful in the beginning, but become a hindrance in the end. One must know when to discard them. Question, what is the link between Atma and Sava between the self and the universal harmony? Maharaj, as between the sun and its rays. Harmony and beauty, understanding and affection are all expressions of reality. It is reality in action 
The Impact of the Spirit on Matter. Tamas obscures, Rajas distorts, Sava harmonizes. With the maturing of the Sava all desires and fears come to an end. The real being is reflected in the mind undistorted. Matter is redeemed, spirit revealed. The two are seen as one. They were always one, but the imperfect mind saw them as two. Perfection of the mind is the human task, for matter and spirit meet in the mind. Question. I feel like a man before a door. I know the door is open, but it is guarded by the dogs of desire and fear. What am I to do? Maharaj, obey the teacher and brave the dogs. Have as if they were not there. Again obedience is the golden rule. Freedom is won by obedience. To escape from prison one must unquestioningly obey instructions sent by those who work for one's release. Question. The words of the Guru when merely heard have little power. One must have faith to obey them. What creates such faith? Maharaj, when the time comes, faith comes. Everything comes in time. Guru is always ready to share, but there are no takers. Question. Yes, Sri Ramana Meher, she used to say, Gurus there are many, but where are the disciples? Maharaj, well in the course of time everything happens. All will come through, not a single soul shall be lost. Question, I am very much afraid of taking intellectual understanding for realization. I may talk of truth without knowing it, and may know it without a single word said. I understand these conversations are going to be published. What will be their effect on the reader? Maharaj, in the attentive and thoughtful reader they will ripen and bring out flowers and fruits. Words based on truth if fully tested have their own power. Chapter 76 To know that you do not know is true knowledge. Maharaj, there is the body. Inside the body appears to be an observer and outside, a world under observation. The observer and his observation as well as the world observed all appear and disappear together. Beyond it all there is void. This void is one for all. Questioner, what you say appears simple, but not everyone would say it. It is you and you alone who talks of the three and the void beyond. I see the world only which includes all. Maharaj, even the I am. Question, even the I am. The I am is there because the world is there. Maharaj, and the world is there because the I am is there. Question, yes it goes both ways. I cannot separate the two, nor go beyond, I cannot say something is, unless I experience it, as I cannot say something is not, because I do not experience it. What is it that you experience that makes you speak with such assurance? Maharaj, I know myself as I am timeless, spaceless, causeless. You happen not to know, being engrossed as you are in other things. Question, why am I so engrossed? Maharaj, because you are interested. Question, what makes me interested? Maharaj, fear of pain, desire for pleasure. Pleasant is the ending of pain and painful the end of pleasure. They just rotate in endless succession. Investigate the vicious circle till you find yourself beyond it. Question, don't I need your grace to take me beyond? Maharaj, the grace of your inner reality is timelessly with you. Your very asking for grace is a sign of it. Do not worry about my grace, but do what you are told. The doing is the proof of earnestness, not the expecting of grace. Question, what am I to be earnest about? Maharaj, assiduously investigate everything that crosses your field of attention. With practice the field will broaden and investigation deepen until they become spontaneous and limitless. Question, are you not making realization the result of practice? Practice operates within the limitations of physical existence. How can it give birth to the unlimited? Maharaj, 
of course there can be no causal connection between practice and wisdom. But the obstacles to wisdom are deeply affected by practice. Question, what are the obstacles? Maharaj, wrong ideas and desires leading to wrong actions causing dissipation and weakness of mind and body. Discovery and abandonment of the false remove what prevents the real entering the mind. Question, I can distinguish two states of mind, I am and the world is, they arise and subside together. People say, I am because the world is. You seem to say, the world is because I am. Which is true. Maharaj, neither. The two are one in the same state in space and time. Beyond there is the timeless. Question, what is the connection between time and the timeless? Maharaj, the timeless knows the time, the time does not know the timeless. All consciousness is in time and to it the timeless appears unconscious. Yet, it is what makes consciousness possible. Light shines in darkness. And light darkness is not visible. Or you can put it the other way, in the endless ocean of light, clouds of consciousness appear dark and limited, perceivable be contrast. These are mere attempts to express in words something very simple, yet altogether inexpressible. Question, words should serve as a bridge to cross over. Maharaj, word refers to a state of mind, not to reality. The river, the two banks, the bridge across, these are all in the mind. Words alone cannot take you beyond the mind. There must be the immense longing for truth, or absolute faith in the Guru. Believe me, there is no goal, nor a way to reach it. You are the way and the goal, there is nothing else to reach except yourself. All you need is to understand, and understanding is the flowering of the mind. The tree is perennial, but the flowering and the fruit bearing come in season. The seasons change, but not the tree. You are the tree. You have grown numberless branches and leaves in the past, and you may grow them also in the future, yet you remain. Not what was or shall be must you know, but what is. Yours is the desire that creates the universe. Know the world as your own creation and be free. Question. You say the world is the child of love. When I know the horrors the world is full of, the wars, the concentration camps, the inhuman exploitations, how can I own it as my own creation? However limited I am, I could not have created so cruel a world. Maharaj, find to whom this cruel world appears, and you will know why it appears so cruel. Your questions are perfectly legitimate, but just cannot be answered unless you know whose is the world. Find out the meaning of a thing you must ask its maker. I am telling you, you are the maker of the world in which you live, you alone can change it or unmake it. Question, how can you say I have made the world? I hardly know it. Maharaj, there is nothing in the world that you cannot know when you know yourself. Thinking yourself to be the body you know the world as a collection of material things. When you know yourself as a center of consciousness, the world appears as the ocean of the mind. When you know yourself as you are in reality, you know the world as yourself. Question, it all sounds very beautiful but does not answer my question. Why is there so much suffering in the world? Maharaj, if you stand aloof as observer only, you will not suffer. You will see the world as a show, a most entertaining show indeed. Question, oh no. This Leela theory I shall not have. The suffering is too acute and all-pervading. What a perversion to be entertained by a spectacle of suffering. What a cruel God are you offering me? Maharaj, the cause of suffering is in the identification of the perceiver with the perceived. Out of it desire is born and with desire blind action, unmindful of results. Look round and you will see, suffering is a man-made thing. Question, were a man to create his own sorrow only I would agree with you. 
but in his folly he makes others suffer. A dreamer has his own private nightmare, and none suffers but himself. But what kind of dream is it that plays havoc in the lives of others? Maharaj, descriptions are many and contradictory. Reality is simple, all is one, harmony is the eternal law, none compels to suffer. It is only when you try to describe and explain that the words fail you. Question. I remember Gantiji telling me once that the self is not bound by the law of non-violence ahimsa. The self has the freedom to impose suffering on its expressions in order to set them right. Maharaj. On the level of duality it may be so, but in reality there is only the source dark in itself making everything shine. Unperceived it causes perception. Unfelt it causes feeling. Unthinkable it causes thought. Non-being, it gives birth to being. It is the immovable background of motion. Once you are there you are at home everywhere. Question. If I am that then what causes me to be born? Maharaj, the memory of the past unfulfilled desires traps energy, which manifests itself as a person. When its charge gets exhausted, the person dies. Unfulfilled desires are carried over into the next birth. Self-identification with the body creates ever-fresh desires, and there is no end to them, unless this mechanism of bondage is clearly seen. It is clarity that is liberating, for you cannot abandon desire, unless its causes and effects are clearly seen. I do not say that the same person is reborn. It dies and dies for good. But its memories remain, and their desires and fears. They supply the energy for a new person. The real takes no part in it, but makes it possible by giving it, the light. Question. My difficulty is this. As I can see, every experience is its own reality. Is there experienced? The moment I question it and ask to whom it happens, who is the observer and so on, the experience is over and all I can investigate is only the memory of it. I just cannot investigate the living moment the now. My awareness is of the past, not of the present. When I am aware, I do not really live in the now, but only in the past. Can there really be an awareness of the present? Maharaj, what you are describing is not awareness at all, but only thinking about the experience. True awareness samvid is a state of pure witnessing, without the least attempt to do anything about the event witnessed. Your thoughts and feelings, words and actions may also be a part of the event, you watch all unconcerned in the full light of clarity and understanding. You understand precisely what is going on, because it does not affect you. It may seem to be an attitude of cold aloofness, but it is not really so. Once you are in it, you will find that you love what you see, whatever may be its nature. This choiceless love is the touchstone of awareness. If it is not there, you are merely interested for some personal reasons. Question. As long as there are pain and pleasure, one is bound to be interested. Maharaj. And as long as one is conscious, there will be pain and pleasure. You cannot fight pain and pleasure on the level of consciousness. To go beyond them you must go beyond consciousness, which is possible only when you look at consciousness as something that happens to you and not in you as something external, alien, superimposed. Then, suddenly you are free of consciousness, really alone, with nothing to intrude. And that is your true state. Consciousness is an itching rash that makes you scratch. Of course, you cannot step out of consciousness for the very idea of stepping out is in consciousness. But if you learn to look at your consciousness as a sort of fever, personal and private, in which you are enclosed like a chick in its shell, out of this very attitude will come the crisis which will break the shell. Question. Buddha said that life is suffering. Maharaj, he must have meant that all consciousness is painful, which is obvious. Question. And does death offer delivery? Maharaj, 
one who believes himself as having been born is very much afraid of death. On the other hand, to him who knows himself truly, death is a happy event. Question. The Hindu tradition says that suffering is brought by destiny and destiny is merited. Look at the immense calamities, natural or man-made, floods and earthquakes, wars and revolutions. Can we dare to think that each suffers for his own sins, of which he can have no idea? The billions who suffer, are they all criminals justly punished? Maharaj, must one suffer only for one's own sins? Are we really separate? In this vast ocean of life, we suffer for the sins of others, and make others suffer for our sins. Of course, the law of balance rules supreme and accounts are squared in the end. But while life lasts, we affect each other deeply. Question. Yes, as the poet says, no man is an island. Maharaj, at the back of every experience is the self and its interest in the experience. Call it desire, call it love, words do not matter. Question. Can I desire suffering? Can I deliberately ask for pain? Am I not like a man who made for himself a downy bed hoping for a good night of sleep, and then he's visited by a nightmare, and he tosses and screams in his dream? Truly, it is not the love that produces nightmares. Maharaj, all suffering is caused by selfish isolation, by insularity and greed. When the cause of suffering is seen and removed, suffering ceases. Question. I may remove my causes of sorrow, but others will be left to suffer. Maharaj, to understand suffering, you must go beyond pain and pleasure. Your own desires and fears prevent you from understanding and thereby helping others. In reality there are no others and by helping yourself you help everybody else. If you are serious about the sufferings of mankind, you must perfect the only means of help you have, yourself. Question. You keep on saying that I am the creator, preserver and destroyer of this world, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. When I ponder over what you say, I ask myself, how is it that there is so much evil in my world? Maharaj, there is no evil, there is no suffering, the joy of living is paramount. Look how everything clings to life, how dear the existence is. Question. On the screen of my mind images follow each other in endless succession. There is nothing permanent about me. Maharaj, have a better look at yourself. The screen is there, it does not change. The light shines steadily. Only the film in between keeps moving and causes pictures to appear. You may call the film Destiny Prerabdhya. Question, what creates destiny? Maharaj, ignorance is the cause of inevitability. Question, ignorance of what? Maharaj, Ignorance of yourself primarily. Also, ignorance of the true nature of things, of their causes and effects. You look round without understanding and take appearances for reality. You believe you know the world and yourself, but it is only your ignorance that makes you say, I know. Begin with the admission that you do not know and start from there. There is nothing that can help the world more than your putting an end to ignorance. Then, you need not do anything in particular to help the world. Your very being is a help action or no action. Question, how can ignorance be known? To know ignorance presupposes knowledge. Maharaj, quite right. The very admission, I am ignorant is the dawn of knowledge. An ignorant man is ignorant of his ignorance. You can say that ignorance does not exist for the moment it is seen, it is no more. Therefore, you may call it unconsciousness or blindness. All you see around and within you is what you do not know and do not understand, without even knowing that you do not know and do not understand. To know that you do not know and do not understand is true knowledge, the knowledge of an humble heart. Question. Yes, Christ said. Blessed are the poor in spirit Maharaj, put it as you like, 
The fact is that knowledge is of ignorance only. You know that you do not know. Question, will ignorance ever end? Maharaj, what is wrong with not knowing? You need not know all. Enough to know what you need to know. The rest can look after itself without your knowing how it does it. What is important is that your unconscious does not work against the conscious, that there is integration on all levels. To know is not so very important. Question, what you say is correct psychologically. But when it comes to knowing others, knowing the world, my knowing that I do not know does not help much. Maharaj, once you are inwardly integrated, outer knowledge comes to you spontaneously. At every moment of your life you know what you need to know. In the ocean of the universal mind all knowledge is contained, it is yours on demand. Most of it you may never need to know, but it is yours all the same. As with knowledge, so it is with power. Whatever you feel needs be done happens unfailingly. No doubt, God attends to this business of managing the universe, but he's glad to have some help. When the helper is selfless and intelligent, all the powers of the universe are for him to command. Question, even the blind powers of nature. Maharaj, there are no blind powers. Consciousness is power. Be aware of what needs be done and it will be done. Only keep alert and quiet. Once you reach your destination and know your real nature, your existence becomes a blessing to all. You may not know, nor will the world know, yet the help radiates. There are people in the world who do more good than all the statesmen and philanthropists put together. They radiate light and peace with no intention or knowledge. When others tell them about the miracles they worked, they also are wonderstruck. Yet, taking nothing as their own, they are neither proud, nor do they crave for reputation. They are just unable to desire anything for themselves, not even the joy of helping others knowing that God is good, they are at peace. Chapter 77 I and mine are false ideas. Questioner, I am very much attached to my family and possessions. How can I conquer this attachment? Maharaj, this attachment is born along with the sense of me and mine. Find the true meaning of these words and you will be free of all bondage. You have a mind which is spread in time. One after another all things happen to you and the memory remains. There's nothing wrong in it. The problem arises only when the memory of past pains and pleasures, which are essential to all organic life, remains as a reflex, dominating behavior. This reflex takes the shape of I and uses the body and the mind for its purposes, which are invariably in search for pleasure or flight from pain. When you recognize the I as it is, a bundle of desires and fears, and the sense of mine, as embracing all things and people needed for the purpose of avoiding pain and securing pleasure, you will see that the I and the mine are false ideas, having no foundation in reality. Created by the mind, they rule their creator as long as it takes them to be true, when questioned they dissolve. Thy and mine, having no existence in themselves, need a support which they find in the body. Body becomes their point of reference. When you talk of my husband and my children, you mean the body's husband and the body's children. Give up the idea of being the body and face the question, who am I? At once a process will be set in motion which will bring back reality, or rather, will take the mind to reality. Only, you must not be afraid. Question, what am I to be afraid of? Maharaj, for reality to be the ideas of me and mine must go. They will go if you let them. Then your normal natural state reappears, in which you are neither the body nor the mind, neither the me nor the mine, but in a different state of being altogether. It is pure awareness of being, without being this or that, without any self-identification with anything in particular or in general. In that pure light of consciousness there is nothing, not even the idea of nothing. There is only light. 
Question. There are people whom I love. Must I give them up? Maharaj, you only let go your hold on them. The rest is up to them. They may lose interest in you or may not. Question. How could they? Are they not my own? Maharaj, they are your bodies, not your own. Or better, there is none who is not your own. Question, and what about my possessions? Maharaj, when the mine is no more, where are your possessions? Question, please tell me, must I lose all by losing the eye? Maharaj, you may or you may not. It will be all the same to you. Your loss will be somebody's gain. You will not mind. Question. If I do not mind, I shall lose all. Maharaj, once you have nothing you have no problems. Question. I am left with the problem of survival. Maharaj, it is the body's problem and it will solve it by eating, drinking and sleeping. There is enough for all, provided all share. Question. Our society is based on grabbing, not on sharing. Maharaj, by sharing you will change it. Question, I do not feel like sharing. Anyhow, I am being taxed out of my possessions. Maharaj, this is not the same as voluntary sharing. Society will not change by compulsion. It requires a change of heart. Understand that nothing is your own, that all belongs to all. Then only society will change. Question. One man's understanding will not take the world far. Maharaj, the world in which you live will be affected deeply. It will be a healthy and happy world, which will radiate and communicate, increase and spread. The power of a true heart is immense. Question. Please tell us more. Maharaj, talking is not my hobby. Sometimes I talk, sometimes I do not. My talking, or not talking, is a part of a given situation and does not depend on me. When there is a situation in which I have to talk, I hear myself talking. In some other situation I may not hear myself talking. It is all the same to me. Whether I talk or not, the light and love of being what I am are not affected, nor are they under my control. They are, and I know they are. There is a glad awareness, but nobody who is glad. Of course, there is a sense of identity, but it is the identity of a memory track, like the identity of a sequence of pictures on the ever-present screen. Without the light and the screen there can be no picture. To know the picture as the play of light on the screen gives freedom from the idea that the picture is real. All you have to do is to understand that you love the self and the self loves you and that the sense I am is the link between you both, a token of identity in spite of apparent diversity. Look at the I am as a sign of love between the inner and the outer, the real and the appearance. Just like in a dream all is different except the sense of I which enables you to say I dreamt, so does the sense of I am enable you to say I am my real self again. I do nothing, nor is anything done to me. I am what I am and nothing can affect me. I appear to depend on everything, but in fact all depends on me. Question, how can you say you do nothing? Are you not talking to me? Maharaj, I do not have the feeling that I am talking. There is talking going on, that is all. Question, I talk. Maharaj, do you? You hear yourself talking and you say, I talk. Question. Everybody says, I work, I come, I go. Maharaj, I have no objection to the conventions of your language, but they distort and destroy reality. A more accurate way of saying would have been, there is talking, working, coming, going. For anything to happen, the entire universe must coincide. It is wrong to believe that anything in particular can cause an event. Every cause is universal. Your very body would not exist without the entire universe contributing to its creation and survival. I am fully aware that things happen as they happen because the world is as it is. 
To affect the course of events, I must bring a new factor into the world and such factor can only be myself, the power of love and understanding focused in me. When the body is born all kinds of things happen to it and you take part in them because you take yourself to be the body. You are like the man in the cinema house, laughing and crying with the picture, though knowing fully well that he is all the time in his seat and the picture is but the play of light. It is enough to shift attention from the screen to oneself to break the spell. When the body dies, the kind of life you live now succession of physical and mental events comes to an end. It can end even now, without waiting for the death of the body, it is enough to shift attention to the self and keep it there. All happens as if there is a mysterious power that creates and moves everything, realize that you are not the mover, only the observer, and you will be at peace. Question, is that power separate from me? Maharaj, of course not. But you must begin by being the dispassionate observer. Then only will you realize your full being as the universal lover and actor. As long as you are enmeshed in the tribulations of a particular personality, you can see nothing beyond it. But ultimately you will come to see that you are neither the particular nor the universal, you are beyond both. As the tiny point of a pencil can draw innumerable pictures, so does the dimensionless point of awareness draw the contents of the vast universe. Find that point and be free. Question, out of what do I create this world? Maharaj, out of your own memories. As long as you are ignorant of yourself as the creator, your world is limited and repetitive. Once you go beyond your self-identification with your past, you are free to create a new world of harmony and beauty. Or you just remain beyond being a non-being. Question, what will remain with me if I let go my memories? Maharaj, nothing will remain. Question, I am afraid. Maharaj, you will be afraid until you experience freedom and its blessings. Of course, some memories are needed to identify and guide the body and such memories do remain, but there is no attachment left to the body as such. It is no longer the ground for desire or fear. All this is not very difficult to understand and practice, but you must be interested. Without interest nothing can be done. Having seen that you are a bundle of memories held together by attachment, step out and look from the outside. You may perceive for the first time something which is not memory. You cease to be a Mr. So-and-so busy about his own affairs. You are at last at peace. You realize that nothing was ever wrong with the world. You alone were wrong and now it is all over. Never again will you be caught in the meshes of desire born of ignorance. Chapter 78 All Knowledge is Ignorance Questioner, are we permitted to request you to tell us the manner of your realization? Maharaj, somehow, it was very simple and easy in my case. My guru before he died told me, believe me, you are the supreme reality. Don't doubt my words, don't disbelieve me. I am telling you the truth, act on it. I could not forget his words and by not forgetting, I have realized. Question, but what were you actually doing? Maharaj, nothing special. I lived my life, plied my trade, looked after my family, and every free moment I would spend just remembering my guru and his words. He died soon after and I had only the memory to fall back on. It was enough. Question. It must have been the grace and power of your guru. Maharaj, his words were true and so they came true. True words always come true. My guru did nothing. His words acted because they were true. Whatever I did came from within unasked and unexpected. Question. The guru started a process without taking any part in it. Maharaj, put it as you like. Things happen as they happen, who can tell why and how? I did nothing deliberately. All came by itself the desire to let go, to be alone, to go within. Question. You made no efforts whatsoever. 
Maharaj, none. Believe it or not, I was not even anxious to realize. He only told me that I am the Supreme and then died. I just could not disbelieve him. The rest happened by itself. I found myself changing, that is all. As a matter of fact, I was astonished. But a desire arose in me to verify his words. I was so sure that he could not possibly have told a lie that I felt I shall either realize the full meaning of his words or die. I was feeling quite determined but did not know what to do. I would spend hours thinking of him and his assurance, not arguing, but just remembering what he told me. Question, what happened to you then? How did you know that you are the Supreme? Maharaj, nobody came to tell me. Nor was I told so inwardly. In fact, it was only in the beginning when I was making efforts that I was passing through some strange experiences, seeing lights, hearing voices, meeting gods and goddesses and conversing with them. Once the Guru told me, You are the Supreme Reality, I ceased having visions and trances and became very quiet and simple. I found myself desiring and knowing less and less until I could say in utter astonishment, I know nothing, I want nothing. Question, were you genuinely free of desire and knowledge or did you impersonate a Johnny according to the image given to you by your Guru? Maharaj, I was not given any image, nor did I have one. My Guru never told me what to expect. Question, more things may happen to you. Are you at the end of your journey? Maharaj, there was never any journey. I am, as I always was. Question, what was the supreme reality you were supposed to reach? Maharaj, I was undeceived, that is all. I used to create a world and populate it, now I don't do it anymore. Question, where do you live then? Maharaj, in the void beyond being and non-being beyond consciousness. This void is also fullness, do not pity me. It is like a man saying, I have done my work, there is nothing left to do. Question, you are giving a certain date to your realization. It means something did happen to you at that date. What happened? Maharaj, the mind ceased producing events. The ancient and ceaseless search stopped, I wanted nothing, expected nothing, accepted nothing as my own. There was no me left to strive for. Even the bear I am faded away. The other thing that in noticed was that I lost all my habitual certainties. Earlier I was sure of so many things, now I am sure of nothing. But I feel that I have lost nothing by not knowing, because all my knowledge was false. My not knowing was in itself knowledge of the fact that all knowledge is ignorance, that I do not know is the only true statement the mind can make. Take the idea I was born. You may take it to be true. It is not. You were never born nor will you ever die. It is the idea that was born and shall die, not you. By identifying yourself with it, you became mortal. Just like in a cinema all is light, so does consciousness become the vast world. Look closely, and you will see that all names and forms are but transitory waves on the ocean of consciousness, that only consciousness can be said to be, not its transformations. In the immensity of consciousness a light appears, a tiny point that moves rapidly and traces shapes, thoughts and feelings, concepts and ideas, like the pen writing on paper. And the ink that leaves a trace is memory. You are that tiny point, and by your movement the world is ever recreated. Stop moving and there will be no world. Look within and you will find that the point of light is the reflection of the immensity of light in the body, as the sense I am. There is only light all else appears. Question, do you know that light? Have you seen it? Maharaj, to the mind it appears as darkness. It can be known only through its reflections. All is seen in daylight, except daylight. Question, have I to understand that our minds are similar? Maharaj, how can it be? 
You have your own private mind, woven with memories held together by desires and fears. I have no mind of my own, what I need to know the universe brings before me, as it supplies the food I eat. Question, do you know all you want to know? Maharaj, there is nothing I want to know. But what I need to know, I come to know. Question, does this knowledge come to you from within or from outside? Maharaj, it does not apply. My inner is outside and my outer is inside. I may get from you the knowledge needed at the moment, but you are not apart from me. Question, what is Turiya the fourth state we hear about? Maharaj, to be the point of light tracing the world is Turiya. To be the light itself is Turiya Tita. But of what use are names when reality is so near? Question, is there any progress in your condition? When you compare yourself yesterday with yourself today, do you find yourself changing, making progress? Does your vision of reality grow in width and depth? Maharaj, reality is immovable and yet in constant movement. It is like a mighty river, it flows and yet it is there, eternally. What flows is not the river with its bed and banks, but its water, so does the Sadvaguna, the universal harmony, play its games against Tamas and Rajas, the forces of darkness and despair. In Safa there is always change and progress, in Rajas there is change and regress, while Tamas stands for chaos. The three gunas play eternally against each other, it is a fact and there can be no quarrel with a fact. Question, must I always go dull with Tamas and desperate with Rajas? What about Safa? Maharaj, Sava is the radiance of your real nature. You can always find it beyond the mind and its many worlds. But if you want a world, you must accept the three gunas as inseparable matter energy life, one in essence, distinct in appearance. They mix and flow in consciousness. In time and space there is eternal flow, birth and death again, advance, retreat, another advance, again retreat, apparently without a beginning and without end, reality being timeless, changeless, bodiless, mindless awareness is bliss. Question, I understand that according to you everything is a state of consciousness. The world is full of things, a grain of sand is a thing, a planet is a thing. How are they related to consciousness? Maharaj, where consciousness does not reach matter begins. A thing is a form of being which we have not understood. It does not change, it is always the same, it appears to be there on its own, something strange and alien. Of course it is in the chit, consciousness, but appears to be outside because of its apparent changelessness. The foundation of things is in memory, without memory there would be no recognition. Creation, reflection, rejection, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, this is the eternal process. All things are governed by it. Question, is there no escape? Maharaj, I am doing nothing else but showing the escape. Understand that the one includes the three and that you are the one, and you shall be free of the world process. Question, what happens then to my consciousness? Maharaj, after the stage of creation, comes the stage of examination and reflection and finally, the stage of abandonment and forgetting. Consciousness remains but in a latent, quiet state. Question, does the state of identity remain? Maharaj, the state of identity is inherent in reality and never fades. But identity is neither the transient personality Vyakti, nor the karma-bound individuality Vyakta. It is what remains when all self-identification is given up as false, pure consciousness, the sense of being all there is or could be. Consciousness is pure in the beginning and pure in the end, in between it gets contaminated by imagination which is at the root of creation. At all times consciousness remains the same. To know it as it is, is realization and timeless peace. Question. Is the sense I am real, or unreal? Maharaj, both. 
It is unreal when we say, I am this I am that. It is real when we mean I am not this nor that. The nor comes and goes with the known, and is transient, but that which knows that it does not know which is free of memory and anticipation is timeless. Question. Is I am itself the witness, or are they separate? Maharaj without one the other cannot be. Yet they are not one. It is like the flower and its color. Without flower no colors. Without color the flower remains unseen. Beyond is the light which on contact with the flower creates the Kalu. Realize that your true nature is that of pure light only, and both the perceived and the perceiver come and go together. That which makes both possible, and yet is neither, is your real being, which means not being a this or that, but pure awareness of being and not being. When awareness is turned on itself, the feeling is of not knowing. When it is turned outward, the nobles come into being. To say, I know myself is a contradiction in terms for what is known cannot be myself. Question. If the self is forever the unknown, what then is realized in self-realization? Maharaj, to know that the known cannot be me nor mine is liberation enough. Freedom from self-identification with a set of memories and habits, the state of wonder at the infinite reaches of the being, its inexhaustible creativity and total transcendence, the absolute fearlessness born from the realization of the illusoriness and transiency of every mode of consciousness, flow from a deep and inexhaustible source. To know this source as source and appearance as appearance, and oneself as the source only is self-realization. Question, on what side is the witness? Is it real or unreal? Maharaj, nobody can say, I am the witness. The I am is always witnessed. The state of detached awareness is the witness consciousness, the mirror mind. It rises and sets with its object, and thus it is not quite the real. Whatever its object, it remains the same, hence it is also real. It partakes of both the real and the unreal and is therefore a bridge between the two. Question. If all happens only to the I am, if the I am is the known and the knower and the knowledge itself, what does the witness do? Of what use is it? Maharaj, it does nothing and is of no use whatsoever. Question, then why do we talk of it? Maharaj, because it is there. The bridge serves one purpose only to cross over. You don't build houses on a bridge. Daim looks at things, the witness sees through them. It sees them as they are unreal and transient. Say not me, not mine is the task of the witness. Question. Is it the manifested saguna by which the unmanifested nirguna is represented? Maharaj, the unmanifested is not represented. Nothing manifested can represent the unmanifested. Question. Then why do you talk of it? Maharaj, because it is my birthplace. Chapter 79, Person, Witness and the Supreme Questioner, we have a long history of drug taking behind us, mostly drugs of the consciousness expanding variety. They gave us the experience of other states of consciousness, high and low, and also the conviction that drugs are unreliable and at best transitory, and at worst destructive of organism and personality. We are in search of better means for developing consciousness and transcendence. We want the fruits of our search to stay with us and enrich our lives, instead of turning to pale memories and helpless regrets. If by the spiritual we mean self-investigation and development, our purpose in coming to India is definitely spiritual. The happy hippie stage is behind us, we are serious now and on the move. We know there is reality to be found, but we do not know how to find and hold on to it. We need no convincing, only guidance. Can you help us? Maharaj, you do not need help, only advice. What you seek is already in you. Take my own case. 
I did nothing for my realization. My teacher told me that the reality is within me, I looked within and found it there exactly as my teacher told me. To see reality is as simple as to see one's face in a mirror. Only the mirror must be clear and true. A quiet mind, undistorted by desires and fears, free from ideas and opinions, clear on all the levels, is needed to reflect the reality. Be clear and quiet alert and detached, all else will happen by itself. Question. You had to make your mind clear and quiet before you could realize the truth. How did you do it? Maharaj, I did nothing. It just happened. I lived my life, attending to my family's needs. Nor did my guru do it. It just happened as he said it will. Question. Things do not just happen. There must be a cause for everything. Maharaj, all that happens is the cause of all that happens. Causes are numberless. The idea of a sole cause is an illusion. Question. You must have been doing something specific, some meditation or yoga. How can you say that realization will happen on its own? Maharaj, nothing specific. I just lived my life. Question. I am amazed. Maharaj, so was I. But what was there to be amazed at? My teacher's words came true. To what? He knew me better than I knew myself, that is all. Why search for causes? In the very beginning I was giving some attention and time to the sense I am, but only in the beginning. Soon after my guru died, I lived on. His words proved to be true. That is all. It is all one process. You tend to separate things in time and then look for causes. Question, what is your work now? What are you doing? Maharaj, you imagine being and doing as identical. It is not so. The mind and the body move and change and cause other minds and bodies to move and change and that is called doing action. I see that it is in the nature of action to create further action like fire that continues by burning. I neither act nor cause others to act, I am timelessly aware of what is going on. Question. In your mind or also in other minds? Maharaj, there is only one mind which swarms with ideas, I am this I am that, this is mine that is mine. I am not the mind never was nor shall be. Question. How did the mind come into being? Maharaj, the world consists of matter, energy and intelligence. They manifest themselves in many ways. Desire and imagination create the world and intelligence reconciles the two and causes a sense of harmony and peace to me it all happens. I am aware yet unaffected. Question. You cannot be aware yet unaffected. There is a contradiction in terms. Perception is change. Once you have experienced a sensation, memory will not allow you to return to the former state. Maharaj, yes, what is added to memory cannot be erased easily. But it can surely be done and in fact I am doing it all the time. Like a bird on its wings, I leave no footprints. Question. Has the witness name and form, or is it beyond these? Maharaj, the witness is merely a point in awareness. It has no name and form. It is like the reflection of the sun in a drop of dew. The drop of dew has name and form, but the little point of light is caused by the sun. The clearness and smoothness of the drop is a necessary condition, but not sufficient by itself. Similarly clarity and silence of the mind are necessary for the reflection of reality to appear in the mind, but by themselves they are not sufficient. There must be reality beyond it. Because reality is timelessly present, the stress is on the necessary conditions. Question. Can it happen that the mind is clear and quiet and yet no reflection appears? Maharaj, there is destiny to consider. The unconscious is in the grip of destiny, it is destiny in fact. One may have to wait. 
but however heavy may be the hand of destiny, it can be lifted by patience and self-control. Integrity and purity remove the obstacles and the vision of reality appears in the mind. Question. How does one gain self-control? I'm so weak-minded. Maharaj. Understand first that you are not the person you believe yourself to be. What you think yourself to be is mere suggestion or imagination. You have no parents, you were not born nor will you die. Either trust me when I tell you so, or arrive to it by study and investigation. The way of total faith is quick, the other is slow but steady. Both must be tested in action. Act on what you think is true, this is the way to truth. Question. Are deserving the truth and destiny one and the same? Maharaj, yes both are in the unconscious. Conscious merit is mere vanity. Consciousness is always of obstacles. When there are no obstacles, one goes beyond it. Question. Will the understanding that I am not the body give me the strength of character needed for self-control? Maharaj, when you know that you are neither body nor mind, you will not be swayed by them. You will follow truth wherever it takes you and do what needs be done, whatever the price to pay. Question. Is action essential for self-realization? Maharaj, for realization understanding is essential. Action is only incidental. A man of steady understanding will not refrain from action. Action is the test of truth. Question. Are tests needed? Maharaj, if you do not test yourself all the time, you will not be able to distinguish between reality and fancy. Observation and close reasoning help to some extent, but reality is paradoxical. How do you know that you have realized, unless you watch your thoughts and feelings, words and actions and wonder at the changes occurring in you without your knowing why and how? It is exactly because they are so surprising that you know that they are real. The foreseen and expected is rarely true. Question. How does the person come into being? Maharaj. Exactly as a shadow appears when light is intercepted by the body, so does the person arise when pure self-awareness is obstructed by the I am the body idea. And as the shadow changes shape and position, according to the lay of the land, so does the person appear to rejoice and suffer, rest and toil, find and lose according to the pattern of destiny. When the body is no more, the person disappears completely without return, only the witness remains and the great unknown. The witness is that which says I know. The person says I do. Now to say I know is not untrue, it is merely limited. But to say I do is altogether false, because there is nobody who does, all happens by itself, including the idea of being a doer. Question. Then, what is action? Maharaj, the universe is full of action, but there is no actor. There are numberless persons small and big and very big who, through identification, imagine themselves as acting, but it does not change the fact that the world of action Mahadakash is one single whole in which all depends on and affects all. The stars affect us deeply, and we affect the stars. Step back from action to consciousness, leave action to the body and the mind, it is their domain. Remain as pure witness, till even witnessing dissolves in the supreme. Imagine a thick jungle full of heavy timber. Plank is shaped out of the timber and a small pencil to write on it. The witness reads the writing and knows that while the pencil and the plank are distantly related to the jungle, the writing has nothing to do with it. It is totally superimposed and its disappearance just does not matter. The dissolution of personality is followed always by a sense of great relief as if a heavy burden has fallen off. Question. When you say, I am in the state beyond the witness, what is the experience that makes you say so? In what way does it differ from the stage of being a witness only? Maharaj, it is like washing printed cloth. First the design fades, 
then the background and in the end the cloth is plain white. The personality gives place to the witness, then the witness goes and pure awareness remains. The cloth was white in the beginning and is white in the end, the patterns and colors just happened for a time. Question. Can there be awareness without an object of awareness? Maharaj, awareness with an object we called witnessing. When there is also self-identification with the object, caused by desire or fear, such a state is called a person. In reality there is only one state, when distorted by self-identification, it is called a person. When colored with the sense of being, it is the witness. When colorless and limitless, it is called the supreme. Question. I find that I am always restless, longing, hoping, seeking, finding, enjoying, abandoning, searching again. What is it that keeps me on the boil? Maharaj, you are really in search of yourself without knowing it. You are love longing for the love worthy, the perfectly lovable. Due to ignorance you are looking for it in the world of opposites and contradictions. When you find it within, your search will be over. Question, there will be always this sorrowful world to contend with. Maharaj, don't anticipate. You do not know. It is true that all manifestation is in the opposites. Pleasure and pain, good and bad, high and low, progress and regress, rest and strife, they all come and go together, and as long as there is a world, its contradictions will be there. There may also be periods of perfect harmony of bliss and beauty, but only for a time. What is perfect returns to the source of all perfection and the opposites play on. Question. How am I to reach perfection? Maharaj, keep quiet. Do you work in the world but inwardly keep quiet? Then all will come to you. Do not rely on your work for realization. It may profit others, but not you. Your hope lies in keeping silent in your mind and quiet in your here realized people are very quiet. Chapter 80 Awareness Questioner Does it take time to realize the self or time cannot help to realize? Is self-realization a matter of time only, or does it depend on factors other than time? Maharaj, all waiting is futile. To depend on time to solve our problems is self-delusion. The future, left to itself, merely repeats the past. Change can only happen now, never in the future. Question, what brings about a change? Maharaj, with crystal clarity, see the need of change. This is all. Question, does self-realization happen in matter or beyond? Is it not an experience depending on the body and the mind for its occurrence? Maharaj, all experience is illusory, limited and temporal. Expect nothing from experience. Realization by itself is not an experience, though it may lead to a new dimension of experiences. Yet the new experiences, however interesting, are not more real than the old. Definitely realization is not a new experience. It is the discovery of the timeless factor in every experience. It is awareness which makes experience possible. Just like in all the colors light is the colorless factor, so in every experience awareness is present, yet it is not an experience. Question. If awareness is not an experience, how can it be realized? Maharaj, awareness is ever there. It need not be realized. Open the shutter of the mind and it will be flooded with light. Question, what is matter? Maharaj, what you do not understand is matter. Question, science understands matter. Maharaj, science merely pushes back the frontiers of our ignorance. Question, and what is nature? Maharaj, the totality of conscious experiences is nature. As a conscious self you are a part of nature. As awareness, you are beyond. Seeing nature as mere consciousness is awareness. Question. Are there levels of awareness? Maharaj, 
There are levels in consciousness but not in awareness. It is of one block homogeneous. Its reflection in the mind is love and understanding. There are levels of clarity in understanding and intensity in love, but not in their source. The source is simple and single, but its gifts are infinite. Only do not take the gifts for the sourk, realize yourself as the source and not as the river, that is all. Question. I am the river too. Maharaj, of course you are. As an I am you are the river, flowing between the banks of the body. But you are also the source and the ocean and the clouds in the sky. Wherever there is life and consciousness, you are. Smaller than the smallest, bigger than the biggest, you are while all else appears. Question. The sense of being and the sense of living, are they one and the same or different? Maharaj, the identity in space creates one, the continuity in time creates the other. Question. You said once that the seer, seeing and the seen are one single thing, not three. To me the three are separate. I do not doubt your words, only I do not understand. Maharaj, look closely, and you will see that the seer and the seen appear only when there is seeing. They are attributes of seeing. When you say I am seeing this, I am in this come with seeing, not before. You cannot have an unseen this nor an unseeing I am. Question. I can say, I do not see. Maharaj. The I am seeing this has become I am seeing my not seeing, or I am seeing darkness. The seeing remains. In the triplicity, the known knowing and the knower only the knowing is a fact. The I am and this are doubtful. Who knows? What is known? There is no certainty except that there is knowing. Question. Why am I sure of knowing but not of the knower? Maharaj. Knowing is a reflection of your true nature along with being and loving. The knower and the known are added by the mind. It is in the nature of the mind to create a subject-object duality where there is none. Question. What is the cause of desire and fear? Maharaj, obviously the memory of past pains and pleasures. There is no great mystery about it. Conflict arises only when desire and fear refer to the same object. Question, how to put an end to memory? Maharaj, it is neither necessary nor possible realize that all happens in consciousness and you are the root, the source, the foundation of consciousness. The world is but a succession of experiences and you are what makes them conscious and yet remain beyond all experience. It is like the heat, the flame and the burning wood. The heat maintains the flame, the flame consumes the wood. Without heat there would be neither flame nor fuel. Similarly without awareness there would be no consciousness nor life which transforms matter into a vehicle of consciousness. Question. You maintain that without me there would be no world and that the world and my knowledge of the world are identical. Science has come to a quite different conclusion. The world exists as something concrete and continuous while I am a byproduct of biological evolution of the nervous system which is primarily not so much a seat of consciousness as a mechanism of survival as individual and species. Yours is altogether a subjective view while science tries to describe everything in objective terms. Is this contradiction inevitable? Maharaj, the confusion is apparent and purely verbal. What is is, is neither subjective nor objective. Matter and mind are not separate, they are aspects of one energy. Look at the mind as a function of matter and you have science, look at matter as the product of the mind and you have religion. Question, but what is true? What comes first, mind or matter? Maharaj, neither comes furs, for neither appears alone. Matter is the shape, mind is the name. Together they make the world. Pervading and transcending is reality, pure being, awareness, bliss, your very essence. Question, all I know is the stream of consciousness, an endless succession of events. 
The river of time flows, bringing and carrying away relentlessly. Transformation of the future into past is going on all the time. Maharaj, are you not the victim of your language? You speak about the flow of time as if you were stationary. But the event you have witnessed yesterday somebody else may see tomorrow. It is you who are in movement and not time. Stop moving and time will cease. Question, what does it mean time will cease? Maharaj, past and future will merge in the eternal now. Question, but what does it mean in actual experience? How do you know that for you time has ceased? Maharaj, it may mean that past and future do not matter anymore. It may also mean that all that happened and will happen becomes an open book to be read at will. Question, I can imagine a sort of cosmic memory accessible with some training. But how can the future be known? The unexpected is inevitable. Maharaj, what is unexpected on one level may be certain to happen when seen from a higher level after all we are within the limits of the mind. In reality nothing happens, there is no past nor future, all appears and nothing is. Question, what does it mean, nothing is? Do you turn blank or go to sleep? Or do you dissolve the world and keep us all in abeyance until we are brought back to life at the next flicker of your thought? Maharaj, oh no, it is not that bad. The world of mind and matter of names and shapes continues, but it does not matter to me at all. It is like having a shadow. It is there following me wherever I go, but not hindering me in any way. It remains a world of experiences, but not of names and forms related to me by desires and fears. The experiences are qualityless pure experiences, if I may say so. I call them experiences for the lack of a better word. They are like the waves on the surface of the ocean, the ever-present, but not affecting its peaceful power. Question, you mean to say an experience can be nameless, formless, undefined? Maharaj, in the beginning all experience is such. His only desire and fear born of memory that give it name and form and separate it from other experiences. It is not a conscious experience, for it is not in opposition to other experiences, yet it is an experience all the same. Question. If it is not conscious, why talk about it? Maharaj, most of your experiences are unconscious. The conscious ones are very few. You are unaware of the fact because to you only the conscious ones count. Become aware of the unconscious. Question. Can one be aware of the unconscious? How is it done? Maharaj, desire and fear are the obscuring and distorting factors. When mind is free of them the unconscious becomes accessible. Question, does it mean that the unconscious becomes conscious? Maharaj, it is rather the other way round. The conscious becomes one with the unconscious. The distinction ceases, whichever way you look at it. Question. I am puzzled. How can one be aware and yet unconscious? Maharaj, awareness is not limited to consciousness. It is of all that is. Consciousness is of duality. There is no duality in awareness. It is one single block of pure cognition. In the same way one can talk of the pure being and pure creation, nameless, formless, silent and yet absolutely real, powerful, effective. Their being indescribable does not affect them in the least. While they are unconscious they are essential. Conscious cannot change fundamentally, it can only modify. Anything to change must pass through death, through obscuration and dissolution. Gold jewelry must be melted down before it is cast into another shape. What refuses to die cannot be reborn. Question. Barring the death of the body, how does one die? Maharaj withdrawal, aloofness, letting go is death. To live fully death is essential. Every ending makes a new beginning. 
On the other hand, do understand that only the dead can die, not the living. That which is alive in you is immortal. Question. From where does desire draw its energy? Maharaj, its name and shape it draws from memory. The energy flows from the source. Question. Some desires are altogether wrong. How can wrong desires flow from a sublime source? Maharaj, the source is neither right nor wrong. Nor is desire by itself right or wrong. Is nothing but striving for happiness. Having identified yourself with a speck of a body you feel lost and search desperately for the sense of fullness and completeness you call happiness. Question, when did I lose it? I never had it. Maharaj, you had it before you woke up this morning. Go beyond your consciousness and you will find it. Question, how am I to go beyond? Maharaj, you know it already, do it. Question, that's what you say. I know nothing about it. Maharaj, yet I repeat you know it. Do it. Go beyond back to your normal natural supreme state. Question, I'm puzzled. Maharaj, a speck in the eye makes you think you are blind. Wash it out and look. Question, I do look. I see only darkness. Maharaj, remove the speck and your eyes will be flooded with light. The light is there waiting. The eyes are there ready. The darkness you see is but the shadow of the tiny speck. Get rid of it and come back to your natural state. Chapter 81 Root Cause of Fear Maharaj, where do you come from? Questioner, I am from the United States, but I live mostly in Europe. To India I came recently. I was in Rishikesh in two ashrams. I was taught meditation and breathing. Maharaj, how long were you there? Question. Eight days in one, six days in another. I was not happy there and I left. Then for three weeks I was with the Tibetan Lamas. But they were all wrapped up in formulas and rituals. Maharaj, and what was the net result of it all? Question. Definitely there was an increase of energy. But before I left for Rishikesh, I did some fasting and dieting at a nature cure sanatorium at Putakot I in South India. It has done me enormous good. Maharaj, maybe the access of energy was due to better health. Question. I cannot say. But as a result of all these attempts some fires started burning in various places in my body and I heard chants and voices where there were none. Maharaj, and what are you after now? Question, well, what are we all after? Some truth, some inner certainty, some real happiness. In the various schools of self-realization, there is so much talk of awareness, that one ends with the impression that awareness itself is the supreme reality. Is it so? The body is looked after by the brain, the brain is illumined by consciousness, awareness watches over consciousness, is there anything beyond awareness? Maharaj, how do you know that you are aware? Question, I feel that I am. I cannot express it otherwise. Maharaj, when you follow it up carefully from brain through consciousness to awareness, you find that the sense of duality persists. When you go beyond awareness, there is a state of non-duality, in which there is no cognition, only pure being, which may be as well called non-being, if by being you mean being something in particular. Question, what you call pure being is it universal being being everything? Maharaj, everything implies a collection of particulars. In pure being the very idea of the particular is absent. Question. Is there any relationship between pure being and particular being? Maharaj. What relationship can there be between what is and what merely appears to be? Is there any relationship between the ocean and its waves? The real enables the unreal to appear and causes it to disappear. 
The succession of transient moments creates the illusion of time, but the timeless reality of pure being is not in movement, for all movement requires a motionless background. It is itself the background. Once you have found it in yourself, you know that you had never lost that independent being, independent of all divisions and separations. You don't look for it in consciousness, you will not find it there. Don't look for it anywhere for nothing contains it. On the contrary, it contains everything and manifests everything. It is like the daylight that makes everything visible while itself remaining invisible. Question. Sir, of what use to me is your telling me that reality cannot be found in consciousness? Where else am I to look for it? How do you apprehend it? Maharaj, it is quite simple. If I ask you what is the taste of your mouth, all you can do is to say, it is neither sweet, nor bitter, nor sour, nor astringent, it is what remains when all these tastes are not. Similarly, when all distinctions and reactions are no more, what remains is reality, simple and solid. Question, all that I understand is that I am in the grip of a beginningless illusion. And I do not see how it can come to an end. If it could, it would, long ago. I must have had as many opportunities in the past as I shall have in the future. What could not happen cannot happen. Or if it did, it could not last. A very deplorable state, after all these untold millions of years carries at best, the promise of ultimate extinction, or which is worse, the threat of an endless and meaningless repetition. Maharaj, what proof have you that your present state is beginningless and endless? How were you before you were born? How will you be after death? Of your present state, how much do you know? You do not know even what was your condition before you woke up this morning. You only know a little of your present state and from it you draw conclusions for all times and places. You may be just dreaming and imagining your dream to be eternal. Question. Calling it a dream does not change the situation. I repeat my question. What hope is left which the eternity behind me could not fulfill? Why should my future be different from my past? Maharaj, in your fevered state, you project a past and a future and take them to be real. In fact, you know only your present moment. Why not investigate what is now, instead of questioning the imaginary past and future? Your present state is neither beginningless nor endless. It is over in a flash. Watch carefully from where it comes and where it goes. You will soon discover the timeless reality behind it. Question, why have I not done it before? Maharaj, just as every wave subsides into the ocean, so does every moment return to its sour. Realization consists in discovering the source and abiding there. Question, who discovers? Maharaj, the mind discovers. Question, does it find the answers? Maharaj, it finds that it is left without questions, that no answers are needed. Question, being born is a fact. Dying is another fact. How do they appear to the witness? Maharaj, a child was born, a man has died, just events in the course of time. Question, is there any progress in the witness? Does awareness evolve? Maharaj, what is seen may undergo many changes when the light of awareness is focused on it, but it is the object that changes, not the light. Plants grow in sunlight, but the sun does not grow. By themselves both the body and the witness are motionless, but when brought together in the mind, both appear to move. Question, yes, I can see that what moves and changes is the I am only. Is the I am needed at all? Maharaj, who needs it? It is there now. It had a beginning, it will have an end. Question, what remains when the I am goes? Maharaj, what does not come and go remains. It is the ever greedy mind that creates ideas of progress and evolution towards perfection. It disturbs and talks of order, destroys and seeks security. 
Question. Is there progress in destiny, in karma? Maharaj, karma is only a store of unspent energies, of unfulfilled desires and fears not understood. For is being constantly replenished by new desires and fears. It need not be so forever. Understand the root cause of your fears, estrangement from yourself, and of desires, the longing for the self, and your karma will dissolve like a dream. Between earth and heaven life goes on. Nothing is affected, only bodies grow and decay. Question, between the person and the witness, what is the relation? Maharaj, there can be no relation between them because they are one. Don't separate and don't look for relationship. Question, if the seer and the seen are one, how did the separation occur? Maharaj, fascinated by names and forms, which are by their very nature distinct and diverse, you distinguish what is natural and separate what is one. The world is rich in diversity, but your feeling strange and frightened is due to misapprehension. It is the body that is in danger, not you. Question, I can see that the basic biological anxiety, the flight instinct, takes many shapes and distorts my thoughts and feelings. But how did this anxiety come into being? Maharaj, it is a mental state caused by the I am the body idea. It can be removed by the contrary idea, I am not the body. Both the ideas are false, but one removes the oath, realize that no ideas are your own, they all come to you from outside. You must think it all out for yourself, become yourself the object of your meditation. The effort to understand yourself is yoga. Be a yogi, give your life to it, brood, wonder, search, till you come to the root of error, and to the truth beyond the error. Question, in meditation, who meditates, the person or the witness? Maharaj, meditation is a deliberate attempt to pierce into the higher states of consciousness and finally go beyond it. The art of meditation is the art of shifting the focus of attention to ever subtler levels, without losing one's grip on the levels left behind. In a way it is like having death under control. One begins with the lowest levels, social circumstances, customs and habits, physical surroundings, the posture and the breathing of the body, the senses, their sensations and perceptions the mind, its thoughts and feelings, until the entire mechanism of personality is grasped and firmly held. Final stage of meditation is reached when the sense of identity goes beyond the I am so and so, beyond so I am, beyond I am the witness only, beyond there is, beyond all ideas into the impersonally personal pure being. But you must be energetic when you take to meditation. It is definitely not a part-time occupation. Limit your interests and activities to what is needed for you and your dependents' barest needs. Save all your energies and time for breaking the wall your mind had built around you. Believe me, you will not regret. Question, how do I come to know that my experience is universal? Maharaj, at the end of your meditation all is known directly, no proofs whatsoever are required. Just as every drop of the ocean carries the taste of the ocean, so does every moment carry the taste of eternity. Definitions and descriptions have their place as useful incentives for further search, but you must go beyond them into what is undefinable and indescribable, except in negative terms. After all, even universality and eternity are mere concepts, the opposites of being place and time bound. Reality is not a concept, nor the manifestation of a concept. It has nothing to do with concepts. Concern yourself with your mind, remove its distortions and impurities. Once you had the taste of your own self, you will find it everywhere and at all times. Therefore, it is so important that you should come to it. Once you know it, you will never lose it. But you must give yourself the opportunity through intensive, even arduous meditation. Question, what exactly do you want me to do? Maharaj, 
give your heart and mind to brooding over the I am, what is it, how is it, what is its source, its life, its meaning. It is very much like digging a well. You reject all that is not water, till you reach the life-giving spring. Question, how shall I know that I am moving in the right direction? Maharaj, by your progress in intentness in clarity and devotion to the task. Question, we Europeans find it very difficult to keep quiet. The world is too much with us. Maharaj, oh no, you are dreamers too. We differ only in the contents of our dreams. You are after perfection in the future. We are intent on finding it in the now. The limited only is perfectible. The unlimited is already perfect. You are perfect, only you don't know it. Learn to know yourself and you will discover wonders. All you need is already within you, only you must approach yourself with reverence and love. Self-condemnation and self-distrust are grievous errors. Your constant flight from pain and search for pleasure is a sign of love you bear for yourself, all I plead with you is this, make love of yourself perfect. Deny yourself nothing, glue yourself infinity and eternity and discover that you do not need them, you are beyond. Chapter 82, Absolute Perfection is Here and Now. Questioner, the war is on. What is your attitude to it? Maharaj, in some place or other, in some form or other, the war is always on. Was there a time when there was no war? Some say it is the will of God. Some say it is God's play. It is another way of saying that wars are inevitable and nobody is responsible. Question, but what is your own attitude? Maharaj, why impose attitudes on me? I have no attitude to call my own. Question, surely somebody is responsible for this horrible and senseless carnage. Why do people kill each other so readily? Maharaj, search for the culprit within. The ideas of me and mine are at the root of all conflict. Be free of them and you will be out of conflict. Question, what of it that I am out of conflict? It will not affect the war. If I am the cause of war, I am ready to be destroyed. Yet, it stands to reason that the disappearance of a thousand like me will not stop wars. They did not start with my birth nor will end with my death. I am not responsible. Who is? Maharaj, strife and struggle are a part of existence. Why don't you inquire who is responsible for existence? Question, why do you say that existence and conflict are inseparable? Can there be no existence without strife? I need not fight others to be myself. Maharaj, you fight others all the time for your survival as a separate body-mind, a particular name and form. To live you must destroy. From the moment you were conceived you started a war with your environment, a merciless war of mutual extermination, until death sets you free. Question. My question remains unanswered. You are merely describing what I know life and its sorrows. But who is responsible, you do not say. When I press you, you throw the blame on God, or karma, or on my own greed and fear, which merely invites further questions. Give me the final answer. Maharaj, the final answer is this, nothing is. All is a momentary appearance in the field of the universal consciousness, continuity as name and form is a mental formation only, easy to dispel. Question, I am asking about the immediate, the transitory, the appearance. Here is a picture of a child killed by soldiers. It is a fact staring at you. You cannot deny it. Now, who is responsible for the death of the child? Maharaj, nobody and everybody. The world is what it contains, and each thing affects all others. We all kill the child and we all die with it. Every event has innumerable causes and produces numberless effects. It is useless to keep accounts, nothing is traceable. 
question, your people speak of karma and retribution. Maharaj, it is merely a gross approximation. In reality we are all creators and creatures of each other, causing and bearing each other's burden. Question, so the innocent suffers for the guilty? Maharaj, in our ignorance we are innocent, in our actions we are guilty. We sin without knowing and suffer without understanding. Our only hope, to stop to look to understand and to get out of the traps of memory. For memory feeds imagination and imagination generates desire and fear. Question, why do I imagine at all? Maharaj, the light of consciousness passes through the film of memory and throws pictures on your brain. Because of the deficient and disordered state of your brain, what you perceive is distorted and colored by feelings of like and dislike. Make your thinking orderly and free from emotional overtones, and you will see people and things as they are, with clarity and charity. The witness of birth, life and death is one and the same. It is the witness of pain and of love. For while the existence and limitation and separation is sorrowful, we love it. We love it and hate it at the same time. We fight, we kill, we destroy life and property and yet we are affectionate and self-sacrificing. We nurse the child tenderly and orphan it too. Our life is full of contradictions. Yet we cling to it. This clinging is at the root of everything. Still, it is entirely superficial. We hold on to something or somebody with all our might and next moment we forget it, like a child that shapes its mud pies and abandons them light-heartedly. Touch them, it will scream with anger, divert the child and he forgets them. For our life is now, and the love of it is now. We love variety, the play of pain and pleasure, we are fascinated by contrasts. For this we need the opposites and their apparent separation. We enjoy them for a time and then get tired and crave for the peace and silence of pure being. The cosmic heart beats ceaselessly. I am the witness and the heart too. Question, I can see the picture, but who is the painter? Who is responsible for this terrible and yet adorable experience? Maharaj, the painter is in the picture. You separate the painter from the picture and look for him. Don't separate and don't put false questions. Things are as they are and nobody in particular is responsible. The idea of personal responsibility comes from the illusion of agency. Somebody must have done it, somebody is responsible. Society, as it is now, with its framework of laws and customs, is based on the idea of a separate and responsible personality, but this is not the only form a society can take. There may be other forms where the sense of separation is weak and responsibility diffused. Question. An individual with a weak sense of personality, is he nearer self-realization? Maharaj, take the case of a young child. The sense of I am is not yet formed, the personality is rudimentary. The obstacles to self-knowledge are few, but the power and the clarity of awareness, its width and depth are lacking. In the course of years awareness will grow stronger, but also the latent personality will emerge and obscure and complicate. Just as the harder the wood, the hotter the flame, so the stronger the personality, brighter the light generated from its destruction. Question. Have you no problems? Maharaj, I do have problems. I told you already. To be to exist with a name and form is painful, yet I love it. Question. But you love everything. Maharaj, in existence everything is contained. My very nature is to love, even the painful is lovable. Question, it does not make it less painful. Why not remain in the unlimited? Maharaj, it is the instinct of exploration, the love of the unknown, that brings me into existence. It is in the nature of being to see adventure in becoming, as it is in the very nature of becoming to seek peace in being.
This alteration of being and becoming is inevitable, but my home is beyond. Question. Is your home in God? Maharaj, to love and worship a God is also ignorance. My home is beyond all notions however sublime. Question. But God is not a notion. It is the reality beyond existence. Maharaj, you may use any word you like. Whatever you may think of and beyond it. Question. Once you know your home why not stay in it? What takes you out of it? Maharaj, out of love for corporate existence one is born and once born, one gets involved in destiny. Destiny is inseparable from becoming. The desire to be the particular makes you into a person with all its personal past and future. Look at some great man, what a wonderful man he was. And yet how troubled was his life and limited its fruits. How utterly dependent is the personality of man and how indifferent is its world. And yet we love it and protect it for its very insignificance. Question, the war is on and there is chaos in your being asked to take charge of a feeding center. You are given what is needed, it is only a question of getting through the job. Will you refuse it? Maharaj, to work or not to work is one and the same to me. I may take charge or may not. There may be others, better endowed for such tasks than I am, professional caterers for instance. But my attitude is different. I do not look at death as a calamity as I do not rejoice at the birth of a child. The child is out for trouble while the dead is out of it. Attachment to life is attachment to sorrow. We love what gives us pain. Such is our nature. For me the moment of death will be a moment of jubilation, not awe fear. I cried when I was born and I shall die laughing. Question. What is the change in consciousness at the moment of death? Maharaj, what change do you expect? When the film projection ends, all remains the same as when it started. The state before you were born was also the state after death if you remember. Question, I remember nothing. Maharaj, because you never tried. It is only a question of tuning in the mind. It requires training, of course. Question. Why don't you take part in social work? Maharaj, but I am doing nothing else all the time. And what is the social work you want me to do? Patchwork is not for me. My stand is clear. Produce to distribute, feed before you eat, give before you take, think of others, before you think of yourself. Only a selfless society based on sharing can be stable and happy. This is the only practical solution. If you do not want it, fight. Question, it is all a matter of goodness. Where Thomas and Rajas predominate, there must be war. Where Sattva rules, there will be peace. Maharaj, put it whichever way you like, it comes to the same. Society is built on motives. Put goodwill into the foundations and you will not need specialized social workers. Question, the world is getting better. Maharaj, the world had all the time to get better yet it did not. What hope is there for the future? Of course, there have been and will be periods of harmony and peace when Sava was in ascendance, but things get destroyed by their own perfection. A perfect society is necessarily static and therefore, it stagnates and decays. From the summit all roads lead downwards. Societies are like people, they are born, they grow to some point of relative perfection, and then decay and die. Question. Is there not a state of absolute perfection which does not decay? Maharaj, whatever has a beginning must have an end. In the timeless all is perfect, here and now. Question. But shall we reach the timeless in due course? Maharaj, in due course we shall come back to the starting point. Time cannot take us out of time, as space cannot take us out of space. All you get by waiting is more waiting. Absolute perfection is here and now, not in some future, near or far. 
The secret is in action here and now. It is your behavior that blinds you to yourself. Disregard whatever you think yourself to be and act as if you were absolutely perfect, whatever your idea of perfection may be. All you need is courage. Question, where do I find such courage? Maharaj, in yourself of course. Look within. Question, your grace will help. Maharaj, my grace is telling you now, look within. All you need you have. Use it. Behave as best you know, do what you think you should. Don't be afraid of mistakes, you can always correct them only intentions matter. The shape things take is not within your power, the motives of your actions are. Question, how can action born from imperfection lead to perfection? Maharaj, action does not lead to perfection, perfection is expressed in action. As long as you judge yourself by your expressions give them utmost attention, when you realize your own being your behavior will be perfect spontaneously. Question. If I am timelessly perfect then why was I born at all? What is the purpose of this life? Maharaj, it is like asking, what does it profit gold to be made into an ornament? The ornament gets the color and the beauty of gold, gold is not enriched. Similarly, reality expressed in action makes the action meaningful and beautiful. Question, what does the real gain through its expressions? Maharaj, what can it gain? Nothing whatsoever. But it is in the nature of love to express itself, to affirm itself, to overcome difficulties. Once you have understood that the world is love in action, you will look at it quite differently. But first your attitude to suffering must change. Suffering is primarily a call for attention, which itself is a movement of love. More than happiness, love wants growth, the widening and deepening of consciousness and being. Whatever prevents becomes a cause of pain, and love does not shirk from pain. That but the energy that works for righteousness and orderly development must not be thwarted. When obstructed it turns against itself and becomes destructive. Whenever love is withheld and suffering allowed to spread war becomes inevitable. Our indifference to our neighbor's sorrow brings suffering to our door. Chapter 83 The True Guru Questioner, you were saying the other day that at the root of your realization was the trust in your guru. He assured you that you were already the absolute reality and there was nothing more to be done. You trusted him and left it at that without straining, without striving. Now my question is, without trust in your guru would you have realized? After all, what you are, you are whether your mind trusts or not, would doubt obstruct the action of the guru's words and make them inoperative. Maharaj, you have said it they would have been made inoperative for a time. Question, and what would happen to the energy or power in the Guru's words? Maharaj, it would remain latent unmanifested. But the entire question is based on a misunderstanding. The master, the disciple, the love and trust between them, these are one fact, not so many independent facts. Each is a part of the other. Without love and trust there would have been no guru nor disciple, and no relationship between them. It is like pressing a switch to light an electric lamp. It is because the lamp, the wiring, the switch, the transformer, the transmission lines and the powerhouse form a single whole, that you get the light. Any one factor missing and there would be no light. You must not separate the inseparable. Words do not create facts. They either describe them or distort. Fact is always non-verbal. Question. I still do not understand. Can the Guru's word remain unfulfilled or will it invariably prove true? Maharaj, words of a realized man never miss their purpose. They wait for the right conditions to arise which may take some time, and this is natural, for there is a season for sowing and a season for harvesting. But the word of a guru is a seed that cannot perish. 
Of course, the Guru must be a real one, who is beyond the body and the mind, beyond consciousness itself, beyond space and time, beyond duality and unity, beyond understanding and description. The good people who have read a lot and have a lot to say may teach you many useful things, but they are not the real gurus whose words invariably come true. They also may tell you that you are the ultimate reality itself, but what of it? Question, nevertheless, if for some reason I happen to trust them and obey, shall I be the loser? Maharaj, if you are able to trust and obey, you will soon find your real guru, or rather, he will find you. Question, does every knower of the self become a guru, or can one be a knower of reality without being able to take others to it? Maharaj, if you know what you teach, you can teach what you know, here seership and teachership are one. But the absolute reality is beyond both. The self-styled gurus talk of rightness and effort, of merits and achievements, of destiny and grace, all these are mere mental formations, projections of an addicted mind. Instead of helping they obstruct. Question, how can I make out whom to follow and whom to mistrust? Maharaj, mistrust all until you are convinced. The true guru will never humiliate you, nor will he estrange you from yourself. He will constantly bring you back to the fact of your inherent perfection and encourage you to seek within. He knows you need nothing, not even him, and is never tired of reminding you. But the self-appointed guru is more concerned with himself than with his disciples. Question. You said that reality is beyond the knowledge and the teaching of the real. Is not the knowledge of reality the supreme itself and teaching the proof of its attainment? Maharaj, the knowledge of the real or the self is a state of mind. Teaching another is a movement in duality. They concern the mind only, Sava is a guna all the same. Question, what is real then? Maharaj, he who knows the mind is non-realized and realized, who knows ignorance and knowledge as states of mind, he is the real. When you are given diamonds mixed with gravel, you may either miss the diamonds or find them. It is the scene that matters. Where is the grayness of the gravel and the beauty of the diamond without the power to see? The known is but a shape and knowledge is but a name. The knower is but a state of mind. The real is beyond. Question. Surely, objective knowledge and ideas of things and self-knowledge are not one and the same thing. One needs a brain, the other does not. Maharaj, for the purpose of discussion you can arrange words and give the meaning, but the fact remains that all knowledge is a form of ignorance. The most accurate map is yet only paper. All knowledge is in memory, it is only recognition, while reality is beyond the duality of the knower and the known. Question, then by what is reality known? Maharaj, how misleading is your language? You assume unconsciously that reality also is approachable through knowledge. And then you will bring in a knower of reality beyond reality. To understand that to be reality need not be known. Ignorance and knowledge are in the mind, not in the real. Question. If there is no such thing as the knowledge of the real, then how do I reach it? Maharaj, you need not reach out for what is already with you. Your very reaching out makes you miss it. Give up the idea that you have not found it, and just let it come into the focus of direct perception, here and now, by removing all that is of the mind. Question, when all that can go goes, what remains? Maharaj, emptiness remains, awareness remains, pure light of the conscious being remains. It is like asking what remains of a room when all the furniture is removed. A most serviceable room remains. And when even the walls are pulled down, space remains. Beyond space and time is the here and the now of reality. Question, does the witness remain? Maharaj, as long as there is consciousness, its witness is also there. The two appear and disappear together. 
question, if the witness to his transient, why is he given so much importance? Maharaj, just to break the spell of the known, the illusion that only the perceivable is real. Question. Perception is primary, the witness, secondary. Maharaj, this is the heart of the matter. As long as you believe that only the outer world is real, you remain its slave. To become free, your attention must be drawn to the I am, the witness. Of course, the knower and the known are one, not two, but to break the spell of the known, the knower must be brought to the forefront. Neither is primary, both are reflections and memory of the ineffable experience, ever new and ever now, untranslatable quicker than the mind. Question, Sir, I am an humble seeker, wandering from Guru to Guru in search of release. My mind is sick, burning with desire, frozen with fear. My days flit by red with pain, gray with boredom. My age is advancing, my health decaying, my future dark and frightening. At this rate I shall live in sorrow and die in despair. Is there any hope for me? Or have I come too late? Maharaj, nothing is wrong with you, but the ideas you have of yourself are altogether wrong. It is not you who desires, fears and suffers, it is the person built on the foundation of your body by circumstances and influences. You are not that person. This must be clearly established in your mind, and never lost sight of. Normally, it needs a prolonged sadhana, years of austerities and meditation. Question, my mind is weak and vacillating. I have neither the strength nor the tenacity for sadhana. My case is hopeless. Maharaj, in a way yours is a most hopeful case. There is an alternative to sadhana which is trust. If you cannot have the conviction born from fruitful search, then take advantage of my discovery which I am so eager to share with you. I can see with the utmost clarity that you have never been, nor are, nor will be estranged from realty, that you are the fullness of perfection here and now, and that nothing can deprive you of your heritage, of what you are. You are in no way different from me, only you do not know it. You do not know what you are and therefore you imagine yourself to be what you are not. Hence desires and fear and overwhelming despair, and meaningless activity in order to escape. Just trust me and live by trusting me. I shall not mislead you. You are the supreme reality beyond the world and its creator, beyond consciousness and its witness, beyond all assertions and denials. Remember it, think of it, act on it. Abandon all sense of separation, see yourself in all and act accordingly. With action bliss will come and with bliss conviction. After all, you doubt yourself because you are in sorrow. Happiness, natural, spontaneous and lasting cannot be imagined. Either it is there or it is not. Once you begin to experience the peace, love and happiness which need no outer causes, all your doubts will dissolve. Just catch hold of what I told you and live by it. Question. You are telling me to live by memory. Maharaj, you are living by memory anyhow. I am merely asking you to replace the old memories by the memory of what I told you. As you were acting on your old memories, act on the new one. Don't be afraid. For some time there is bound to be a conflict between the old and the new, but if you put yourself resolutely on the side of the new, the strife will soon come to an end and you will realize the effortless state of being oneself, of not being deceived by desires and fears born of illusion. Question. Many gurus have the habit of giving tokens of their grace, their head cloth or their sticks or begging bowl or robe, thus transmitting or confirming the self-realization of their disciples. I can see no value in such practices. It is not self-realization that is transmitted, but self-importance. Of what earthly use is being told something very flattering, but not true? On one hand you are warning me against the many self-styled gurus, on the other you want me to trust you. 
Why do you claim to be an exception? Maharaj, I do not ask you to trust me. Trust my words and remember them. I want your happiness, not mine. Distrust those who put a distance between you and your true being and offer themselves as a go-between. I do nothing of the kind. I do not even make any promises. I merely say, if you trust my words and put them to test, you will for yourself discover how absolutely true they are. If you ask for a proof before you venture, I can only say, I am the proof. I did trust my teacher's words and kept them in my mind and I did find that he was right, that I was, am and shall be the infinite reality, embracing all, transcending all. As you say, you have neither the time nor the energy for lengthy practices. I offer you an alternative. Accept my words on trust and live anew, or live and die in sorrow. Question. It seems too good to be true. Maharaj, don't be misled by the simplicity of the advice. Backslash very few are those who have the courage to trust the innocent and the simple. To know that you are a prisoner of your mind, that you live in an imaginary world of your own creation, is the dawn of wisdom. To want nothing of it to be ready to abandon it entirely is earnestness. Only such earnestness born of true despair will make you trust me. Question, have I not suffered enough? Maharaj, suffering has made you dull unable to see its enormity. Your first task is to see the sorrow in you and around you, your next to long intensely for liberation. The very intensity of longing will guide you, you need no other guide. Question, suffering has made me dull, indifferent even to itself. Maharaj, maybe it is not sorrow but pleasure that made you dull. Investigate. Question, whatever may be the cause, I am dull. I have neither the will nor the energy. Maharaj, oh no. You have enough for the first step. And each step will generate enough energy for the next. Energy comes with confidence and confidence comes with experience. Question. Is it right to change gurus? Maharaj, why not change? Gurus are like milestones. It is natural to move on from one to another. Each tells you the direction and the distance, while the sad guru, the eternal guru, is the road itself. Once you realize that the road is the goal and that you are always on the road, not to reach a goal, but to enjoy its beauty and its wisdom, life ceases to be a task and becomes natural and simple, in itself an ecstasy. Question. So there is no need to worship, to pray, to practice yoga. Maharaj, a little of daily sweeping, washing and bathing can do no harm. Self-awareness tells you at every step what needs be done. When all is done, the mind remains quiet. Now you are in the waking state, a person with name and shape, joys and sorrows. The person was not there before you were born, nor will be there after you die. Instead of struggling with the person to make it become what it is not, why not go beyond the waking state and leave the personal life altogether? It does not mean the extinction of the person. It means only seeing it in right perspective. Question. One. More question. You said that before I was born I was one with the pure being of reality. If so, who decided that it should be born? Maharaj. In reality you were never born and never shall die. But now you imagine that you are, or have a body and you ask what has brought about the state. Within the limits of illusion the answer is, Desire born from memory attracts you to a body and makes you think as one with it. But this is true only from the relative point of view. In fact, there is no body nor a world to contain it. There is only a mental condition, a dreamlike state, easy to dispel by questioning its reality. Question, after you die will you come again? If I live long enough will I meet you again? Maharaj, to you, the body is real, to me there is none. I, as you see me, exist in your imagination only. Surely you will see me again if and when you need me. 
it does not affect me as the sun is not affected by sunrises and sunsets. Because it is not affected, it is certain to be there when needed. You are bent on knowledge I am not. I do not have that sense of insecurity that makes you crave to know. I am curious like a child is curious. But there is no anxiety to make me seek refuge in knowledge. Therefore, I am not concerned whether I shall be reborn, or how long will the world last. These are questions born of fear. Chapter 84 Your Goal is Your Guru Questioner, you were telling us that there are many self-styled gurus, but a real guru is very rare. There are many Johnny who imagine themselves realized, but all they have is book knowledge and a high opinion of themselves. Sometimes they impress, even fascinate, attract disciples and make them waste their time in useless practices. After some years, when the disciple takes stock of himself, he finds no change. When he complains to his teacher, he gets the usual rebuke that he did not try hard enough. The blame is on the lack of faith and love in the heart of the disciple, while in reality the blame is on the guru, who had no business in accepting disciples and raising their hopes. How to protect oneself from such gurus? Maharaj, why be so concerned with others? Whoever may be the guru, if he is pure of heart and acts in good faith, he will do his disciples no harm. There is no progress, the fault lies with the disciples, their laziness and lack of self-control. On the other hand, if the disciple is earnest and applies himself intelligently, and with zest to his sadhana, he is bound to meet a more qualified teacher, who will take him further. Your question flows from three false assumptions, that one needs concern oneself with others, that one can evaluate another, and that the progress of the disciple is the task and responsibility of his guru. In reality, the guru's role is only to instruct and encourage, the disciple is totally responsible for himself. Question. We are told that total surrender to the Guru is enough that the Guru will do the rest. Maharaj, of course, when there is total surrender, complete relinquishment of all concern with one's past, presence and future, with one's physical and spiritual security and standing, a new life dawns, full of love and beauty, then the Guru is not important, for the disciple has broken the shell of self-defense. Complete self-surrender by itself is liberation. Question, when both the disciple and his teacher are inadequate, what will happen? Maharaj, in the long run all will be well. After all, the real self of both is not affected by the comedy they play for a time. They will sober up and ripen and shift to a higher level of relationship. Question, or they may separate. Maharaj, yes they may separate. After all, no relationship is forever. Duality is a temporary state. Question. Is it by accident that I met you and by another accident shall we separate never to meet again? Or is my meeting you a part of some cosmic pattern, a fragment in the great drama of our lives? Maharaj. The real is meaningful, and the meaningful relates to reality. Our relationship is meaningful to you and me, it cannot be accidental. The future affects the present as much as the past. Question, how can I make out who is a real saint and who is not? Maharaj, you cannot unless you have a clear insight into the heart of man. Appearances are deceptive. To see clearly, your mind must be pure and unattached. Unless you know yourself well, how can you know another? and when you know yourself, you are the other. Leave others alone for some time and examine yourself. There are so many things you do not know about yourself. What are you? Who are you? How did you come to be born? What are you doing now and why? Where are you going? What is the meaning and purpose of your life, your death, your future? Have you a past? Have you a future? How did you come to live in turmoil and sorrow while your entire being strives for happiness and peace? These are weighty matters and have to be attended to first. 
you have no need nor time for finding who is a Johnny and who is not. Question. I must select my gear rightly. Maharaj, be the right man and the right guru will surely find you. Question. You are not answering my question, how to find the right guru. Maharaj, but I did answer your question. Do not look for a guru, do not even think of one. Make your goal your guru. After all, the guru is but a means to an end, not the end in itself. He is not important, it is what you expect of him that matters to you. Now what do you expect? Question. By his grace I shall be made happy, powerful and peaceful. Maharaj! What ambitions! How can a person limited in time and space, a mere body-mind, a gasp of pain between birth and death be happy? Very conditions of its arising make happiness impossible. Peace, power, happiness, these are never personal states, nobody can say my peace, my power, because mine implies exclusivity, which is fragile and insecure. Question. I know only my conditioned existence, there is nothing else. Maharaj, surely you cannot say so. In deep sleep you are not conditioned. How ready and willing you are to go to sleep, how peaceful, free and happy you are when asleep. Question, I know nothing of it. Maharaj, put it negatively. When you sleep, you are not in pain, nor bound, nor restless. Question. I see your point. While awake I know that I am, but I'm not happy. In sleep I am, I am happy, but I don't know it. All I need is to know that I am free and happy. Maharaj, quite so. Now, go within, into a state which you may compare to a state of waking sleep, in which you are aware of yourself, but not of the world. In that state you will know, without the least trace of doubt, that at the root of your being you are free and happy. The only trouble is that you are addicted to experience and you cherish your memories. In reality, it is the other way round, what is remembered is never real, the real is now. Question. All this I grasp verbally, but it does not become a part of myself. It remains as a picture in my mind to be looked at. Is it not the task of the Guru to give life to the picture? Maharaj, again, it is the other way round. The picture is alive, dead is the mind. As the mind is made of words and images, so is every reflection in the mind. It covers up reality with verbalization and then complains. You say a guru is needed to do miracles with you. You are playing with words only. The guru and the disciple are one single thing, like the candle in its flame. Unless the disciple is earnest, he cannot be called a disciple. Unless a guru is all love and self-giving, he cannot be called a guru. Only reality begets reality, not the false. Question. I can see that I am false. Who will make me true? Maharaj, the very words you said will do it. The sentence, I can see that I am false contains all you need for liberation. Ponder over it, go into it deeply, go to the root of it, it will operate. The power is in the word, not in the person. Question, I do not grasp you fully. On one hand you say a guru is needed, on the other, the guru can only give advice, but the effort is mine. Please state clearly, can one realize the self without a guru, or is the finding of a true guru essential? Maharaj, more essential is the finding of a true disciple. Believe me, a true disciple is very rare, for in no time he goes beyond the need for a guru by finding his own self. Don't waste your time on trying to make out whether the advice you get flows from knowledge only or from valid experience. Just follow it faithfully. Life will bring you another guru if another one is needed would deprive you of all outer guidance and leave you to your own lights. It is very important to understand that it is the teaching that matters, not the person or the guru. You get a letter that makes you laugh or cry. It is not the postman who does it. 
The Guru only tells you the good news about your real self and shows you the way back to it. In a way the Guru is its messenger. There will be many messengers, but the message is one, be what you are. Or, you can put it differently, until you realize yourself, you cannot know who is your real Guru. When you realize, you find that all the Gurus you had have contributed to your awakening. Your realization is the proof that your Guru was real. Therefore take him as he is, do what he tells you with earnestness and zeal and trust your heart to warn you if anything goes wrong. If doubt sets in don't fight it. Cling to what is doubtless and leave the doubtful alone. Question. I have a Guru and I love him very much. But whether he is my true Guru I do not know. Maharaj, watch yourself. If you see yourself changing, growing, it means you have found the right man. He may be beautiful or ugly, pleasant or unpleasant, flattering you or scolding. Nothing matters, except the one crucial fact of inward growth. If you don't well, he may be your friend, but not your guru. Question. When I meet a European with some education and talk to him about a guru and his teachings, his reaction is, the man must be mad to teach such nonsense. What am I to tell him? Maharaj, take him to himself. Show him how little he knows himself, how he takes the most absurd statements about himself or holy truth. He's told that he is the body, was born, will die, has parents, duties, learns to like what others like and fear what others fear. Totally a creature of heredity and society, he lives by memory and acts by habits. Ignorant of himself and his true interests, he pursues false aims and is always frustrated. His life and death are meaningless and painful, and there seems to be no way out. Then tell him, there is a way out within his easy reach, not a conversion to another set of ideas, but a liberation from all ideas and patterns of living. Don't tell him about gurus and disciples, this way of thinking is not for him. His is an inner path, he is moved by an inner urge and guided by an inner light. Invite him to rebel and he will respond. Do not try to impress on him that so and so is a realized man and can be accepted as a guru. As long as he does not trust himself, he cannot trust another. And confidence will come with experience. Question, how strange. I cannot imagine life without a guru. Maharaj, it is a matter of temperament. You two are right. For you singing the praises of God is enough. You need not desire realization or take up a sadhana. God's name is all the food you need. Live on it. Question. This constant repetition of a few words, is it not a kind of madness? Maharaj, it is madness but it is a deliberate madness. All repetitiveness is Thomas, but repeating the name of God is Sattva Thomas due to its high purpose. Because of the presence of Sattva, the Tamas will wear out and will take the shape of complete dispassion, detachment, relinquishment, aloofness, immutability. Tamas becomes the firm foundation on which an integrated life can be lived. Question. The immutable does it die? Maharaj, it is changing that dies. The immutable neither lives nor dies, it is the timeless witness of life and death. You cannot call it dead, for it is aware. Nor can you call it alive, for it does not change. It is just like your tape recorder. It records, it reproduces all by itself. You only listen. Similarly I watch all that happens, including my talking to you. It is not me who talks, the words appear in my mind, and then I hear them said. Question. Is it not the case with everybody? Maharaj, who said no? But you insist that you think you speak while to me there is thinking, there is speaking. Question. There are two cases to consider. Either I have found a guru or I have not. In each case what is the right thing to do? Maharaj, you are never without a guru, for he is timelessly present in your heart. 
Sometimes he externalizes himself and comes to you as an uplifting and reforming factor in your life, a mother, a wife, a teacher, or he remains as an inner urge toward righteousness and perfection. All you have to do is obey him and do what he tells you. What he wants you to do is simple, learn self-awareness, self-control, self-surrender. It may seem arduous, but it is easy if you are earnest. And quite impossible if you are not. Earnestness is both necessary and sufficient. Everything yields to earnestness. Question, what makes one earnest? Maharaj, compassion is the foundation of earnestness. Compassion for yourself and others, born of suffering, your own and others. Question, must I suffer to be earnest? Maharaj, you need not, if you are sensitive and respond to the suffering of others as Buddha did. But if you are callous and without pity, your own suffering will make you ask the inevitable questions. Question, I find myself suffering but not enough. Life is unpleasant but bearable. My little pleasures compensate me for my small pains, and on the whole I am better off than most of the people I know. I know that my condition is precarious, that a calamity can overtake me any moment. Must I wait for a crisis to put me on my way to truth? Maharaj, the moment you have seen how fragile is your condition, you are already alert. Now keep alert, give attention, inquire, investigate, discover your mistakes of mind and body and abandon them. Question, where is the energy to come from? I am like a paralyzed man in a burning house. Maharaj, even paralyzed people sometimes find their legs in a moment of danger. But you are not paralyzed, you merely imagine so. Make the first step and you will be on your way. Question, I feel my hold on the body is so strong that I just cannot give up the idea that I am the body. It will cling to me as long as the body lasts. There are people who maintain that no realization is possible while alive and I feel inclined to agree with them. Maharaj, before you agree or disagree, why not investigate the very idea of a body? Does the mind appear in the body or the body in the mind? Truly there must be a mind to conceive the I am the body idea. Body without a mind cannot be my body. My body is invariably absent when the mind is in abeyance. It is also absent when the mind is deeply engaged in thoughts and feelings. Once you realize that the body depends on the mind, and the mind on consciousness, and consciousness on awareness and not the other way round, your question about waiting for self-realization, till you die is answered. It is not that you must be free from I am the body idea first, and then realize the self. It is definitely the other way round, you cling to the false because you do not know the true. Earnestness, not perfection, is a precondition to self-realization. Virtues and powers come with realization, not before. Chapter 85, I Am, The Foundation of All Experience Questioner, I hear you making statements about yourself like, I am timeless, immutable beyond attributes etc. How do you know these things? And what makes you say them? Maharaj, I am only trying to describe the state before the I am arose, but the state itself being beyond the mind and language is indescribable. Question, the I am is the foundation of all experience. What you are trying to describe must also be an experience, limited and transitory. You speak of yourself as immutable. I hear the sound of the word, I remember its dictionary meaning, but the experience of being immutable I do not have. How can I break through the barrier and know personally, intimately, what it means to be immutable? Maharaj, the word itself is the bridge. Remember it, think of it, explore it, go round it, look at it from all directions, dive into it with earnest perseverance, endure all delays and disappointments till suddenly the mind turns round, away from the word, towards the reality beyond the word. It is like trying to find a person knowing his name only. A day comes when your inquiries bring you to him and the name becomes reality. Words are valuable, 
for between the word and its meaning there is a link, and if one investigates the word assiduously, one crosses beyond the concept into the experience at the root of it. As a matter of fact, such repeated attempts to go beyond the words is called meditatio, sadhana is but a persistent attempt to cross over from the verbal to the non-verbal. The task seems hopeless until suddenly all becomes clear and simple and so wonderfully easy. But as long as you are interested in your present way of living, you will shirk from the final leap into the unknown. Question, why should the unknown interest me? Of what use is the unknown? Maharaj, of no use whatsoever. But it is worthwhile to know what keeps you within the narrow confines of the known. It is the full and correct knowledge of the known that takes you to the unknown. You cannot think of it in terms of uses and advantages, to be quite detached, beyond the reach of all self-concern, all selfish consideration, is an inescapable condition of liberation. You may call it death, to me it is living at its most meaningful and intense, for I am one with life in its totality and fullness, intensity, meaningfulness, harmony. What more do you want? Question. Nothing more is needed, of course. But you are talking of the noble. Maharaj, of the unknowable only silence talks. The mind can talk only of what it knows. If you diligently investigate the noble, it dissolves and only the unknowable remains. But with the first flicker of imagination and interest the unknowable is obscured and the known comes to the forefront. The known, the changeable, is what you live with, the unchangeable is of no use to you. It is only when you are satiated with the changeable and long for the unchangeable, that you are ready for the turning round and stepping into what can be described, when seen from the level of the mind as emptiness and darkness. For the mind craves for content and variety, while reality is, to the mind, contentless and invariable. Question. It looks like death to me. Maharaj, it is. It is also all-pervading, all-conquering, intense beyond words. No ordinary brain can stand it without being shattered, hence the absolute need for sadhana. Purity of body and clarity of mind, non-violence and selflessness in life, are essential for survival as an intelligent and spiritual entity. Question. Are there entities in reality? Maharaj, identity is reality, reality is identity. Reality is not shapeless mass, a wordless chaos. It is powerful, aware, blissful, compared to it your life is like a candle to the sun. Question, by the grace of God and your teachers you lost all desire and fear and reached the immovable state. My question is simple, how do you know that your state is immovable? Maharaj, only the changeable can be thought of and talked about. The unchangeable can only be realized in silence. Once realized, it will deeply affect the changeable itself remaining unaffected. Question, how do you know that you are the witness? Maharaj, I do not know I am. I am, because to be everything must be witnessed. Question, existence can also be accepted on hearsay. Maharaj, still finally you come to the need of a direct witness. Witnessing, if not personal and actual, must at least be possible and feasible. Direct experience is the final proof. Question, experience may be faulty and misleading. Maharaj, quite but not the fact of an experience. Whatever may be the experience, true or false, the fact of an experience taking place cannot be denied. It is its own proof. Watch yourself closely and you will see that whatever be the content of consciousness, the witnessing of it does not depend on the content. Awareness is itself and does not change with the event. The event may be pleasant or unpleasant, minor or important, awareness is the same. Take note of the peculiar nature of pure awareness, its natural self-identity, without the least trace of self-consciousness, and go to the root of it, and you will soon realize that awareness is your true nature and nothing you may be aware of, 
you can call your own. Question. Is not consciousness and its content one and the same? Maharaj, consciousness is like a cloud in the sky and the water drops are the content. The cloud needs the sun to become visible and consciousness needs being focused in awareness. Question. Is not awareness a form of consciousness? Maharaj, when the content is viewed without likes and dislikes, the consciousness of it is awareness. But still there is a difference between awareness as reflected in consciousness and pure awareness beyond consciousness. Reflected awareness, the sense I am aware is the witness, while pure awareness is the essence of reality. Reflection of the sun in a drop of water is the reflection of the sun, no doubt, but not the sun itself. Between awareness reflected in consciousness as the witness and pure awareness there is a gap, which the mind cannot cross. Question, does it not depend on the way you look at it? The mind says there is a difference. The heart says there is none. Maharaj, of course there is no difference. The real sees the real in the unreal. It is the mind that creates the unreal, and it is the mind that sees the false as false. Question. I understood that the experience of the real follows seeing the false as false. Maharaj, there is no such thing as the experience of the real. The real is beyond experience. All experience is in the mind. You know the real by being real. Question. If the real is beyond words and mind, why do we talk so much about it? Maharaj, for the joy of it, of course. The real is bliss supreme. Even to talk of it is happiness. Question. I hear you talking of the unshakable and blissful. What is in your mind when you use these words? Maharaj, there is nothing in my mind. As you hear the words, so do I hear them. Power that makes everything happen makes them also happen. Question, but you are speaking, not me. Maharaj, that is how it appears to you. As I see it, two body minds exchange symbolic noises. In reality, nothing happens. Question, listen sir. I am coming to you because I am in trouble. I am a poor soul lost in a world I do not understand. I am afraid of Mother Nature who wants me to grow, procreate and die. When I ask for the meaning and purpose of all this she does not answer. I have come to you because I was told that you are kind and wise. You talk about the changeable as false and transient and this I can understand. But when you talk of the immutable, I feel lost. Not this, not that beyond knowledge of no use, why talk of it all? Does it exist, or is it a concept only, a verbal opposite to the changeable? Maharaj, it is it alone is. But in your present state, it is of no use to you. Just like the glass of water near your bed, if of no use to you, when you dream that you are dying of thirst in a desert. I am trying to wake you up, whatever your dream. Question, please don't tell me that I am dreaming and that I will soon wake up. I wish it were so. But I am awake and in pain. You talk of a painless state, but you add that I cannot have it in my present condition. I feel lost. Maharaj, don't feel lost. I only say that to find the immutable and blissful you must give up your hold on the mutable and painful. You are concerned with your own happiness, and I am telling you that there is no such thing. Happiness is never your own, it is where the eye is not. I do not say it is beyond your reach, you have only to reach out beyond yourself and you will find it. Question. If I have to go beyond myself, why did I get the I am idea in the first instance? Maharaj, the mind needs a center to draw a circle. The circle may grow bigger and with every increase there will be a change in the sense I am. A man who took himself in hand, a yogi, will draw a spiral, yet the center will remain, however vast the spiral. A day comes when the entire enterprise is seen as false and given up. The central point is no more and the universe becomes the center. Question. 
Yes, maybe. But what am I to do now? Maharaj, assiduously watch your ever-changing life, probe deeply into the motives beyond your actions and you will soon prick the bubble in which you are enclosed. Sheik needs the shell to grow, but a day comes when the shell must be broken. If it is not, there will be suffering and death. Question. Do you mean to say that if I do not take to yoga, I am doomed to extinction? Maharaj, there is the guru who will come to your rescue. In the meantime be satisfied with watching the flow of your life, if your watchfulness is deep and steady, ever turn towards the source, it will gradually move upstream till suddenly it becomes the source. Put your awareness to work not your mind. The mind is not the right instrument for this task. Timeless can be reached only by the timeless. Your body and your mind are both subject to time, only awareness is timeless, even in the now. In awareness you are facing facts and reality is fond of facts. Question: You rely entirely on my awareness to take me over and not on the Guru and God. Maharaj, God gives the body and the mind and the Guru shows the way to use them. But returning to the source is your own task. Question, God has created me, he will look after me. Maharaj, there are innumerable gods, each in his own universe. They create and recreate eternally. Are you going to wait for them to save you? What you need for salvation is already within your reach. Use it. Investigate what you know to its very end, and you will reach the unknown layers of your being. Go further and the unexpected will explode in you and shatter all. Question, does it mean death? Maharaj, it means life at last. Chapter 86, The Unknown is the Home of the Real. Questioner, who is the Guru and who is the Supreme Guru? Maharaj, all that happens in your consciousness is your Guru. And pure awareness beyond consciousness is the Supreme Guru. Question. My Guru is Sri Babaji. What is your opinion of him? Maharaj, what a question to ask. The space in Bombay is asked what is its opinion of the space in Pune. The names differ but not the space. The word Babaji is merely as address. Who lives under the address? You ask questions when you are in trouble. Inquire who is giving trouble and to whom. Question. I understand everybody is under the obligation to realize. Is it his duty or his destiny? Maharaj. Realization is of the fact that you are not a person. Therefore, it cannot be the duty of the person whose destiny is to disappear. His destiny is the duty of him who imagines himself to be the person. Find out who he is and the imagined person will dissolve. Freedom is from something. What are you to be free from? Obviously, you must be free from the person you take yourself to be, for it is the idea you have of yourself that keeps you in bondage. Question, how is the person removed? Maharaj, by determination. Understand that it must go and wish it to go, it shall go if you are earnest about it. Somebody, anybody, will tell you that you are pure consciousness, not a body-mind. Accept it as a possibility and investigate earnestly. You may discover that it is not so, that you are not a person bound in space and time. Think of the difference it would make. Question, if I am not a person then what am I? Maharaj, wet cloth looks, feels, smells differently as long as it is wet. When dry it is again the normal cloth. Water has left it, and who can make out that it was wet? Your real nature is not like what you appear to be. Give up the idea of being a person, that is all. You need not become what you are anyhow. There is the identity of what you are, and there is the person superimposed on it. All you know is the person, the identity which is not a person, you do not know, for you never doubted, never asked yourself the crucial question, who am I? 
The identity is the witness of the person and sadhana consists in shifting the emphasis from the superficial and changeful person to the immutable and ever-present witness. Question, how is it that the question who am I attracts me little? I prefer to spend my time in the sweet company of saints. Maharaj, abiding in your own being is also holy company. If you have no problem of suffering and release from suffering, you will not find the energy and persistence needed for self-inquiry. You cannot manufacture a crisis. It must be genuine. Question, how does a genuine crisis happen? Maharaj, it happens every moment, but you are not alert enough. A shadow on your neighbor's face, the immense and all-pervading sorrow of existence is a constant factor in your life, but you refuse to take notice. You suffer and see others suffer, but you don't respond. Question, what you say is true, but what can I do about it? Such indeed is the situation. My helplessness and dullness are a part of it. Maharaj, good enough. Look at yourself steadily, it is enough. The door that locks you in is also the door that lets you out. Thy aim is the door. Stay at it until it opens. As a matter of fact, it is open only you are not at it. You are waiting at the non-existent painted doors which will never open. Question. Many of us were taking drugs at some time and to some extent. People told us to take drugs in order to break through into higher levels of consciousness. Others advised us to have abundant sex for the same purpose. What is your opinion in the matter? Maharaj, no doubt, a drug that can affect your brain can also affect your mind and give you all the strange experiences promised. But what are all the drugs compared to the drug that gave you this most unusual experience of being born and living in sorrow and fear, in search of happiness, which does not come, or does not last? You should inquire into the nature of this drug and find an antidote. Birth, life, death, they are one. Find out what had caused them. Before you were born, you were already drugged. What kind of drug was it? You may cure yourself of all diseases, but if you are still under the influence of the primordial drug, of what use are the superficial cures? Question. Is it not karma that causes rebirth? Maharaj, you may change the name but the fact remains. What is the drug which you call karma or destiny? It made you believe yourself to be what you are not. What is it and can you be free of it? Before you go further you must accept, at least as a working theory, that you are not what you appear to be, that you are under the influence of a drug. Then only will you have the urge and the patience to examine the symptoms and search for their common cause. All that a Kiru can tell you is, my dear sir, you are quite mistaken about yourself. You are not the person you think yourself to be. Trust nobody, not even yourself. Search find out. Remove and reject every assumption till you reach the living waters and the rock of truth. Until you are free of the drug, all your religions and sciences, prayers and yogas are of no use to you, for based on a mistake, they strengthen it. But if you stay with the idea that you are not the body nor the mind, not even their witness, but altogether beyond, your mind will grow in clarity, your desires in purity, your actions in charity and that inner distillation will take you to another world, a world of truth and fearless love. Resist your old habits of feeling and thinking, keep on telling yourself, no not so it cannot be so, I am not like this, I do not need it, I do not want it, and a day will surely come when the entire structure of error and despair will collapse and the ground will be free for a new life. After all, you must remember that all your preoccupations with yourself are only in your waking hours and partly in your dreams, in sleep all is put aside and forgotten. Shows how little important is your waking life, even to yourself, that merely lying down and closing the eyes can end it. Each time you go to sleep you do so without the least certainty of waking up, and yet you accept the risk. Question. When you sleep, are you conscious or unconscious? Maharaj, 
I remain conscious but not conscious of being a particular person. Question, can you give us the taste of the experience of self-realization? Maharaj, take the whole of it. It is here for the asking. But you do not ask. Even when you ask, you do not take. Find out what prevents you from taking. Question. I know what prevents my ego. Maharaj, then get busy with your ego, leave me alone. As long as you are locked up within your mind, my state is beyond your grasp. Question. I find I have no more questions to ask. Maharaj, were you really at war with your ego, you would have put many more questions. You are short of questions because you are not really interested. At present you are moved by the pleasure pain principle which is the ego. You are going along with the ego, you are not fighting it. You are not even aware how totally you are swayed by personal considerations. A man should always revolt against himself, for the ego, like a crooked mirror, narrows down and distorts. It is the worst of all the tyrants, it dominates you absolutely. Question. When there is no I, who is free? Maharaj, the world is free of a mighty nuisance. Good enough? Question. Good for whom? Maharaj, good for everybody. It is like a rope stretched across the street, it snarls up the traffic. Roll up it is there's mere identity useful when needed. Freedom from the ego self is the fruit of self-inquiry. Question. There was a time when I was most displeased with myself. Now, I have met my guru and I am at peace after having surrendered myself to him completely. Maharaj, if you watch your daily life, you will see that you have surrendered nothing. You have merely added the word surrender to your vocabulary and made your guru into a peg to hang your problems on. Real surrender means doing nothing, unless prompted by your guru. You step, so to say, aside and let your guru live your life. You merely watch and wonder how easily he solves the problems which to you seemed insoluble. Question, as I sit here I see the room the people. I see you too. How does it look at your end? What do you see? Maharaj, nothing. I look, but I do not see in the sense of creating images clothed with judgments. I do not describe nor evaluate. I look I see you, but neither attitude nor opinion cloud my vision. And when I turn my eyes away my mind does not allow memory to linger. It is at once free and fresh for the next impression. Question, as I am here looking at you I cannot locate the event in space and time. There is something eternal and universal about the transmission of wisdom that is taking place. Ten thousand years earlier or later make no difference, the event itself is timeless. Maharaj, man does not change much over the ages. Human problems remain the same and call for the same answers. You being conscious of what you call transmission of wisdom shows that wisdom has not yet been transmitted. When you have it, you are no longer conscious of it. What is really your own, you are not conscious of. What you are conscious of is neither you nor yours. Yours is the power of perception, not what you perceive. It is a mistake to take the conscious to be the whole of man. Man is the unconscious conscious and the superconscious, but you are not the man. Yours is the cinema screen, the light as well as the seeing power, but the picture is not you. Question, must I search for the guru or shall I stay with whomever I have found? Maharaj, the very question shows that you have not yet found one. As long as you have not realized, you will move from guru to guru, but when you have found yourself, the search will end. A guru is a milestone. When you are on the move, you pass so many milestones. When you have reached your destination, it is the last alone that mattered. In reality all mattered at their own time and none matters now. Question. You seem to give no importance to the guru. He is merely an incident among others. Maharaj, all incidents contribute but none is crucial. 
On the road each step helps you reach your destination, and each is as crucial as the other, for each step must be made, you cannot skip it. If you refuse to make it, you are stuck. Question. Everybody sings the glories of the Guru while you compare him to a milestone. Do we need a Guru? Maharaj, do we need a milestone? Yes and no. Yes, if we are uncertain, no if we know our way. Once we are certain in ourselves, the Guru is no longer needed, except in a technical sense. Your mind is an instrument after all, and you should know how to use it. As you are taught the uses of your body, so you should know how to use your mind. Question, what do I gain by learning to use my mind? Maharaj, you gain freedom from desire and fear, which are entirely due to wrong uses of the mind. Mere mental knowledge is not enough. The known is accidental, the unknown is the home of the real. To live in the known is bondage, to live in the unknown is liberation. Question. I have understood that all spiritual practice consists in the elimination of the personal self. Such practice demands iron determination and relentless application. Where to find the integrity and energy for such work? Maharaj, you find it in the company of the wise? Question. How do I know who is wise and who is merely clever? Maharaj, if your motives are pure, if you seek truth and nothing else, you will find the right people. Finding them is easy, what is difficult is to trust them and take full advantage of their advice and guidance. Question. Is the waking state more important for spiritual practice than sleep? Maharaj, on the whole, we attach too much importance to the waking state. Without sleep the waking state would be impossible. Without sleep one goes mad or dies. Why attach so much importance to waking consciousness which is obviously dependent on the unconscious? Not only the conscious, but the unconscious as well should be taken care of in our spiritual practice. Question, how does one attend to the unconscious? Maharaj, keep the I am in the focus of awareness, remember that you are watch yourself ceaselessly and the unconscious will flow into the conscious without any special effort on your part. Wrong desires and fears, false ideas, social inhibitions are blocking and preventing its free interplay with the conscious. Once free to mingle, the two become one, and the one becomes all. The person merges into the witness the witness into awareness, awareness into pure being, yet identity is not lost, only its limitations are lost. It is transfigured and becomes the real self, the sad guru, the eternal friend and guide. You cannot approach it in worship. No external activity can reach the inner self, worship and prayers remain on the surface only. To go deeper meditation is essential, the striving to go beyond the states of sleep, dream and waking. In the beginning the attempts are irregular, then they recur more often, become regular, then continuous and intense, until all obstacles are conquered. Question, obstacles to what? Maharaj, to self-forgetting. Question, if worship and prayers are ineffectual why do you worship daily with songs and music, the image of your guru? Maharaj, those who want it do it. I see no purpose in interfering. Question, but you take part in it. Maharaj, yes it appears so. But why be so concerned with me? Give all your attention to the question, what is it that makes me conscious? until your mind becomes the question itself and cannot think of anything else. Question, all and sundry are urging me to meditate. I find no zest in meditation, but I am interested in many other things, some I want very much and my mind goes to them, my attempts at meditation are so half-hearted. What am I to do? Maharaj, ask yourself, to whom it all happens? Use everything as an opportunity to go within. Light your way by burning up obstacles in the intensity of awareness. 
When you happen to desire or fear, it is not the desire or fear that are wrong and must go, but the person who desires and fears. There is no point in fighting desires and fears which may be perfectly natural and justified. It is the person who is swayed by them that is the cause of mistakes, past and future. The person should be carefully examined and its falseness seen, then its power over you will end. After all it subsides each time you go to sleep. In deep sleep you are not a self-conscious person, yet you are alive. When you are alive and conscious, but no longer self-conscious, you are not a person anymore. During the waking hours you are, as if on the stage playing a role, but what are you when the play is over? You are what you are, what you were before the play began you remain when it is over. Look at yourself as performing on the stage of life. The performance may be splendid or clumsy, but you are not in it, you merely watch it, with interest and sympathy of course, but keeping in mind all the time that you are only watching while the play life is going on. Question: You are always stressing the cognition aspect of reality. You hardly ever mention affection and will never. Maharaj, will affection bliss striving and enjoying are so deeply tainted with the personal that they cannot be trusted. The clarification and purification needed at the very start of the journey only awareness can give. Love and will shall have their turn, but the ground must be prepared. The sun of awareness must rise first, all else will follow. Chapter 87 Keep the mind silent and you shall discover. Questioner, once I had a strange experience. I was not nor was the world, there was only light within and without and immense peace. This lasted for four days and then I returned to the everyday consciousness. Now I have a feeling that all I know is merely a scaffolding, covering and hiding the building under construction. The architect, the design, the plans, the purpose, nothing I know. Some activity is going on, things are happening, that is all I can say. I am that scaffolding, something very flimsy and short-lived. When the building is ready, the scaffolding will be dismantled and removed. The I am and the what am I are of no importance, because once the building is ready, the I will go as a matter of course, leaving no questions about itself to answer. Maharaj, are you not aware of all this? Is not the fact of awareness the constant factor? Question, my sense of permanency and identity is due to memory, which is so evanescent and unreliable. How little I remember even of the recent past. I have lived a lifetime, and now what is left with me? A bundle of events, at best a short story. Maharaj, all this takes place within your consciousness. Question, within and without. In daytime within, in the night without. Consciousness is not all. So many things happen beyond its reach. To say that what I am not conscious of does not exist, is altogether wrong. Maharaj, what you say is logical, but actually you know only what is in your consciousness. What you claim exists outside conscious experience is inferred. Question, it may be inferred and yet, it is more real than the sensory. Maharaj, be careful. The moment you start talking you create a verbal universe, a universe of words, ideas, concepts and abstractions, interwoven and interdependent, most wonderfully generating, supporting and explaining each other, and yet all without essence or substance, mere creations of the mind. Words create words, reality is silent. Question, when you talk I hear you. Is it not a fact? Maharaj, that you hear is a fact. What you hear is not. That can be experienced, and in that sense the sound of the word and the mental ripples it causes are experienced. There is no other reality behind it. Its meaning is purely conventional, to be remembered, a language can be easily forgotten unless practiced. Question, if words have no reality in them why talk at all? Maharaj, 
they serve their limited purpose of interpersonal communication. Words do not convey facts, they signal them. Once you are beyond the person, you need no words. Question, what can take me beyond the person? How to go beyond consciousness? Maharaj, words and questions come from the mind and hold you there. To go beyond the mind, you must be silent and quiet. He sends silence, silence and peace, this is the way beyond. Stop asking questions. Question, once I give up asking questions what am I to do? Maharaj, what can you do but wait and watch? Question, what am I to wait for? Maharaj, for the center of your being to emerge into consciousness. The three states, sleeping, dreaming and waking are all in consciousness the manifested, what you call unconsciousness will also be manifested in time, beyond consciousness altogether lies the unmanifested. And beyond all and pervading all, is the heart of being which beats steadily, manifested unmanifested, manifested unmanifested saguna nirguna. Question. On the verbal level it sounds all right. I can visualize myself as the seat of being, a point in consciousness, with my sense I am pulsating, appearing and disappearing alternately. But what am I to do to realize it as a fact, to go beyond into the changeless, wordless reality? Maharaj, you can do nothing. The time has brought about, time will take away. Question, why then all these exhortations to practice yoga and seek reality? They make me feel empowered and responsible while in fact it is time that does all. Maharaj, this is the end of yoga to realize independence. All that happens, happens in and to the mind, not to the source of the I am. Once you realize that all happens by itself, call it destiny, or the will of God or mere accident, you remain as witness only understanding and enjoying, but not perturbed. Question. If I cease trusting words altogether, what will be my condition? Maharaj, there is a season for trusting and for distrusting. Let the seasons do their work, why worry? Question, somehow I feel responsible for what happens around me. Maharaj, you are responsible only for what you can change. All you can change is only your attitude. There lies your responsibility. Question, you are advising me to remain indifferent to the sorrows of others. Maharaj, it is not that you are indifferent. All the sufferings of mankind do not prevent you from enjoying your next meal. The witness is not indifferent. He is the fullness of understanding and compassion. Only as the witness you can help another. Question. All my life I was fed on words. The number of words I have heard and read go into the billions. Did it benefit me? Not at all. Maharaj, the mind shapes the language and the language shapes the mind. Both are tools, use them but don't misuse them. Words can bring you only into their own limit. To go beyond, you must abandon them. Remain as the silent witness only. Question, how can I? The world disturbs me greatly. Maharaj, it is because you think yourself big enough to be affected by the world. It is not so. You are so small that nothing can pin you down. It is your mind that gets caught, not you. Know yourself as you are, a mere point in consciousness, dimensionless and timeless. You are like the point of the pencil, by mere contact with you the mind draws its picture of the world. You are single and simple, the picture is complex and extensive. Don't be misled by the picture. Remain aware of the tiny point which is everywhere in the picture. What is can cease to be, what is not can come to be, but what neither is nor is not, but on which being and non-being depend, is unassailable. Know yourself to be the cause of desire and fear itself free from both. Question. How am I the cause of fear? Maharaj, all depends on you. It is by your consent that the world exists. Withdraw your belief in its reality, 
and it will dissolve like a dream. Time can bring down mountains, much more you, who are the timeless source of time. For without memory and expectation, there can be no time. Question. Is the I am the ultimate? Maharaj, before you can say, I am, you must be there to say it. You need not be self-conscious. You need not know to be, but you must be to know. Question, sir, I am getting drowned in a sea of words. I can see that all depends on how the words are out together, but there must be somebody to put them together, meaningfully. By drawing words at random the Ramayana, Mahabharata and Bhagavata could never be produced. The theory of accidental emergence is not tenable. The origin of the meaningful must be beyond it. What is the power that creates order out of chaos? Living is more than being, and consciousness is more than living. Who is the conscious living being? Maharaj, your question contains the answer. A conscious living being is a conscious living being. The words are most appropriate, but you do not grasp their full import. Go deep into the meaning of the words, being living conscious, and you will stop running in circles, asking questions but missing answers. Do understand that you cannot ask a valid question about yourself, because you do not know whom you are asking about. In the question who am I? The I is not known and the question can be worded as, I do not know what I mean by, I what you are, you must find out. I can only tell you what you are not. You are not of the world, you are not even in the world. The world is not, you alone are. You create the world in your imagination like a dream. As you cannot separate the dream from yourself, so you cannot have an outer world independent of yourself. You are independent, not the world. Don't be afraid of a world you yourself have created. Cease from looking for happiness and reality in a dream and you will wake up. You need not know why and how, there is no end to questions. Abandon all desires, keep your mind silent, and you shall discover. Chapter 88 Knowledge by the mind is not true knowledge. Questioner do you experience the three states of waking, dreaming and sleeping just as we do or otherwise? Maharaj, all the three states are sleep to me. My waking state is beyond them. As I look at you, you all seem asleep, dreaming up words of your own. I'm aware for I imagine nothing. It is not samadhi which is but a kind of sleep. It is just a state unaffected by the mind, free from the past and future. In your case, it is distorted by desire and fear, by memories and hopes. In mine it is as it is, normal. To be a person is to be asleep. Question. Between the body and pure awareness stands the inner organ antakarana, the subtle body, the mental body, whatever the name. Just as a whirling mirror converts sunlight into a manifold pattern of streaks and colors, so does the subtle body convert the simple light of the shining self into a diversified world. Thus I have understood your teaching. What I cannot grasp is how did the subtle body arise in the first instance. Maharaj, it is created with the emergence of the I am idea. The two are one. Question, how did the I am appear? Maharaj, in your world everything must have a beginning and an end. If it does not, you call it eternal. In my view, there is no such thing as beginning or end, these are all related to time. Timeless being is entirely in the now. Question. The antakarana, or the subtle body, is it real or unreal? Maharaj, it is momentary. Real when present, unreal when over. Question. What kind of reality? Is it momentary? Maharaj, call it empirical, or actual, or factual. It is the reality of immediate experience here and now, which cannot be denied. You can question the description and the meaning, but not the event itself. Being and non-being alternate, and the reality is momentary. 
The immutable reality lies beyond space and time. Realize the momentariness of being and non-being and be free from both. Question. Things may be transient, yet they are very much with us, in endless repetition. Maharaj, desires are strong. It is desire that causes repetition. There is no recurrence where desire is not. Question. What about fear? Maharaj, desire is of the past, fear is of the future. The memory of past suffering and the fear of its recurrence make one anxious about the future. Question. There is also fear of the unknown. Maharaj, who has not suffered is not afraid. Question. We are condemned to fear. Maharaj, until we can look at fear and accept it as the shadow of personal existence, as persons we are bound to be afraid. Abandon all personal equations and you shall be free from fear. It is not difficult. Desirelessness comes on its own when desire is recognized as false. You need not struggle with desire. Ultimately, it is an urge to happiness, which is natural as long as there is sorrow. Only see that there is no happiness in what you desire. Question, we settle for pleasure. Maharaj, each pleasure is wrapped in pain. You soon discover that you cannot have one without the other. Question, there is the experiencer and there is his experience. What created the link between the two? Maharaj, nothing created it. It is. The two are one. Question, I feel there is a catch somewhere, but I do not know where. Maharaj, the catch is in your mind which insists on seeing duality where there is none. Question, as I listen to you my mind is all in the now and I am astonished to find myself without questions. Maharaj, you can know reality only when you are astonished. Question. I can make out that the cause of anxiety and fear is memory. What are the means for putting an end to memory? Maharaj, don't talk of means, there are no means. What you see as false dissolves. It is the very nature of illusion to dissolve on investigation. Investigate, that is all. You cannot destroy the false, for you are creating it all the time. Withdraw from it, ignore it, go beyond, and it will cease to be. Question. Christ also speaks of ignoring evil and being childlike. Maharaj, reality is common to all. Only the false is personal. Question. As I watch the Sadhakas and inquire into the theories by which they live, I find they have merely replaced material cravings by spiritual ambitions. From what you tell us it looks as if the words, spiritual and ambition are incompatible. If spirituality implies freedom from ambition, what will urge the seeker on? The yogis speak of the desire for liberation as essential. Is it not the highest form of ambition? Maharaj, ambition is personal, liberation is from the personal. In liberation both the subject and the object of ambition are no longer. Earnestness is not a yearning for the fruits of one's endeavors. It is an expression of an inner shift of interest away from the false, unessential, the personal. Question. You told us the other day that we cannot even dream of perfection before realization, for the self is the source of all perfection and not the mind. If it is not excellence in virtue that is essential for liberation, then what is? Maharaj, liberation is not the result of some means skillfully applied, nor of circumstances. It is beyond the causal process. Nothing can compel it, nothing can prevent it. Question, then why are we not free here and now? Maharaj, but we are free here and now. It is only the mind that imagines bondage. Question. What will put an end to imagination? Maharaj, why should you want to put an end to it? Once you know your mind and its miraculous powers, and remove what poisoned it, the idea of a separate and isolated person, 
you just leave it alone to do its work among things to which it is well suited. To keep the mind in its own place and on its own work is the liberation of the mind. Question, what is the work of the mind? Maharaj, the mind is the wife of the heart and the world their home to be kept bright and happy. Question, I have not yet understood why, if nothing stands in the way of liberation, it does not happen here and now. Maharaj, nothing stands in the way of your liberation and it can happen here and now, but for your being more interested in other things. And you cannot fight with your interests. You must go with them, see through them and watch them reveal themselves as mere errors of judgment and appreciation. Question. Will it not help me if I go and stay with some great and holy man? Maharaj, great and holy people are always within your reach, but you do not recognize them. How will you know who is great and holy? By hearsay. Can you trust others in these matters, or even yourself? To convince you beyond the shadow of doubt, you need more than a commendation, more even than a momentary rapture. You may come across a great and holy man or women and not even know for a long time your good fortune. The infant son of a great man for many years will not know the greatness of his father. You must mature to recognize greatness and purify your heart for holiness. Or you will spend your time and money in vain and also miss what life offers you. There are good people among your friends you can learn much from them. Running after saints is merely another game to play. Remember yourself instead and watch your daily life relentlessly. Be earnest and you shall not fail to break the bonds of inattention and imagination. Question, do you want me to struggle all alone? Maharaj, you are never alone. There are powers and presences who serve you all the time most faithfully. You may or may not perceive them, nevertheless they are real and active. When you realize that all is in your mind and that you are beyond the mind, that you are truly alone, then all is you. Question, what is omniscience? Is God omniscient? Are you omniscient? We hear the expression universal witness. What does it mean? Does self-realization imply omniscience? Or is it a matter of specialized training? Maharaj, to lose entirely all interest in knowledge results in omniscience. It is but the gift of knowing what needs to be known at the right moment for error-free action. After all knowledge is needed for action and if you act rightly, spontaneously, without bringing in the conscious, so much the better. Question. Can one know the mind of another person? Maharaj, know you own mind first. It contains the entire universe and with space to spare. Question, your working theory seems to be that the waking state is not basically different from dream and the dreamless sleep. The three states are essentially a case of mistaken self-identification with the body. Maybe it is true but I feel it is not the whole truth. Maharaj, do not try to know the truth, for knowledge by the mind is not true knowledge. But you can know what is not true which is enough to liberate you from the false. The idea that you know what is true is dangerous, for it keeps you imprisoned in the mind. It is when you do not know, that you are free to investigate. And there can be no salvation, without investigation, because non-investigation is the main cause of bondage. Question. You say that the illusion of the world begins with the sense I am, but when I ask about the origin of the sense I am, you answer that it has no origin, for on investigation it dissolves. What is solid enough to build the world on cannot be mere illusion. The I am is the only changeless factor I am conscious of, how can it be false? Maharaj, it is not the I am that is false, but what you take yourself to be. I can see beyond the least shadow of doubt that you are not what you believe yourself to be. Logic or no logic, you cannot deny the obvious. You are nothing that you are conscious of. Apply yourself diligently to pulling apart the structure you have built in your mind. What the mind has done the mind must undo. Question, 
you cannot deny the present moment mind or no mind. What is now, is. You may question the appearance, but not the fact. What is at the root of the fact? Maharaj, the I am is at the root of all appearance and the permanent link in the succession of events that we call life, but I am beyond the I am. Question. I have found that the realized people usually describe their state in terms borrowed from their religion. You happen to be a Hindu, so you talk of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, and use Hindu approaches and imagery. Kindly tell us, what is the experience behind your words? What reality do they refer to? Maharaj, it is my way of talking, a language I was taught to use. Question, but what is behind the language? Maharaj, how can I put it into words except in negating them? Therefore, I use words like timeless, spaceless, causeless. These two are words, but as they are empty of meaning, they suit my purpose. Question, if they are meaningless, why use them? Maharaj, because you want words where no words apply. Question, I can see your point. Again, you have robbed me of my question. Chapter 89, Progress in Spiritual Life Questioner, we are two girls from England visiting India. We know little about yoga, and we are here because we were told that spiritual teachers play an important role in Indian life. Maharaj, you are welcome. There is nothing new you will find here. The work we are doing is timeless. It was the same 10,000 years ago. Centuries roll on, but the human problem does not change, the problem of suffering and the ending of suffering. Question. The other day seven young foreigners have turned up asking for a place to sleep for a few nights. They came to see their guru who was lecturing in Bombay. I met him, a very pleasant looking young man is he, apparently very matter of fact and efficient, but with an atmosphere of peace and silence about him. His teaching is traditional with stress on karma yoga, selfless work, service of the guru etc. Like the Gita, he says that selfless work will result in salvation. He is full of ambitious plans, training workers who will start spiritual centers in many countries. It seems he gives them not only the authority but also the power to do the work in his name. Maharaj, yes there is such a thing as transmission of power. Question, when I was with them, I had a strange feeling of becoming invisible. The devotees in their surrender to their guru surrendered me also. Whatever I did for them was their guru's doing, and I was not considered, except as a mere instrument. I was merely a tap to turn left or right. There was no personal relationship whatsoever. They tried a little to convert me to their faith, as soon as they felt resistance, they just dropped me from the field of their attention. Even between themselves they did not appear very much related, it is their common interest in their guru that kept them together. I found it rather cold, almost inhuman. To consider oneself an instrument in God's hands is one thing to be denied all attention and consideration because all is God may lead to indifference verging on cruelty. After all, all wars are made in the name of God. The entire history of mankind is a succession of holy wars. One is never so impersonal as in war. Maharaj, to insist, to resist, are contained in the will to be. Remove the will to be and what remains. Existence and non-existence relate to something in space and time, here and now, there and then, which again are in the mind. The mind plays a guessing game, it is ever uncertain, anxiety ridden and restless. You resent being treated as a mere instrument of some god or guru, and insist on being treated as a person because you are not sure of your own existence and do not want to give up the comfort and assurance of a personality. You may not be what you believe yourself to be, but it gives you continuity, your future flows into the present and becomes the past without jolts. To be denied personal existence is frightening, 
but you must face it and find your identity with the totality of life. Then the problem of who is used by whom is no more. Question, all the attention I got was an attempt to convert me to their faith. When I resisted they lost all interest in me. Maharaj, one does not become a disciple by conversion or by accident. There is usually an ancient link, maintained through many lives and flowering as love and trust, without which there is no discipleship. Question, what made you decide to become a teacher? Maharaj, I was made into one by being called so. Who am I to teach and whom? What I am, you are, and what you are, I am. The I am is common to us all. Beyond the I am there is the immensity of light and love. We do not see it because we look elsewhere, I can only point at the sky, seeing of the star is your own work. Some take more time before they see the star, some take less, it depends on the clarity of their vision and their earnestness in search. These two must be their own I can only encourage. Question, what am I expected to do when I become a disciple? Maharaj each teacher has his own method, usually patterned on his guru's teachings and on the way he himself has realized, and his own terminology as well. Within that framework adjustments to the personality of the disciple are made. The disciple is given full freedom of thought and inquiry and encouraged to question to his heart's content. He must be absolutely certain of the standing and competence of his guru, otherwise his faith, will not be absolute, nor his action complete. Is the absolute in you that takes you to the absolute beyond you, absolute truth, love selflessness are the decisive factors in self-realization. With earnestness these can be reached. Question, I understand one must give up one's family and possessions to become a disciple. Maharaj, it varies with the guru. Some expect their mature disciples to become ascetics and recluses, some encourage family life and duties. Most of them consider a model family life more difficult than renunciation, suitable for a personality more mature and better balanced. At the early stages the discipline of monastic life may be advisable. Therefore, in the Hindu culture students up to the age of 25 are expected to live like monks, in poverty, chastity and obedience, to give them a chance to build a character able to meet the hardships and temptations of married life. Question, who are the people in this room? Are they your disciples? Maharaj, ask them. It is not on the verbal level that one becomes a disciple, but in the silent depths of one's being. You do not become a disciple by choice, it is more a matter of destiny than self-will. It does not matter much who is the teacher, they all wish you well. It is the disciple that matters, his honesty and earnestness. The right disciple will always find the right teacher. Question, I can see the beauty and feel the blessedness of a life devoted to search for truth under a competent and loving teacher. Unfortunately, we have to return to England. Maharaj, distance does not matter. If your desires are strong and true, they will mold your life for their fulfillment. Though you seed and leave it to the seasons. Question, what are the signs of progress in spiritual life? Maharaj, freedom from anxiety, a sense of ease and joy, deep peace within and abundant energy without. Question, how did you get it? Maharaj, I found it all in the holy presence of my guru, I did nothing on my own. He told me to be quiet, and I did it as much as I could. Question, is your presence as powerful as his? Maharaj, how am I to know? For me, his is the only presence. If you are with me, you are with him. Question, each guru will refer me to his own guru. Where is the starting point? Maharaj, there is a power in the universe working for enlightenment and liberation. We call it Sadashiva, who is ever present in the hearts of men. It is the unifying factor. Unity liberates. Freedom unites. 
Ultimately, nothing is mine or yours, everything is ours. Just be one with yourself and you will be one with all, at home in the entire universe. Question, you mean to say that all these glories will come with the mere dwelling on the feeling I am? Maharaj, it is the simple that is certain not the complicated. Somehow people do not trust the simple, the easy, the always available. Why not give an honest trial to what I say? It may look very small and insignificant, but it is like a seed that grows into a mighty tree. Give yourself a chance. Question. I see so many people sitting here quietly. What for have they come? Maharaj, to meet themselves. At home the world is too much with them. Here nothing disturbs them. They have a chance to take leave of their daily worries and contact the essential in themselves. Question, what is the course of training in self-awareness? Maharaj, there is no need of training. Awareness is always with you. The same attention that you give to the outer, you turn to the inner. No new or special kind of awareness is needed. Question, do you help people personally? Maharaj, people come to discuss their problems. Apparently they derive some help or they would not come. Question, are the talks with people always in public or will you talk to them privately also? Maharaj, it is according to their wish. Personally, I make no distinction between public and private. Question, are you always available or have you other work to do? Maharaj, I am always available, but the hours in the morning and late afternoon are the most convenient. Question, I understand that no work ranks higher than the work of a spiritual teacher. Maharaj, the motive matters supremely. Chapter 90, Surrender to Your Own Self Questioner, I was born in the United States and the last 14 months I have spent in Sri Ramanashram. Now I am on my way back to the States where my mother is expecting me. Maharaj, what are your plans? Question, I may qualify as a nurse or just marry and have babies. Maharaj, what makes you want to marry? Question, providing a spiritual home is the highest form of social service I can think of. But of course life may shape otherwise. I am ready for whatever comes. Maharaj, these fourteen months at Sri Ramanashram, what did they give you? In what way are you different from what you were when you arrived there? Question, I am no longer afraid. I have found some peace. Maharaj, what kind of peace is it? The peace of having what you want or not wanting what you do not have? Question, a little of both, I believe. It was not easy at all. While the ashram is a very peaceful place, inwardly I was in agonies. Maharaj, when you realize that the distinction between inner and outer is in the mind only, you are no longer afraid. Question, such realization comes and goes with me. I have not yet reached the immutability of absolute completeness. Maharaj, well as long as you believe so. You must go on with your sadhana, to disperse the false idea of not being complete sadhana removes the superimpositions. When you realize yourself as less than a point in space and time, something too small to be cut and too short-lived to be killed then, and then only, all fear goes. When you are smaller than the point of a needle, then the needle cannot pierce you, you pierce the needle. Question. Yes, that is how I feel sometimes indomitable. I am more than fearless, I am fearlessness itself. Maharaj, what made you go to the ashram? Question, I had an unhappy love affair and suffered hell. Neither drink nor drugs could help me. I was groping and came across some books on yoga. From book to book, from clue to clue, I came to Raman Ashram. Maharaj, were the same tragedy to happen to you again, would you suffer as much considering your present state of mind? Question. Oh no, I would not let myself suffer again. I would kill myself. Maharaj, so you are not afraid to die? Question. I am afraid of dying, 
not of death itself. I imagine the dying process to be painful and ugly. Maharaj, how do you know? It need not be so. It may be beautiful and peaceful. Once you know that death happens to the body and not to you, you just watch your body falling off like a discarded garment. Question. I am fully aware that my fear of death is due to apprehension and not knowledge. Maharaj, human beings die every second, the fear and the agony of dying hangs over the world like a cloud. No wonder you too are afraid. But once you know that the body alone dies, and not the continuity of memory, and the sense of I am reflected in it, you are afraid no longer. Question, well let us die and see. Maharaj, give attention and you will find that birth and death are one, that life pulsates between being and non-being, and that each needs the other for completeness. You are born to die and you die to be reborn. Question, does not detachment stop the process? Maharaj, with detachment the fear goes but not the fact. Question, shall I be compelled to be reborn? How dreadful! Maharaj, there is no compulsion. You get what you want. You make your own plans and you carry them out. Question, do we condemn ourselves to suffer? Maharaj, we grow through investigation and to investigate we need experience. We tend to repeat what we have not understood. We are sensitive and intelligent, we need not suffer. Pain is a call for attention and the penalty of carelessness. Intelligent and compassionate action is the only remedy. Question, it is because I have grown in intelligence that I would not tolerate my suffering again. What is wrong with suicide? Maharaj, nothing wrong if it solves the problem. What if it does not? Suffering caused by extraneous factors, some painful and incurable disease, or unbearable calamity, may provide some justification, but where wisdom and compassion are lacking, suicide cannot help. A foolish death means foolishness reborn. Besides there is the question of karma to consider. Endurance is usually the wisest course. Question, must one endure suffering however acute and hopeless? Maharaj, endurance is one thing and helpless agony is another. Endurance is meaningful and fruitful, while agony is useless. Question, why worry about karma? It takes care of itself anyhow. Maharaj, most of our karma is collective. We suffer for the sins of others, as others suffer for ours. Humanity is one. Ignorance of this fact does not change it. We could have been much happier people ourselves, but for our indifference to the sufferings of others. Question. I find I have grown much more responsive. Maharaj, good. When you say it, what do you have in mind? Yourself as a responsive person within a female body? Question. There is a body and there is compassion and there is memory and a number of things and attitudes. Collectively they may be called a person. Maharaj, including the I am idea? Question. The I am is like a basket that holds the many things that make a person. Maharaj, or rather, it is the willow of which the basket is woven. When you think of yourself as a woman, do you mean that you are a woman, or that your body is described as female? Question. It depends on my mood. Sometimes I feel myself to be a mere center of awareness. Maharaj, or an ocean of awareness. But are there moments when you are neither men nor women, not the accidental occasioned by circumstances and conditions? Question. Yes there are but I feel shy to talk about it. Maharaj, a hint is all that one can expect. You need not say more. Question. Am I allowed to smoke in your presence? I know that it is not the custom to smoke before a sage and more so for a woman. Maharaj, by all means smoke, nobody will mind. We understand. Question. I feel the need of cooling down. 
Maharaj, it is very often so with Americans and Europeans. After a stretch of sadhana, they become charged with energy and frantically seek an outlet. They organize communities, become teachers of yoga, marry, write books, anything except keeping quiet and turning their energies within to find the source of the inexhaustible power and learn the art of keeping it under control. Question. I admit that now I want to go back and live a very active life because I feel full of energy. Maharaj, you can do what you like as long as you do not take yourself to be the body and the mind. It is not so much a question of actual giving up the body and all that goes with it as a clear understanding that you are not the body. A sense of aloofness, of emotional non-involvement. Question, I know what you mean. Some four years ago I passed through a period of rejection of the physical, I would not buy myself clothes, would eat the simplest foods, sleep on bare planks. It is the acceptance of the privations that matters, not the actual discomfort. Now I've realized that welcoming life as it comes and loving all it offers is best of it. I shall accept with glad heart whatever comes and make the best of it. If I can do nothing more than give life and true culture to a few children good enough, though my heart goes out to every child, I cannot reach all. Maharaj, you are married and a mother only when you are men-women conscious. When you do not take yourself to be the body, then the family life of the body, however intense and interesting, is seen only as a play on the screen of the mind, with the light of awareness as the only reality. Question, why do you insist on awareness as the only real? Is not the object of awareness as real, while it lasts? Maharaj, but it does not last. Momentary reality is secondary, it depends on the timeless. Question, do you mean continuous or permanent? Maharaj, there can be no continuity in existence. Continuity implies identity in past, present and future. No such identity is possible, for the very means of identification fluctuate and change. Continuity, permanency, these are illusions created by memory, mere mental projections of a pattern where no pattern can be, abandon all ideas of temporary or permanent body or mind, man or women. What remains? What is the state of your mind when all separation is given up? I'm not talking of giving up distinctions, for without them there is no manifestation. Question, when I do not separate I am happily at peace. But somehow, I lose my bearings again and again and begin to seek happiness in outer things. Why is my inner peace not steady, I cannot understand. Maharaj, peace after all is also a condition of the mind. Question, beyond the mind is silence. There is nothing to be said about it. Maharaj, yes all talk about silence is mere noise. Question, why do we seek worldly happiness, even after having tasted one's own natural spontaneous happiness? Maharaj, when the mind is engaged in serving the body happiness is lost. To regain it it seeks pleasure. The urge to be happy is right, but the means of securing it are misleading, unreliable and destructive of true happiness. Question, is pleasure always wrong? Maharaj, the right state and use of the body and the mind are intensely pleasant. It is the search for pleasure that is wrong. Do not try to make yourself happy, rather question your very search for happiness. It is because you are not happy that you want to be happy. Find out why you are unhappy. Because you are not happy you seek happiness and pleasure, pleasure brings in pain, and therefore you call it worldly, you then long for some other pleasure, without pain, which you call divine. In reality pleasure is but a respite from pain. Happiness is both worldly and unworldly, within and beyond all that happens. Make no distinction, don't separate the inseparable, and do not alienate yourself from life. Question, how well I understand you now. 
For my stay at Ramanashram, I was tyrannized by conscience, always sitting in judgment of myself. Now I am completely relaxed, fully accepting myself as I am. When I return to the States, I shall take life as it comes, as Bhagavan's grace, and enjoy the bitter along with the sweet. This is one of the things I have learnt in the ashram, to trust Bhagavan. I was not like this before. I could not trust. Maharaj, trusting Bhagavan is trusting yourself. Be aware that whatever happens, happens to you by you through you, that you are the creator, enjoyer and destroyer of all you perceive and you will not be afraid. Unafraid, you will not be unhappy, nor will you seek happiness. In the mirror of your mind, all kinds of pictures appear and disappear. Knowing that they are entirely your own creations, watch them silently come and go, be alert, but not perturbed. This attitude of silent observation is the very foundation of yoga. You see the picture, but you are not the picture. Question, I find that the thought of death frightens me because I do not want to be reborn. I know that none compels, yet the pressure of unsatisfied desires is overwhelming and I may not be able to resist. Maharaj, the question of resistance does not arise. What is born and reborn is not you. Let it happen, watch it happen. Question, why then be at all concerned? Maharaj, but you are concerned. And you will be concerned as long as the picture clashes with your own sense of truth, love and beauty. The desire for harmony and peace is ineradicable. But once it is fulfilled, the concern ceases and physical life becomes effortless and below the level of attention. Then, even in the body you are not born. To be embodied or bodiless is the same to you. You reach a point when nothing can happen to you. Without body you cannot be killed, without possessions you cannot be robbed, without mind you cannot be deceived. There is no point where a desire or fear can hook on. As long as no change can happen to you, what else matters? Question. Somehow I do not like the idea of dying. Maharaj, it is because you are so young. The more you know yourself the less you are afraid. Of course the agony of dying is never pleasant to look at, but the dying man is rarely conscious. Question, does he return to consciousness? Maharaj, it is very much like sleep. For a time the person is out of focus and then it returns. Question, the same person. Maharaj, the person being a creature of circumstances, necessarily changes along with them, like the flame that changes with the fuel. Only the process goes on and on, creating time and space. Question, well God will look after me. I can leave everything to him. Maharaj, even faith in God is only a stage on the way. Ultimately you abandon all, for you come to something so simple that there are no words to express it. Question, I am just beginning. At the start I had no faith, no trust, I was afraid to let things happen. The world seemed to be a very dangerous and inimical place. Now, at least I can talk of trusting the Guru or God. Let me grow. Don't drive me on. Let me proceed at my own pace. Maharaj, by all means proceed. But you don't. You are still stuck in the ideas of man and women old and young life and death. Go on, go beyond. A thing recognized is a thing transcended. Question, sir, wherever I go people take it to be their duty to find faults with me and goad me on. I am fed up with the spiritual fortune making. What is wrong with my present, that it should be sacrificed to a future however glorious? You say reality is in the now. I want it. I do not want to be eternally anxious about my stature and its future. I do not want to chase the more and the better. Let me love what I have. Maharaj, you are quite right, do it. Only be honest, just love what you love, don't strive and strain. Question, this is what I call surrender to the Guru. 
Maharaj, why exteriorize? Surrender to your own self, of which everything is an expression. Chapter 91, Pleasure and Happiness Questioner, a friend of mine, a young man about twenty-five, was told that he is suffering from an incurable heart disease. He wrote to me that instead of slow death, he preferred suicide. I replied to him that a disease incurable by Western medicine may be cured in some other way. There are yogic powers that can bring almost instantaneous changes in the human body. Effects of repeated fasting also verge on the miraculous. I wrote to him not to be in a hurry to die, rather to give a trial to other approaches. There is a yogi living not far from Bombay who possesses some miraculous powers. He is specialized in the control of the vital forces governing the body. I met some of his disciples and sent through to the yogi my friend's letter and photo. Let us see what happens. Maharaj, yes miracles often take place. But there must be the will to live. Without it the miracles will not happen. Question, can such a desire be instilled? Maharaj, superficial desire, yes. But it will wear out. Fundamentally, nobody can compel another to live. Besides, there were cultures in which suicide had its acknowledged and respected place. Question. Is it not obligatory to live out one's natural span of life? Maharaj, natural, spontaneously, easy, yes. But disease and suffering are not natural. There is noble virtue in unshakable endurance of whatever comes, but there is also dignity in the refusal of meaningless torture and humiliation. Question. I was given a book written by a Siddha. He describes in it many of his strange, even amazing experiences. According to him the way of a true Sadhaka ends with his meeting his Guru and surrendering to him body, mind and heart. Henceforth the Guru takes over and becomes responsible for even the least event in the disciple's life until the two become one. One may call it realization through identification. The disciple is taken over by a power he cannot control nor resist and feels as helpless as a leaf in the storm. The only thing that keeps him safe from madness and death is his faith in the love and power of his Guru. Maharaj, every teacher teaches according to his own experience. Experience is shaped by belief and belief is shaped by experience. Even the Guru is shaped by the disciple to his own image. It is the disciple that makes the Guru great. Once the Guru is seen to be the agent of a liberating power which works both from within and without, wholehearted surrender becomes natural and easy. Just as a man gripped by pain puts himself completely in the hands of a surgeon, so does the disciple entrust himself without reservation to his guru. It is quite natural to seek help when its need is felt acutely. But however powerful the guru may be, he should not impose his will on the disciple. On the other hand, a disciple that distrusts and hesitates is bound to remain unfulfilled for no fault of his guru. Question, what happens then? Maharaj, life teaches where all else fails. But the lessons of life take a long time to come. Much delay and trouble is saved by trusting and obeying. But such trust comes only when indifference and restlessness give place to clarity and peace. A man who keeps himself in low esteem will not be able to trust himself nor anybody else. Therefore, in the beginning the teacher tries his best to reassure the disciple as to his high origin, noble nature and glorious destiny. He relates to him the experiences of some saints as well as his own, instilling confidence in himself and in his infinite possibilities. When self-confidence and trust in the teacher come together, rapid and far-going changes in the disciple's character and life can take place. Question. I may not want to change. My life is good enough as it is. Maharaj, you say so because you have not seen how painful is the life you live. 
You are like a child sleeping with a lollipop in its mouth. You may feel happy for a moment by being totally self-centered, but it is enough to have a good look at human faces to perceive the universality of suffering. Even your own happiness is so vulnerable and short-lived, at the mercy of a bank crash or a stomach ulcer. It is just a moment of respite, a mere gap between two sorrows. Real happiness is not vulnerable because it does not depend on circumstances. Question. Are you talking from your own experience? Are you too unhappy? Maharaj, I have no personal problems. But the world is full of living beings whose lives are squeezed between fear and craving. They are like cattle driven to the slaughterhouse, jumping and frisking, carefree and happy, yet dead and skinned within an hour. You say you are happy. Are you really happy or are you merely trying to convince yourself? Look at yourself fearlessly and you will at once realize that your happiness depends on conditions and circumstances hence it is momentary not real real happiness flows from within question of what use is your happiness to me it does not make me happy maharaj you can have the whole of it and more for the mere asking but you do not ask you don't seem to want question why do you say so? I do want to be happy. Maharaj, you are quite satisfied with pleasures. There is no place for happiness. Empty your cup and clean it. It cannot be filled otherwise. Others can give you pleasure but never happiness. Question, a chain of pleasurable events is good enough. Maharaj, soon it ends in pain if not in disaster. What is yoga after all, but seeking lasting happiness within? Question. You can speak only for the East. In the West the conditions are different and what you say does not apply. Maharaj, there is no East and West in sorrow and fear. The problem is universal, suffering and the ending of suffering. Cause of suffering is dependence and independence is the remedy. Yoga is the science and the art of self-liberation through self-understanding. Question. I do not think I am fit for yoga. Maharaj, what else are you fit for? All your going and coming, seeking pleasure, loving and hating, all this shows that you struggle against limitations, self-imposed or accepted. In your ignorance you make mistakes and cause pain to yourself and others, but the urge is there and shall not be denied. The same urge that seeks birth, happiness and death shall seek understanding and liberation. It is like a spark of fire in a cargo of cotton. You may not know about it, but sooner or later the ship will burst in flames. Liberation is a natural process and in the long run inevitable. But it is within your power to bring it into the now. Question. Then why are so few liberated people in the world? Maharaj, in a forest only some of the trees are in full bloom at a given moment, yet everyone will have its turn. Sooner or later your physical and mental resources will come to an end. What will you do then? Despair? All right, despair. You will get tired of despairing and begin to question. At that moment you will be fit for conscious yoga. Question. I find all this seeking and brooding most unnatural. Maharaj, yours is the naturalness of a born cripple. You may be unaware, but it does not make you normal. What it means to be natural or normal you do not know nor do you know that you do not know. At present you are drifting and therefore in danger, for to a drifter any moment anything may happen. It would be better to wake up and see your situation. That you are you know. What you are you don't know. Find out what you are. Question. Why is there so much suffering in the world? Maharaj. Selfishness is the cause of suffering. There is no other cause. Question. I understood that suffering is inherent in limitation. Maharaj. Differences and distinctions are not the causes of sorrow. Unity and diversity is natural and good. 
It is only with separateness and self-seeking that real suffering appears in the world. Chapter 92 Go Beyond the I Am the Body Idea Questioner, we are like animals, running about in vain pursuits and there seems to be no end to it. Is there a way out? Maharaj, many ways will be offered to you which will but take you round and bring you back to your starting point. First realize that your problem exists in your waking state only, that however painful it is, you are able to forget it altogether when you go to sleep. When you are awake you are conscious, when you are asleep you are only alive. Consciousness and life both you may call God, but you are beyond both, beyond God, beyond being and not being. What prevents you from knowing yourself as all and beyond all is the mind based on memory. His power over you as long as you trust it, don't struggle with it, just disregard it. Deprived of attention, it will slow down and reveal the mechanism of its working. Once you know its nature and purpose, you will not allow it to create imaginary problems. Question, surely, not all problems are imaginary. There are real problems. Maharaj, what problems can there be which the mind did not create? Life and death do not create problems, pains and pleasures come and go experienced and forgotten. Is memory and anticipation that create problems of attainment or avoidance, colored by like and dislike? Truth and love are man's real nature and mind and heart are the means of its expression. Question, how to bring the mind under control? And the heart which does not know what it wants? Maharaj, they cannot work in darkness. They need the light of pure awareness to function rightly. All effort at control will merely subject them to the dictates of memory. Memory is a good servant but a bad master. It effectively prevents discovery. There is no place for effort in reality. It is selfishness due to a self-identification with the body that is the main problem and the cause of all other problems. And selfishness cannot be removed by effort, only by clear insight into its causes and effects. Effort is a sign of conflict between incompatible desires. They should be seen as they are, then only they dissolve. Question, and what remains? Maharaj, that which cannot change remains. The great peace, the deep silence, the hidden beauty of reality remain. While it cannot be conveyed through words, it is waiting for you to experience for yourself. Question, must not one be fit and eligible for realization? Our nature is animal to the core. Unless it is conquered, how can we hope for reality to dawn? Maharaj, leave the animal alone. Let it be. Just remember what you are. Use every incident of the day to remind you that without you as the witness there would be neither animal nor God. Understand that you are both, the essence and the substance of all their I, and remain firm in your understanding. Question, is understanding enough? Don't I need more tangible proofs? Maharaj, it is your understanding that will decide about the validity of proofs. But what more tangible proof do you need than your own existence? Wherever you go you find yourself. However far you reach out in time, you are there. Question. Obviously, I am not all-pervading and eternal. I am only here and now. Maharaj, good enough. Here is everywhere and the now always. Go beyond the I am the body idea and you will find that space and time are in you and not you in space and time. Once you have understood this, the main obstacle to realization is removed. Question, what is the realization which is beyond understanding? Maharaj, imagine a dense forest full of tigers and you in a strong steel cage. Knowing that you are well protected by the cage, you watch the tigers fearlessly. Next you find the tigers in the cage and yourself roaming about in the jungle. Last, the cage disappears and you ride the tigers. Question, 
I attended one of the group meditation sessions held recently in Bombay and witnessed the frenzy and self-abandon of the participants. Why do people go for such things? Maharaj, these are all inventions of a restless mind pampering to people in search of sensations. Some of them help the unconscious to disgorge suppressed memories and longings, and to that extent they provide relief. But ultimately they liveth practitioner where he was or worse. Question, I have read recently a book by a yogi on his experiences in meditation. It is full of visions and sounds, colors and melodies, quite a display and a most gorgeous entertainment. In the end they all faded out and only the feeling of utter fearlessness remained. No wonder, a man who passed through all these experiences unscathed need not be afraid of anything. Yet I was wondering of what use is such book to me. Maharaj, of no use probably, since it does not attract you. Others may be impressed. People differ. But all are faced with the fact of their own existence. I am is the ultimate fact, who am I? Is the ultimate question to which everybody must find an answer. Question, the same answer. Maharaj, the same in essence, varied in expression. Each seeker accepts, or invents, a method which suits him, applies it to himself with some earnestness and effort, obtains results according to his temperament and expectations, casts them into the mound of words, builds them into a system, establishes a tradition, and begins to admit others into his school of yoga. It is all built on memory and imagination. No such school is valueless, nor indispensable, in each one can progress up to the point when all desire for progress must be abandoned to make further progress possible. Then all schools are given up, all effort ceases, in solitude and darkness the vast step is made which ends ignorance and fear forever. True teacher, however, will not imprison his disciple in a prescribed set of ideas, feelings and actions, on the contrary, he will show him patiently the need to be free from all ideas and set patterns of behavior, to be vigilant and earnest and go with life wherever it takes him, not to enjoy or suffer, but to understand and learn. Under the right teacher the disciple learns to learn, not to remember and obey. Thatsang, the company of the noble, does not mold, it liberates. Beware of all that makes you dependent. Most of the so-called surrenders to the guru end in disappointment, if not in tragedy. Fortunately, an earnest seeker will disentangle himself in time, the wiser for the experience. Question, surely self-surrender has its value. Maharaj, self-surrender is the surrender of all self-concern. It cannot be done, it happens when you realize your true nature. Verbal self-surrender, even when accompanied by feeling, is of little value and breaks down under stress. At the best, it shows an aspiration, not an actual fact. Question. In the Rig Veda there is the mention of the Adhai Yoga, the primordial yoga, consisting of the marriage of Pragna with Prana, which, as I understand, means the bringing together of wisdom and life. Would you say it means also the union of Dharma and Karma, righteousness and action? Maharaj. Yes, provided by righteousness you mean harmony with one's true nature and by action, only unselfish and desireless action. In it high yoga life itself is the guru and the mind the disciple. The mind attends to life it does not dictate. Life flows naturally and effortlessly and the mind removes the obstacles to its even flow. Question. Is not life by its very nature repetitive? Will not following life lead to stagnation? Maharaj, by itself life is immensely creative. A seed in course of time becomes a forest. The mind is like a forester, protecting and regulating the immense vital urge of existence. Question, seen as the service of life by the mind, the Adhai Yoga is a perfect democracy. 
Everyone is engaged in living a life to his best capacity and knowledge, everyone is a disciple of the same Guru. Maharaj, you may say so. It may be so potentially. But unless life is loved and trusted, followed with eagerness and zest, it would be fanciful to talk of yoga which is a movement in consciousness, awareness and action. Question. Once I watched a mountain stream flowing between the boulders. At each boulder the commotion was different according to the shape and size of the boulder. Is not every person a mere commotion over a body while life is one and eternal? Maharaj, the commotion and the water are not separate. It is the disturbance that makes you aware of water. Consciousness is always of movement of change. There can be no such thing as changeless consciousness. Changelessness wipes out consciousness immediately. A man deprived of outer or inner sensations blanks out or goes beyond consciousness and unconsciousness into the birthless and deathless state. Only when spirit and matter come together consciousness is born. Question. Are they one or two? Maharaj. It depends on the words you use, they are one or two, or three. On investigation three become two and two become one. Take the simile of face mirror image. Any two of them presuppose the third which unites the two. In Sadhana you see the three is two until you realize the two is one. As long as you are engrossed in the world, you are unable to know yourself. To know yourself, Turn away your attention from the world and turn it within. Question. I cannot destroy the world. Maharaj, there is no need. Just understand that what you see is not what is. Appearances will dissolve on investigation and the underlying reality will come to the surface. You need not burn the house to get out of it. You just walk out. It is only when you cannot come and go freely that the house becomes a jail. I move in and out of consciousness easily and naturally and therefore to me the world is a home, not a prison. Question. But ultimately is there a world or is there none? Maharaj, what you see is nothing but yourself. Call it what you like, it does not change the fact. Through the film of destiny your own light depicts pictures on the screen. You are the viewer, the light, the picture and the screen. Even the film of destiny prarabdha is self-selected and self-imposed. The spirit is a sport and enjoys to overcome obstacles. The harder the task, the deeper and wider his self-realization. Chapter 93 Men is not the doer. Questioner, from the beginning of my life I am pursued by a sense of incompleteness. From school to college, to work to marriage, to affluence, I imagined that the next thing will surely give me peace, but there was no peace. The sense of unfulfillment keeps on growing as years pass by. Maharaj, as long as there is the body and the sense of identity with the body, frustration is inevitable. Only when you know yourself as entirely alien to and different from the body, Will you find respite from the mixture of fear and craving inseparable from the I am the body idea? Merely assuaging fears and satisfying desires will not remove the sense of emptiness you are trying to escape from. Only self-knowledge can help you. By self-knowledge I mean full knowledge of what you are not. Such knowledge is attainable and final, but to the discovery of what you are there can be no end. The more you discover, the more there remains to discover. Question, for this we must have different parents and schools, live in a different society. Maharaj, you, cannot change your circumstances, but your attitudes you can change. You need not be attached to the non-essentials. Only the necessary is good. There is peace only in the essential. Question, it is truth I seek, not peace. Maharaj, you cannot see the true unless you are at peace. The quiet mind is essential for right perception, which again is required for self-realization. Question, I have so much to do. I just cannot afford to keep my mind quiet. 
Maharaj, it is because of your illusion that you are the doer. In reality things are done to you, not by you. Question. If I just let things happen, how can I be sure that they will happen my way? Surely I must bend them to my desire. Maharaj, your desire just happens to you along with its fulfillment or non-fulfillment. You can change neither. You may believe that you exert yourself, strive and struggle. Again it all merely happens, including the fruits of the work. Nothing is by you and for you. All is in the picture exposed on the cinema screen, nothing in the light, including what you take yourself to be, the person. You are the light only. Question. If I am light only, how did I come to forget it? Maharaj, you have not forgotten. It is in the picture on the screen that you forget and then remember. You never cease to be a man because you dream to be a tiger. Similarly you are pure light appearing as a picture on the screen and also becoming one with it. Question, since all happens why should I worry? Maharaj, exactly. Freedom is freedom from worry. Having realized that you cannot influence the results, pay no attention to your desires and fears. Let them come and go. Don't give them the nourishment of interest and attention. Question. If I turn my attention from what happens, what am I to live by? Maharaj, again it is like asking, what shall I do if I stop dreaming? Stop and see. You need not be anxious, what next? There is always the next. Life does not begin nor end, immovable it moves momentary it lasts. Light cannot be exhausted even if innumerable pictures are projected by it. So does life fill every shape to the brim and return to its source when the shape breaks down? Question. If life is so wonderful, how could ignorance happen? Maharaj, you want to treat the disease without having seen the patient. Before you ask about ignorance, why don't you inquire first, who is the ignorant? When you say you are ignorant, you do not know that you have imposed the concept of ignorance over the actual state of your thoughts and feelings. Examine them as they occur, give them your full attention and you will find that there is nothing like ignorance, only inattention. Give attention to what worries you, that is all. After all, worry is mental pain and pain is invariably a call for attention. The moment you give attention, the call for it ceases and the question of ignorance dissolves. Instead of waiting for an answer to your question, find out who is asking the question and what makes him ask it. You will soon find that it is the mind, goaded by fear of pain, that asks the question. And in fear there is memory and anticipation, past and future. Attention brings you back to the present, the now, and the presence in the now is a state ever at hand, but rarely noticed. Question. You are reducing sadhana to simple attention. How is it that other teachers teach complete, difficult and time-consuming courses? Maharaj, the gurus usually teach the sadhanas by which they themselves have reached their goal, whatever their goal may be. This is but natural, for their own sadhana they know intimately. I was taught to give attention to my sense of I am, and I found it supremely effective. Therefore I can speak of it with full confidence. But often people come with their bodies, brain and mind so mishandled, perverted and weak, that the state of formless attention is beyond them. In such cases, some simpler token of earnestness is appropriate. The repetition of a mantra or gazing at a picture will prepare their body and mind for a deeper and more direct search. After all, it is earnestness that is indispensable, the crucial facto, sadhana is only a vessel, and it must be filled to the brim with earnestness, which is but love in action. For nothing can be done without love. Question, we love only ourselves. Maharaj, were it so, it would be splendid. Love yourself wisely and you will reach the summit of perfection. Everybody loves his body, but few love their real being. Question, 
does my real being need my love? Maharaj, your real being is love itself and your many loves are its reflections according to the situation at the moment. Question, we are selfish we know only self-love. Maharaj, good enough for a start. By all means wish yourself well. Think over feel out deeply what is really good for you and strive for it earnestly. Very soon you will find that the real is your only good. Question. Yet I do not understand why the various gurus insist on prescribing complicated and difficult sadhanas. Don't they know better? Maharaj, it is not what you do but what you stop doing that matters. The people who begin their sadhana are so feverish and restless that they have to be very busy to keep themselves on the track. An absorbing routine is good for them. After some time they quieten down and turn away from effort. In peace and silence the skin of thy dissolves and the inner and the outer become one. The real sadhana is effortless. Question, I have sometimes the feeling that space itself is my body. Maharaj, when you are bound by the illusion, I am this body, you are merely a point in space and a moment in time. When the self-identification with the body is no more, all space and time are in your mind, which is a mere ripple in consciousness, which is awareness reflected in nature. Awareness and matter are the active and the passive aspects of pure being, which is in both and beyond both. Space and time are the body and the mind of the universal existence. My feeling is that all that happens in space and time happens to me, that every experience is my experience, every form is my form. What I take myself to be becomes my body and all that happens to that body becomes my mind. But at the root of the universe there is pure awareness beyond space and time here and now. Know it to be your real being and act accordingly. Question. What difference will it make in action what I take myself to be? Actions just happen according to circumstances. Maharaj, circumstances and conditions rule the ignorant. The knower of reality is not compelled. The only law he obeys is that of love. Chapter 94. You are beyond space and time. Questioner, you keep on saying that I was never born and will never die. If so, how is it that I see the world as one which has been born and will surely die? Maharaj, you believe so because you have never questioned your belief that you are the body which, obviously, is born and dies. While alive it attracts attention and fascinates so completely that rarely does one perceive one's real nature. It is like seeing the surface of the ocean and completely forgetting the immensity beneath. The world is but the surface of the mind, and the mind is infinite. What we call thoughts are just ripples in the mind. When the mind is quiet, it reflects reality. When it is motionless through and through, it dissolves and only reality remains. This reality is so concrete, so actual, so much more tangible than mind and matter, that compared to it even diamond is soft like butter. This overwhelming actuality makes the world dreamlike misty irrelevant. Question, this world with so much suffering in it, how can you see it as irrelevant? What callousness? Maharaj, it is you who is callous, not me. If your world is so full of suffering do something about it, don't add to it through greed or indolence. I am not bound by your dreamlike world. In my world the seeds of suffering, desire and fear are not sown and suffering does not grow. My world is free from opposites of mutually distinctive discrepancies, harmony pervades, its peace is rock-like, this peace and silence are my body. Question, which you say reminds me of the Dharmakaya of the Buddha. Maharaj, maybe. We need not run off with terminology. To see the person you imagine yourself to be as a part of the world you perceive within your mind and look at the mind from the outside, for you are not the mind. After all, your only problem is the eager self-identification with whatever you perceive. 
Give up this habit. Remember that you are not what you perceive. Use your power of alert aloofness. To yourself and all that lives in your behavior will express your vision. Once you realize that there is nothing in this world which you can call your own, you look at it from the outside as you look at a play on the stage or a picture on the screen, admiring and enjoying, but really unmoved. As long as you imagine yourself to be something tangible and solid, a thing among things actually existing in time and space, short-lived and vulnerable, naturally you will be anxious to survive and increase. But when you know yourself as beyond space and time in contact with them only at the point of here and now, otherwise all-pervading and all-containing, unapproachable, unassailable, invulnerable, you will be afraid no longer. Know yourself as you are, against fear there is no other remedy. You have to learn to think and feel on these lines, or you will remain indefinitely on the personal level of desire and fear, gaining and losing, growing and decaying. A personal problem cannot be solved on its own level. The very desire to live is the messenger of death, as the longing to be happy is the outline of sorrow. The world is an ocean of pain and fear, of anxiety and despair. Pleasures are like the fishes, few and swift, rarely come quickly gone. A man of low intelligence believes against all evidence that he is an exception and that the world owes him happiness. But the world cannot give what it does not have, unreal to the core, it is of no use for real happiness. It cannot be otherwise. We seek the real because we are unhappy with the unreal. Happiness is our real nature, and we shall never rest until we find it. But rarely we know where to seek it. Once you have understood that the world is but a mistaken view of reality, and is not what it appears to be, you are free of its obsessions. Only what is compatible with your real being can make you happy and the world as you perceive it, is its outright denial. Keep very quiet and watch what comes to the surface of the mind. Reject the known, welcome the so far unknown and reject it in its turn. Thus you come to a state in which there is no knowledge, only being, in which being itself is knowledge. To know by being is direct knowledge. It is based on the identity of the seer and the seen. Indirect knowledge is based on sensation and memory, on proximity of the perceiver and his percept, confined with the contrast between the two. The same with happiness. Usually you have to be sad to know gladness and glad to know sadness. True happiness is uncaused, and this cannot disappear for lack of stimulation. It is not the opposite of sorrow, it includes all sorrow and suffering. Question, how can one remain happy among so much suffering? Maharaj, one cannot help it, the inner happiness is overwhelmingly real. Like the sun in the sky, its expressions may be clouded, but it is never absent. Question, when we are in trouble, we are bound to be unhappy. Maharaj, fear is the only trouble. Know yourself as independent, and you will be free from fear and its shadows. Question, what is the difference between happiness and pleasure? Maharaj, pleasure depends on things happiness does not. Question. If happiness is independent, why are we not always happy? Maharaj, as long as we believe that we need things to make us happy, we shall also believe that in their absence we must be miserable. Mind always shapes itself according to its beliefs. Hence the importance of convincing oneself that one need not be prodded into happiness. That, on the contrary, pleasure is a distraction and a nuisance, for it merely increases the false conviction that one needs to have and do things to be happy when in reality, it is just the opposite. But why talk of happiness at all? You do not think of happiness except when you are unhappy. A man who says, now I am happy, is between two sorrows past and future. This happiness is mere excitement caused by relief from pain. Real happiness is utterly unself-conscious. It is best expressed negatively as, 
There is nothing wrong with me. I have nothing to worry about. After all, the ultimate purpose of all sadhana is to reach a point when this conviction, instead of being only verbal, is based on the actual and ever present experience. Question, which experience? Maharaj, the experience of being empty, uncluttered by memories and expectations. It is like the happiness of open spaces, of being young, of having all the time and energy for doing things, for discovery, for adventure. Question, what remains to discover? Maharaj, the universe without, and the immensity within as they are in reality, in the great mind and heart of God. The meaning and purpose of existence, the secret of suffering, life's redemption from ignorance. Question. If being happy is the same as being free from fear and worry, cannot it be said that absence of trouble is the cause of happiness? Maharaj. A state of absence, of non-existence cannot be a cause. The pre-existence of a cause is implied in the notion. Your natural state, in which nothing exists, cannot be a cause of becoming. The causes are hidden in the great and mysterious power of memory. But your true home is in nothingness and emptiness of all content. Question. Emptiness and nothingness, how dreadful. Maharaj, you face it most cheerfully when you go to sleep. Find out for yourself the state of wakeful sleep, and you will find it quite in harmony with your real nature. Words can only give you the idea and the idea is not the experience. All I can say is that true happiness has no cause and what has no cause is immovable. Which does not mean it is perceivable as pleasure. What is perceivable is pain and pleasure. The state of freedom from sorrow can be described only negatively. To know it directly you must go beyond the mind addicted to causality and the tyranny of time. Question. If happiness is not conscious and consciousness not happy, what is the link between the two? Maharaj, consciousness being a product of conditions and circumstances, depends on them and changes along with them. What is independent, uncreated, timeless and changeless, and yet ever new and fresh, is beyond the mind. When the mind thinks of it, the mind dissolves and only happiness remains. Question, when all goes, nothingness remains. Maharaj, how can there be nothing without something? Nothing is only an idea, it depends on the memory of something. Pure being is quite independent of existence, which is definable and describable. Question, please tell us, beyond the mind does consciousness continue or does it end with the mind? Maharaj, Consciousness comes and goes, awareness shines immutably. Question, who is aware in awareness? Maharaj, when there is a person there is also consciousness. I am mind consciousness to note the same state. If you say I am aware it only means, I am conscious of thinking about being aware. There is no I am in awareness. Question, what about witnessing? Maharaj, Witnessing is of the mind. The witness goes with the witnessed. In the state of non-duality, all separation ceases. Question, what about you? Do you continue in awareness? Maharaj, the person that I am this body, this mind, this chain of memories, this bundle of desires and fears disappears, but something you may call identity remains. It enables me to become a person when required. Love creates its own necessities, even of becoming a person. Question, it is said that reality manifests itself as existence, consciousness bliss. Are they absolute or relative? Maharaj, they are relative to each other and depend on each other. Reality is independent of its expressions. Question. What is the relation between reality and its expressions? Maharaj, no relation. In reality, all is real and identical. As we put it, Saguna and Nirguna are one in Parabrahman. There is only the Supreme. 
In movement, it is Saguna. Motionless, it is Nirguna. But it is only the mind that moves or does not move. The real is beyond, you are beyond. Once you have understood that nothing perceivable or conceivable can be yourself, you are free of your imaginations. To see everything as imagination, born of desire, is necessary for self-realization. We miss the real by lack of attention and create the unreal by excess of imagination. You have to give your heart and mind to these things and brood over them repeatedly. It is like cooking food. You must keep it on the fire for some time before it is ready. Question. Am I not under the sway of destiny, of my karma? What can I do against it? What I am and what I do is predetermined. Even my so-called free choice is predetermined, only I am not aware of it and imagine myself to be free. Maharaj, again it all depends how you look at it. Ignorance is like a fever, it makes you see things which are not there. Karma is the divinely prescribed treatment. Welcome it and follow the instructions faithfully, and you will get well. A patient will leave the hospital after he recovers. To insist on immediate freedom of choice and action will merely postpone recovery. Accept your destiny and fulfill it. This is the shortest way to freedom from destiny, though not from love and its compulsions. To act from desire and fear is bondage, to act from love is freedom. Chapter 95 Accept Life as It Comes Questioner, I was here last year. Now I am again before you. What makes me come I really till the oh not know, but somehow I cannot forget you. Maharaj, some forget, some do not, according to their destinies, which you may call chance if you prefer. Question, between chance and destiny there is a basic difference. Maharaj, only in your mind. In fact, you do not know what causes what. Destiny is only a blanket word to cover up your ignorance. Chance is another word. Question, without knowledge of causes and their results can there be freedom? Maharaj, causes and results are infinite in number and variety. Everything affects everything. In this universe when one thing changes, everything changes. Hence the great power of man in changing the world by changing himself. Question, according to your own words you have by the grace of your guru changed radically some forty years ago. Yet the world remains as it had been before. Maharaj, my world has changed completely. Yours remains the same for you have not changed. Question, how is it that your change has not affected me? Maharaj, because there was no communion between us. Do not consider yourself as separate from me and we shall at once share in the common state. Question. I have some property in the United States which I intend to sell and buy some land in the Himalayas. I shall build a house, lay out a garden, get two or three cows and live quietly. People tell me that property and quiet are not compatible, that I shall at once get into trouble with officials, neighbors and thieves. Is it inevitable? Maharaj, the least you can expect is an endless succession of visitors who will make your abode into a free and open guest house. Better accept your life as it shapes, go home and look after your wife with love and care. Nobody else needs you. Your dreams of glory will land you in more trouble. Question, it is not glory that I seek. I seek reality. Maharaj, for this you need a well-ordered and quiet life, peace of mind and immense earnestness. At every moment whatever comes to you unasked, comes from God, and will surely help you, if you make the fullest use of it. it is only what you strive for, out of your own imagination and desire, that gives you trouble. Question. Is destiny the same as grace? Maharaj, absolutely. Accept life as it comes, and you will find it a blessing. Question, I can accept my own life. How can I accept the sort of life others are compelled to live? Maharaj, you are accepting it anyhow. 
The sorrows of others do not interfere with your pleasures. If you were really compassionate, you would have abandoned long ago all self-concern and entered the state from which alone you can really help. Question. If I have a big house and enough land, I may create an ashram with individual rooms, common meditation hall, canteen, library office, etc. Maharaj, ashrams are not made, they happen. You cannot start nor prevent them, as you cannot start or stop a river. Too many factors are involved in the creation of a successful ashram and your inner maturity is only one of them. Horse, if you are ignorant of your real being whatever you do must turn to ashes. You cannot imitate a guru and get away with it. All hypocrisy will end in disaster. Question, what is the harm in behaving like a saint even before being one? Maharaj, rehearsing saintliness is a sadhana. It is perfectly all rigged provided no merit is claimed. Question. How can I know whether I am able to start an ashram unless I try? Maharaj, as long as you take yourself to be a person, a body and a mind, separate from the stream of life, having no will of its own, pursuing its own aims, you are living merely on the surface, and whatever you do will be short-lived, and of little value, mere straw to feed the flames of vanity. You must put in true worth before you can expect something real. What is your worth? Question. By what measure shall I measure it? Maharaj, look at the content of your mind. You're what you think about. Are you not most of the time busy with your own little person and its daily needs? The value of regular meditation is that it takes you away from the humdrum of daily routine and reminds you that you are not what you believe yourself to be. But even remembering is not enough action must follow conviction. Don't be like the rich man who has made a detailed will, but refuses to die. Question, is not gradualness the law of life? Maharaj, oh no. Preparation alone is gradual, the change itself is sudden and complete. Gradual change does not take you to a new level of conscious being. You need courage to let go. Question. I admit it is courage that I lack. Maharaj. It is because you are not fully convinced. Complete conviction generates both desire and courage. And meditation is the art of achieving faith through understanding. In meditation you consider the teaching received in all its aspects and repeatedly until out of clarity confidence is born and with confidence action. Conviction and action are inseparable. If action does not follow conviction, examine your convictions, don't accuse yourself of lack of courage. Self-depreciation will take you nowhere. Without clarity and emotional assent of what uses will, Question. What do you mean by emotional assent? Am I not to act against my desires? Maharaj, you will not act against your desires. Clarity is not enough. Energy comes from love. You must love to act, whatever the shape and object of your love. Without clarity and charity courage is destructive. People at war are often wonderfully courageous, but what of it? Question. I see quite clearly that all I want is a house in a garden where I shall live in peace. Why should I not act on my desire? Maharaj, by all means act. But do not forget the inevitable, unexpected. Without rain your garden will not flourish. You need courage for adventure. Question, I need time to collect my courage, don't hustle me. Let me ripen for action. Maharaj, the entire approach is wrong. Action delayed is action abandoned. There may be other chances for other actions, but the present moment is lost, irretrievably lost. All preparation is for the future, you cannot prepare for the present. Question, what is wrong with preparing for the future? Maharaj, acting in the now is not much helped by your preparations. Clarity is now, action is now. Thinking of being ready impedes action. And action is the touchstone of reality. 
Question, even when we act without conviction? Maharaj, you cannot live without action, and behind each action there is some fear or desire. Ultimately, all you do is based on your conviction that the world is real and independent of yourself. Were you convinced of the contrary, your behavior would have been quite different. Question, there is nothing wrong with my convictions, my actions are shaped by circumstances. Maharaj, in other words, you are convinced of the reality of your circumstances, of the world in which you live. Trace the world to its source, and you will find that before the world was, you were and when the world is no longer, you remain. Find your timeless being and your action will bear it testimony. Did you find it? Question. No, I did not. Maharaj, then what else have you to do? Surely, this is the most urgent task. You cannot see yourself as independent of everything unless you drop everything and remain unsupported and undefined. Once you know yourself, it is immaterial what you do, but to realize your independence, you must test it by letting go all you were dependent on. The realized man lives on the level of the absolutes, his wisdom, love and courage are complete, there is nothing relative about him. Therefore he must prove himself by tests more stringent, undergo trials more demanding. The tester that tested and the setup for testing are all within, it is an inner drama to which none can be a party. Question, crucifixion, death and resurrection, we are on familiar grounds. I have read, heard, and talked about it endlessly, but to do it I find myself incapable. Maharaj, keep quiet, undisturbed, and the wisdom and the power will come on their own. You need not hanker. Wait in silence of the heart and mind. It is very easy to be quiet, but willingness is rare. You people want to become supermen overnight. They without ambition, without the least desire, exposed, vulnerable, unprotected, uncertain and alone, completely open to and welcoming life as it happens, without the selfish conviction that all must yield you pleasure or profit, material or so-called spiritual. Question, I respond to what you say, but I just do not see how it is done. Maharaj, if you know how to do it, you will not do it. Abandon every attempt, just be, don't strive, don't struggle, let go every support, hold on to the blind sense of being, brushing off all else. This is enough. Question, how is this brushing done? The more I brush off, the more it comes to the surface. Maharaj, refuse attention, let things come and go. Desires and thoughts are also things. Disregard them. Since immemorial time, the dust of events was covering the clear mirror of your mind, so that only memories you could see. Brush off the dust before it has time to settle, this will lay bare the old layers until the true nature of your mind is discovered. It is all very simple and comparatively easy, be earnest and patient, that is all. Dispassion, detachment, freedom from desire and fear, from all self-concern, mere awareness, free from memory and expectation, this is the state of mind to which discovery can happen. After all, liberation is but the freedom to discover. Chapter 96. Abandon Memories and Expectations. Questioner, I am an American by birth, and for the last one year I was staying in an ashram in Madhya Pradesh, studying yoga in its many aspects. We had a teacher whose guru, a disciple of the great Sivananda Saraswati, stays in Mongar. I stayed at Ramanashram also. While in Bombay I went through an intensive course of Burmese meditation managed by Wengonka. Yet I have not found peace. There is an improvement in self-control and day-to-day -day discipline, but that is all. I cannot say exactly what caused what. I visited many holy places. How each acted on me I cannot say. Maharaj, good results will come sooner or later. At Sri Ramanashram did you get some instructions? Question. 
Yes, some English people were teaching me and also an Indian follower of Jhana Yoga, residing there permanently, was giving me lessons. Maharaj, what are your plans? Question. I have to return to the States because of visa difficulties. I intend to complete my Bachelor of Science, study nature cure and make it my profession. Maharaj, a good profession no doubt. Question. Is there any danger in pursuing the path of yoga at all cost? Maharaj, is a matchstick dangerous when the house is on fire? The search for reality is the most dangerous of all undertakings for it will destroy the world in which you live. But if your motive is love of truth and life, you need not be afraid. Question, I am afraid of my own mind. It is so unsteady. Maharaj, in the mirror of your mind images appear and disappear. The mirror remains. Learn to distinguish the immovable in the movable, the unchanging in the changing, till you realize that all differences are in appearance only and oneness is a fact. This basic identity, you may call God or Brahman or the Matrix Prakriti, the words matters little, is only the realization that all is one. Once you can say with confidence born from direct experience, I am the world, the world is myself, you are free from desire and fear on one hand and become totally responsible for the world on the other. The senseless sorrow of mankind becomes your sole concern. Question, so even the Jani has his problems? Maharaj, yes but they are no longer of his own creation. His suffering is not poisoned by a sense of guilt. There is nothing wrong with suffering for the sins of others. Your Christianity is based on this. Question, is not all suffering self-created? Maharaj, yes, as long as there is a separate self to create it. In the end, you know that there is no sin, no guilt, no retribution, only life in its endless transformations. With the dissolution of the personal I personal suffering disappears. What remains is the great sadness of compassion, the horror of the unnecessary pain. Question. Is there anything unnecessary in the scheme of things? Maharaj. Nothing is necessary, nothing is inevitable. Habit and passion blind and mislead. Compassionate awareness heals and redeems. There is nothing we can do, we can only let things happen according to their nature. Question. Do you advocate complete passivity? Maharaj. Clarity and charity is action. Love is not lazy and clarity directs. You need not worry about action, look after your mind and heart. Stupidity and selfishness are the only evil. Question. What is better, repetition of God's name or meditation? Maharaj, repetition will stabilize your breath. With deep and quiet breathing vitality will improve, which will influence the brain and help the mind to grow pure and stable and fit for meditation. Without vitality little can be done, hence the importance of its protection and increase. Posture and breathing are a part of yoga, for the body must be healthy and well under control, but too much concentration on the body defeats its own purpose, for it is the mind that is primary in the beginning. When the mind has been put to rest and disturbs no longer the inner space chittakash, the body acquires a new meaning and its transformation becomes both necessary and possible. Picture question. I have been wandering all over India, meeting many gurus and learning in driblets, several yogas. Is it all right to have a taste of everything? Maharaj, no, this is but an introduction. You will meet a man who will help you find your own way. Question, I feel that the guru of my own choice cannot be my real guru. To be real he must come unexpected and be irresistible. Maharaj, not to anticipate, is best. The way you respond is decisive. Question. Am I the master of my responses? Maharaj, 
discrimination and dispassion practiced now will yield their fruits at the proper time. If the roots are healthy and well watered, the fruits are sure to be sweet. Be pure, be alert, keep ready. Question, are austerities and penances of any use? Maharaj, to meet all the vicissitudes of life is penance enough. You need not invent trouble. To meet cheerfully whatever life brings is all the austerity you need. Question, what about sacrifice? Maharaj, share willingly and gladly all you have with whoever needs, don't invent self-inflicted cruelties. Question, what is self-surrender? Maharaj, accept what comes. Question, I feel I am too weak to stand on my own legs. I need the holy company of a guru and of good people. Equanimity is beyond me. To accept what comes as it comes frightens me. I think of my returning to the states with horror. Maharaj, go back and make the best use of your opportunities. Get your Bachelor of Science degree first. You can always return to India for your nature cure studies. Question, I am quite aware of the opportunities in the states. It is the loneliness that frightens me. Maharaj, you have always the company of your own self, you need not feel alone. Estranged from it even in India, you will feel lonely. All happiness comes from pleasing the self. Please it after return to the states, do nothing that may be unworthy of the glorious reality within your heart, and you shall be happy and remain happy. But you must seek the self and having found it stay with it. Question, will compete solitude be of any benefit? Maharaj, it depends on your temperament. You may work with others and for others, alert and friendly, and grow more fully than in solitude, which may make you dull or leave you at the mercy of your mind's endless chatter. Do not imagine that you can change through effort. Violence, even turned against yourself, as in austerities and penance, will remain fruitless. Question, is there no way of making out who is realized and who is not? Maharaj, your only proof is in yourself. If you find that you turned a goal, it will be a sign that you have touched the philosopher's stone. Stay with the person and watch what happens to you. Don't ask others. Their man may not be your guru. A guru may be universal in his essence, but not in his expressions. He may appear to be angry or greedy or over-anxious about his ashram or his family, and you may be misled by appearances, while others are not. Question, have I not the right to expect all-round perfection, both inner and outer? Maharaj, inner yes. But outer perfection depends on circumstances, on the state of the body, personal and social and other innumerable factors. Question. I was told to find a jhani so that I may learn from him the art of achieving jhana, and now I am told that the entire approach is false, that I cannot make out a jhani nor can jhana be conquered by appropriate means. Is also confusing. Maharaj, it is all due to your complete misunderstanding of reality. Your mind is steeped in the habits of evaluation and acquisition and will not admit that the incomparable and unobtainable are waiting timelessly within your own heart for recognition. All you have to do is to abandon all memories and expectations. Just keep yourself ready in utter nakedness and nothingness. Question, who is to do the abandoning? Maharaj, God will do it. To see the need of being abandoned. Don't resist, don't hold on to the person you take yourself to be. Because you imagine yourself to be a person you take the Johnny to be a person too, only somewhat different, better informed and more powerful. You may say that he is eternally conscious and happy, but it is far from expressing the whole truth. Don't trust definitions and descriptions, they are grossly misleading. Question, unless I am told what to do and how to do it I feel lost. Maharaj, by all means do feel lost. As long as you feel competent and confident, reality is beyond your reach. Unless you accept inner adventure as a way of life, discovery will not come to you. Question, 
Discovery of what? Maharaj, of the center of your being which is free of all directions, all means and ends. Question, be all, know all have all. Maharaj, be nothing, know nothing have nothing. This is the only life worth living, the only happiness worth having. Question, I may admit that the goal is beyond my comprehension. Let me know the way at least. Maharaj, you must find your own way. Unless you find it yourself, it will not be your own way, and will take you nowhere. Earnestly live your truth as you have found it, act on the little you have understood. It is earnestness that will take you through, not cleverness, your own or another's. Question. I am afraid of mistakes. Though many things I tried, nothing came out of them. Maharaj. You gave too little of yourself, you were merely curious, not earnest. Question, I don't know any better. Maharaj, at least that much you know. Knowing them to be superficial, give no value to your experiences, forget them as soon as they are over. Live a clean selfless life, that is all. Question, is morality so important? Maharaj, don't cheat, don't hurt, is it not important? Above all you need inner peace, which demands harmony between the inner and the outer. Do what you believe in and believe in what you do. All else is a waste of energy and time. Chapter 97 Mind and the world are not separate. Questioner, I see here pictures of several saints and I am told that they are your spiritual ancestors. Who are they and how did it all begin? Maharaj, we are called collectively the Nine Masters. The legend says that our first teacher was Rishi Dattatriya, the great incarnation of the Trinity of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. Even the Nine Masters Navnath are mythological. Question, what is the peculiarity of their teaching? Maharaj, its simplicity, both in theory and practice. Question, how does one become a Navnath? By initiation or by succession? Maharaj, neither. The Nine Masters tradition, Navnath Parampara, is like a river, it flows into the ocean of reality, and whoever enters it is carried along. Question, does it imply acceptance by a living master belonging to the same tradition? Maharaj, those who practice the sadhana of focusing their minds on I may feel related to others who have followed the same sadhana and succeeded. They may decide to verbalize their sense of kinship by calling themselves navnats. It gives them the pleasure of belonging to an established tradition. Question, do they in any way benefit by joining? Maharaj, the circle of satsang, the company of saints, expands in numbers as time passes. Question, do they get hold thereby of a source of power and grace from which they would have been barred otherwise? Maharaj, power and grace are for all and for the asking. Giving oneself a particular name does not help. Call yourself by any name as long as you are intensely mindful of yourself, the accumulated obstacles to self-knowledge are bound to be swept away. Question. If I like your teaching and accept your guidance, can I call myself a Navnath? Maharaj, please your word addicted mind. The name will not change you. At best it may remind you to behave. There is a succession of gurus and their disciples, who in turn train more disciples and thus the line is maintained. But the continuity of tradition is informal and voluntary. It is like a family name, but here the family is spiritual. Question. Do you have to realize to join the Sampradaya? Maharaj, the Navnath Sampradaya is only a tradition, a way of teaching and practice. It does not denote a level of consciousness. If you accept a Navnath Sampradaya teacher as your guru, you join his Sampradaya. Usually you receive a token of his grace, a look, a touch or a word, sometimes a vivid dream or a strong remembrance. Sometimes the only sign of grace is a significant and rapid change in character and behavior. Question. 
I know you now for some years and I meet you regularly. The thought of you is never far from my mind. Does it make me belong to your Sampradaya? Maharaj, your belonging is a matter of your own feeling and conviction. After all, it is all verbal and formal. In reality, there is neither guru nor disciple, neither theory nor practice, neither ignorance nor realization. It all depends on what you take yourself to be. Know yourself correctly. There is no substitute to self-knowledge. Question, what proof will I have that I know myself correctly? Maharaj, you need no proofs. The experience is unique and unmistakable. It will dawn on you suddenly when the obstacles are removed to some extent. It is like a frayed rope snapping. Yours is to work at the strands. The break is bound to happen. It can be delayed but not prevented. Question, I am confused by your denial of causality. Does it mean that none is responsible for the world as it is? Maharaj, the idea of responsibility is in your mind. You think there must be something or somebody solely responsible for all Thithapans. There is a contradiction between a multiple universe and a single cause. Either one or the other must be false. Or both. As I see it, it is all daydreaming. There is no reality in ideas. The fact is that without you, neither the universe nor its cause could have come into being. Question. I cannot make out whether I am the creature or the creator of the universe. Maharaj. I am is an ever-present fact, while I am created is an idea. Neither God nor the universe have come to tell you that they have created you. The mind obsessed by the idea of causality invents creation and then wonders who is the creator. The mind itself is the creator. Even this is not quite true for the created and its creator are one. The mind and the world are not separate. Do understand that what you think to be the world is your own mind. Question. Is there a world beyond or outside the mind? Maharaj, all space and time are in the mind. Where will you locate a supermental world? There are many levels of the mind and each projects its own version, yet all are in the mind and created by the mind. Question. What is your attitude to sin? How do you look at a sinner or somebody who breaks the law in her outer? Do you want him to change or you just pity him? Or are you indifferent to him because of his sins? Maharaj, I know no sin nor sinner. Your distinction and valuation do not bind me. Everybody behaves according to his nature. It cannot be helped nor need it be regretted. Question. Others suffer. Maharaj, life lives on life. In nature the process is compulsory, in society it should be voluntary. There can be no life without sacrifice. A sinner refuses to sacrifice and invites death. This is as it is and gives no cause for condemnation or pity. Question, surely you feel at least compassion when you see a man steeped in sin. Maharaj, yes, I feel I am that man and his sins are my sins. Question, right, and what next? Maharaj, by my becoming one with him, he becomes one with me. It is not a conscious process, it happens entirely by itself. None of us can help it. What needs changing shall change anyhow, enough to know oneself as one is, here and now. Intense and methodical investigation into one's mind is yoga. Question, what about the chains of destiny forged by sin? Maharaj, when ignorance, the mother of sin, dissolves destiny, the compulsion to sin again ceases. Question, there are retributions to make. Maharaj, with ignorance coming to an end, all comes to an end. Things are then seen as they are and they are good. Question. If a sinner, a breaker of the law, comes before you and asks for your grace, what will be your response? Maharaj, he will get what he asks for. Question. In spite of being a very bad man. Maharaj, I know no bad people, I only know myself. 
I see no saints nor sinners, only living beings. I do not hand out grace. There is nothing I can give or deny which you do not have already in equal measure. Just be aware of your riches and make full use of them. As long as you imagine that you need my grace, you will be at my door begging for it. My begging for grace from you would make as little sense. We are not separate, the real is common. Question. A mother comes to you with a tale of woe. Her only son has taken to drugs and sex and is going from bad to worse. He is asking for your grace. What shall be your response? Maharaj, probably I shall hear myself telling her that all will be well. Question, that's all. Maharaj, that's all. What more do you expect? Question, but will the son of the woman change? Maharaj, he may or he may not. Question, the people who collect round you and who know you for many years maintain that when you say it will be all right it invariably happens as you say. Maharaj, you may as well say that it is the mother's heart that saved the child. For everything there are innumerable causes. Question. I am told that the man who wants nothing for himself is all-powerful. The entire universe is at his disposal. Maharaj, if you believe so act on it. Abandon every personal desire and use the power thus saved for changing the world. Question. All the Buddhas and Rishis have not succeeded in changing the world. Maharaj, the world does not yield to changing. By its very nature, it is painful and transient. See it as it is and divest yourself of all desire and fear. When the world does not hold and bind you, it becomes an abode of joy and beauty. You can be happy in the world only when you are free of it. Question. What is right and what is wrong? Maharaj, generally, what causes suffering is wrong and what removes it is right. The body and the mind are limited and therefore vulnerable. They need protection which gives rise to fear. As long as you identify yourself with them you are bound to suffer, realize your independence and remain happy. I tell you this is the secret of happiness. To believe that you depend on things and people for happiness is due to ignorance of your true nature. To know that you need nothing to be happy except self-knowledge is wisdom. Question. What comes first being or desire? Maharaj. With being arising in consciousness, the ideas of what you are arise in your mind as well as what you should be. This brings forth desire and action and the process of becoming begins. Becoming has, apparently, no beginning and no end for it restarts every moment. With the cessation of imagination and desire, becoming ceases and the being this or that merges into pure being, which is not describable, only experienceable. The world appears to you so overwhelmingly real, because you think of it all the time, cease thinking of it, and it will dissolve into thin mist. You need not forget. When desire and fear and bondage also ends. Is the emotional involvement, the pattern of likes and dislikes which we call character and temperament, that create the bondage? Question. Without desire and fear what motive is there for action? Maharaj, none, unless you consider love of life of righteousness of beauty motive enough. Do not be afraid of freedom from desire and fear. It enables you to live a life so different from all you know, so much more intense and interesting that truly, by losing all you gain all. Question. Since you count your spiritual ancestry from Rishi Dattatreya, are we right in believing that you and all your predecessors are reincarnations of the Rishi? Maharaj, you may believe in whatever you like, and if you act on your belief, you will get the fruits of it, but to me it has no importance. I am what I am and this is enough for me. I have no desire to identify myself with anybody, however illustrious. Nor do I feel the need to take myths for reality. I am only interested in ignorance and the freedom from ignorance. The proper role of a guru is to dispel ignorance in the hearts and minds of his disciples. 
Once the disciple has understood, the confirming action is up to him. Nobody can act for another. And if he does not act rightly, it only means that he has not understood and that the guru's work is not over. Question. There must be some hopeless cases too. Maharaj, none is hopeless. Obstacles can be overcome. What life cannot mend, death will end, but the guru cannot fail. Question. What gives you the assurance? Maharaj, the guru and man's inner reality are really one and work together towards the same goal, the redemption and salvation of the mind they cannot fail. Out of the very boulders that obstruct them, they build their bridges. Consciousness is not the whole of being, there are other levels on which man is much more cooperative. The guru is at home on all levels and his energy and patience are inexhaustible. Question, you keep on telling me that I am dreaming and that it is high time I should wake up. How does it happen that the Maharaj who has come to me in my dreams has not succeeded in waking me up? He keeps on urging and reminding, but the dream continues. Maharaj, it is because you have not really understood that you are dreaming. This is the essence of bondage, the mixing of the real with unreal. In your present state only the sense I am refers to reality, the what and the how I am are illusions imposed by destiny or accident. Question, when did the dream begin? Maharaj, it appears to be beginningless, but in fact it is only now. From moment to moment you are renewing it. Once you have seen that you are dreaming, you shall wake up. But you do not see because you want the dream to continue. The day will come when you will long for the ending of the dream with all your heart and mind and be willing to pay any price. The price will be dispassion and detachment, the loss of interest in the dream itself. Question, how helpless I am. As long as the dream of existence lasts, I want it to continue. As long as I want it to continue, it will last. Maharaj, wanting it to continue is not inevitable. See clearly your condition, your very clarity will release you. Question, as long as I am with you, all you say seems pretty obvious, but as soon as I am away from you I run about restless and anxious. Maharaj, you need not keep away from me in your mind at least. But your mind is after the world's welfare. Question, the world is full of troubles, no wonder my mind too is full of them. Maharaj, was there ever a world without troubles? Your being as a person depends on violence to others. Your very body is a battlefield full of the dead and dying. Existence implies violence. Question, as a body yes. As a human being definitely no. For humanity non-violence is the law of life and violence of death. Maharaj, there is little of non-violence in nature. Question, God and nature are not human and need not be humane. I am concerned with man alone. To be human, I must be compassionate absolutely. Maharaj, do you realize that as long as you have a self to defend, you must be violent? Question, I do. To be truly human I must be selfless. As long as I am selfish, I am subhuman, a humanoid only. Maharaj, so, we are all subhuman and only a few are human. Few are many, it is again clarity and charity that make us human. The subhuman, the humanoids, are dominated by tamas and rajas and the humans by sattva. Clarity and charity is sattva as it affects mind and action. But the real is beyond sattva. Since I have known you, you seem to be always after helping the world. How much did you help? Question, not a bit. Neither the world has changed, nor have I. But the world suffers and I suffer along with it. Struggle against suffering is a natural reaction. And what is civilization and culture, philosophy and religion, but a revolt against suffering? Evil and the ending of evil, is it not your own main preoccupation? You may call it ignorance, it comes to the same.
Maharaj, well, words do not matter, nor does it matter in what shape you are just now. Names and shapes change incessantly. Know yourself to be the changeless witness of the changeful mind. That is enough. Chapter 98 Freedom from Self-Identification Maharaj, can you sit on the floor? Do you need a pillow? Have you any questions to ask? Not that you need to ask, you can as well be quiet. To be just be is important. You need not ask anything, nor do anything. Such apparently lazy way of spending time is highly regarded in India. It means that for the time being you are free from the obsession with what next. When you are not in a hurry and the mind is free from anxieties, it becomes quiet and in the silence something may be heard which is ordinarily too fine and subtle for perception. I must be open and quiet to see. What we are trying to do here is to bring our minds into the right state for understanding what is real. Questioner, how do we learn to cut out worries? Maharaj, you need not worry about your worries. Just be. Do not try to be quiet, do not make being quiet into a task to be performed. Don't be restless about being quiet, miserable about being happy. Just be aware that you are and remain aware. Don't say, yes I am, what next? There is no next and I am. It is a timeless state. Question. If it is a timeless state it will assert itself anyhow. Maharaj. You are what you are timelessly, but of what use is it to you unless you know it and act on it? Your begging bowl may be of pure gold, but as long as you do not know it, you are a pauper. You must know your inner worth and trust and express it in the daily sacrifice of desire and fear. Question. If I know myself, shall I not desire and fear? Maharaj, for some time the mental habits may linger in spite of the new vision, the habit of longing for the known past and fearing the unknown future. When you know these are of the mind only, you can go beyond them. As long as you have all sorts of ideas about yourself, you know yourself through the mist of these ideas. To know yourself as you are, give up all ideas. You cannot imagine the taste of pure water, you can only discover it by abandoning all flavorings. As long as you are interested in your present way of living, you will not abandon it. Discovery cannot come as long as you cling to the familiar. It is only when you realize fully the immense sorrow of your life and revolt against it, that a way out can be found. Question. I can now see that the secret of India's eternal life lies in these dimensions of existence, of which India was always the custodian. Maharaj, it is an open secret, and there were always people willing and ready to share it. Teachers, there are many fearless disciples, very few. Question. I am quite willing to learn. Maharaj, learning words is not enough. You may know the theory, but without the actual experience of yourself as the impersonal and unqualified center of being, love and bliss, mere verbal knowledge is sterile. Question, then, what am I to do? Maharaj, try to be only to be. The all-important word is try. A lot enough time daily for sitting quietly and trying, just trying, to go beyond the personality, with its addictions and obsessions. Don't ask how, it cannot be explained. You just keep on trying until you succeed. If you persevere there can be no failure. What matters supremely is sincerity, earnestness. You must really have had surfeit of being the person you are now see the urgent need of being free of this unnecessary self-identification with a bundle of memories and habits. The steady resistance against the unnecessary is the secret of success. After all, you are what you are every moment of your life, but you are never conscious of it, except maybe at the point of awakening from sleep. All you need is to be aware of being, not as a verbal statement, but as an ever-present fact. The awareness that you are will open your eyes to what you are. It is all very simple. First of all establish a constant contact with yourself, 
be with yourself all the time. Into self-awareness, all blessings flow. Begin as a center of observation, deliberate cognizance, and grow into a center of love in action. I am as a tiny seed which will grow into a mighty tree, quite naturally, without a trace of effort. Question, I see so much evil in myself. Must I not change it? Maharaj, evil, is the shadow of inattention. In the light of self-awareness, it will wither and fall off. All dependence on another is futile, for what others can give others will take away. Only what is your own at the start will remain your own in the end. Accept no guidance, but from within, and even then sift out all memories for they will mislead you. Even if you are quite ignorant of the ways and the means, keep quiet and look within, guidance is sure to come. You are never left without knowing what your next step should be. Trouble is that you may shirk it. The Guru is there for giving you courage because of his experience and success. But only what you discover through your own awareness, your own effort, will be of permanent use to you. Remember, nothing you perceive is your own. Nothing of value can come to you from outside, it is only your own feeling and understanding that are relevant and revealing. Words, heard or read, will only create images in your mind, but you are not a mental image. You are the power of perception and action behind and beyond the image. Question. You seem to advise me to be self-centered to the point of egoism. Must I not yield even to my interest in other people? Maharaj, your interest in others is egoistic, self-concerned, self-oriented. You are not interested in others as persons, but only as far as they enrich or ennoble your own image of yourself. And the ultimate in selfishness is to care only for the protection, preservation, and multiplication of one's own body. By body I mean all that is related to your name and shape, your family, tribe, country, race, etc. To be attached to one's name and shape is selfishness. A man who knows that he is neither body nor mind cannot be selfish, for he has nothing to be selfish for. Or you may say, he is equally selfish on behalf of everybody he meets, everybody's welfare is his own. The feeling I am the world, the world is myself becomes quite natural. Once it is established, there is just no way of being selfish. To be selfish means to covet, acquire, accumulate on behalf of the part against the whole. Question. One may be rich with many possessions by inheritance or marriage or just good luck. Maharaj, if you do not hold on to, it will be taken away from you. Question. In your present state can you love another person as a person? Maharaj, I am the other person, the other person is myself, in name and shape we are different, but there is no separation. At the root of our being we are one. Question. Is it not so whenever there is love between people? Maharaj, it is but they are not conscious of it. They feel the attraction, but do not know the reason. Question. Why is love selective? Maharaj, love is not selective, desire is selective. In love there are no strangers. When the center of selfishness is no longer, all desires for pleasure, and fear of pain cease, one is no longer interested in being happy, beyond happiness, there is pure intensity, inexhaustible energy, the ecstasy of giving from a perennial source. Question, mustn't I begin by solving for myself the problem of right and wrong? Maharaj, what is pleasant people take it to be good, and what is painful they take it to be bad. Question. Yes, that is how it is with us, ordinary people. But how is it with you at the level of oneness? For you what is good and what is bad? Maharaj, what increases suffering is bad and what removes it is good? Question. So you deny goodness to suffering itself? There are religions in which suffering is considered good and noble. Maharaj, karma, or destiny, is an expression of a beneficial law, the universal trend towards balance, harmony and unity. 
at every moment whatever happens now is for the best. It may appear painful and ugly, a suffering bitter and meaningless, yet considering the past and the future it is for the best, as the only way out of a disastrous situation. Question, does one suffer only for one's own sins? Maharaj, one suffers along with what one thinks oneself to be. If you feel one with humanity, you suffer with humanity. Question, and since you claim to be one with the sufferers, there is no limit in time or space to your suffering. Maharaj, to be is to suffer. The narrower the circle of my self-identification, the more acute the suffering caused by desire and fear. Question, Christianity accepts suffering as purifying and ennobling, while Hinduism looks at it with distaste. Maharaj, Christianity is one way of putting words together and Hinduism is another. The real is behind and beyond words, incommunicable, directly experienced, explosive in its effect on the mind. It is easily had when nothing else is wanted. The innards created by imagination and perpetuated by desire. Question, can there be no suffering that is necessary and good? Maharaj, accidental or incidental pain is inevitable and transitory. Deliberate pain, inflicted with even the best of intentions, is meaningless and cruel. Question, you would not punish crime? Maharaj, punishment is but legalized crime. In a society built on prevention, rather than retaliation, there would be very little crime. Few exceptions will be treated medically, as of unsound mind and body. Question. You seem to have little use for religion. Maharaj, what is religion? Cloud in the sky. I live in the sky, not in the clouds, which are so many words held together. Remove the verbiage and what remains? Truth remains. My home is in the unchangeable, which appears to be a state of constant reconciliation and integration of opposites. People come here to learn about the actual existence of such a state, the obstacles to its emergence, and once perceived, the art of stabilizing it in consciousness, so that there is no clash between understanding and living. The state itself is beyond the mind and need not be learnt. The mind can only focus the obstacles, seeing an obstacle as an obstacle is effective, because it is the mind acting on the mind. Begin from the beginning, give attention to the fact that you are. At no time can you say I was not all you can say, I do not remember. You know how unreliable is memory. Except that engrossed in petty personal affairs you have forgotten what you are, try to bring back the lost memory through the elimination of the known. You cannot be told what will happen, nor is it desirable, anticipation will create illusions. In the inner search the unexpected is inevitable, the discovery is invariably beyond all imagination. Just as an unborn child cannot know life after birth, for it has nothing in its mind with which to form a valid picture, so is the mind unable to think of the real in terms of the unreal, except by negation. Not this, not that. The acceptance of the unreal as real is the obstacle. To see the false as false and abandon the false brings reality into being. The states of utter clarity, immense love, utter fearlessness, these are mere words at the present, outlines without color, hints at what can be. You are like a blind man expecting to see as a result of an operation, provided you do not shirk the operation. The state I am in words do not matter at all. Nor is there any addiction to words. Only facts matter. Question. There can be no religion without words. Maharaj, recorded religions are mere heaps of verbiage. Religions show their true face in action, in silent action. To know what man believes, watch how he acts. For most of the people's service of their bodies and their minds is their religion. They may have religious ideas, but they do not act on them. They play with them. 
They are often very fond of them, but they will not act on them. Question. Words are needed for communication. Maharaj, for exchange of information, yes. But real communication between people is not verbal. For establishing and maintaining relationship affectionate awareness expressed in direct action is required. Not what you say, but what you do is that matters. Words are made by the mind and are meaningful only on the level of the mind. The word bread, neither can you eat nor live by it, it merely conveys an idea. It acquires meaning only with the actual eating. In the same sense am I telling you that the normal state is not verbal. I may say it is wise love expressed in action, but these words convey little, unless you experience them in their fullness and beauty. Words have their limited usefulness, but we put no limits to them and bring ourselves to the brink of disaster. Our noble ideas are finely balanced by ignoble actions. We talk of God, truth and love, but instead of direct experience we have definitions. Instead of enlarging and deepening action we chisel our definitions. And we imagine that we know what we can define. Question. How can one convey experience except through words? Maharaj, experience cannot be conveyed through words. Comes with action. A man who is intense in his experience will radiate confidence and courage. Others too will act and gain experience born out of action. Verbal teaching has its use, it prepares the mind for voiding itself of its accumulations. A level of mental maturity is reached when nothing external is of any value and the heart is ready to relinquish all. Then the real has a chance and it grasps it. Delays, if any, are caused by the mind being unwilling to see or to discard. Question. Are we so totally alone? Maharaj, oh no we are not. Those who have can give. And such givers are many. The world itself is a supreme gift, maintained by loving sacrifice. But the right receivers, wise and humble, are so few. Ask, and you shall be given as the eternal law. So many words you have learnt, so many you have spoken. You know everything, but you do not know yourself. For the self is not known through words, only direct insight will reveal it. Look within, search within. Question. It is very difficult to abandon words. Our mental life is one continuous stream of words. Maharaj, it is not a matter of easy or difficult. You have no alternative. Either you try or you don't. It is up to you. Question, I have tried many times and failed. Maharaj, try again. If you keep on trying something may happen. But if you don't, you are stuck. You may know all the right words, quote the scriptures, be brilliant in your discussions and yet remain a bag of bones. Or you may be inconspicuous and humble, an insignificant person altogether, yet glowing with loving kindness and deep wisdom. Chapter 99. The Perceived Cannot Be the Perceiver. Questioner. I have been moving from place to place investigating the various yogas available for practice, and I could not decide which will suit me best. I should be thankful for some competent advice. At present, as a result of all this searching, I am just tired of the idea of finding truth. It seems to me both unnecessary and troublesome. Life is enjoyable as it is and I see no purpose in improving on it. Maharaj, you are welcome to stay in your contentment but can you? Youth figure money, all will pass away sooner than you expect. Sorrow shunned so far will pursue you. If you want to be beyond suffering, you must meet it halfway and embrace it. Relinquish your habits and addictions, live a simple and sober life, don't hurt a living being, this is the foundation of yoga. Kind reality, you must be real in the smallest daily action. There can be no deceit in this search for truth. You say you find your life enjoyable. Maybe it is at present. But who enjoys it? Question. 
I confess I do not know the enjoyer nor the enjoyed. I only know the enjoyment. Maharaj, quite right. But enjoyment is a state of mind, it comes and goes. Its very impermanence makes it perceivable. You cannot be conscious of what does not change. All consciousness is consciousness of change. But the very perception of change, does it not necessitate a changeless background? Question, not at all. The memory of the last state, compared to the actuality of the present state gives the experience of change. Maharaj, between the remembered and the actual there is a basic difference which can be observed from moment to moment. At no point of time is the actual the remembered. Between the two, there is a difference in kind, not merely in intensity. The actual is unmistakably so. By no effort of will or imagination can you interchange the two. Now what is it that gives this unique quality to the actual? Question. The actual is real while there is a good deal of uncertainty about the remembered. Maharaj, quite so but why? A moment back the remembered was actual, in a moment the actual will be the remembered. What makes the actual unique? Obviously, it is your sense of being present. In memory and anticipation there is a clear feeling that it is a mental state under observation, while in the actual the feeling is primarily of being present and aware. Question. Yes I can see. It is awareness that makes the difference between the actual and the remembered. One thinks of the past or the future, but one is present in the now. Maharaj, wherever you go the sense of here and now you carry with you all the time. It means that you are independent of space and time, that space and time are in you, not you in them. It is your self-identification with the body which of course is limited in space and time, that gives you the feeling of finiteness. In reality you are infinite and eternal. Question. This infinite and eternal self of mine, how am I to know it? Maharaj, the self you want to know, is it some second self? Are you made of several selves? Truly there is only one self and you are that self. The self you are is the only self there is. Remove and abandon your wrong ideas about yourself and there it is, in all its glory. It is only your mind that prevents self-knowledge. Question. How am I to be rid of the mind? Is life without mind at all possible on the human level? Maharaj, there is no such thing as mind. There are ideas and some of them are wrong. Abandon the wrong ideas, for they are false and obstruct your vision of yourself. Question, which ideas are wrong and which are true? Maharaj, assertions are usually wrong and denials right. Question. One cannot live by denying everything. Maharaj, only by denying can one live. Assertion is bondage. Question and deny is necessary. It is the essence of revolt and without revolt there can be no freedom. There is no second or higher self to search for. You are the highest self, only give up the false ideas you have about yourself. Both faith and reason tell you that you are neither the body, nor its desires and fears, nor are you the mind with its fanciful ideas, nor the role society compels you to play, the person you are supposed to be. Give up the false and the true will come into its own. You say you want to know yourself. You are yourself, you cannot be anything but what you are. Is knowing separate from being? Whatever you can know with your mind is of the mind, not you. About yourself you can only say, I am, I am aware, I like it. Question, I find being alive a painful state. Maharaj, you cannot be alive for you are life itself. It is the person you imagine yourself to be that suffers, not you. Dissolve it in awareness. It is merely a bundle of memories and habits. From the awareness of the unreal to the awareness of your real nature, there is a chasm which you will easily cross, once you have mastered the art of pure awareness. Question. All I know is that I do not know myself. 
Maharaj, how do you know that you do not know yourself? Your direct insight tells you that yourself you know first, for nothing exists to you without your being there to experience its existence. You imagine you do not know yourself because you cannot describe yourself. You can always say, I know that I am and you will refuse as untrue the statement, I am not. But whatever can be described cannot be yourself, and what you are cannot be described. You can only know yourself by being yourself without any attempt at self-definition and self-description. Once you have understood that you are nothing perceivable or conceivable, that whatever appears in the field of consciousness cannot be yourself, you will apply yourself to the eradication of all self-identification as the only way that can take you to a deeper realization of yourself. You literally progress by rejection a veritable rocket. Know that you are neither in the body nor in the mind, though aware of both, is already self-knowledge. Question, if I am neither the body nor mind, how am I aware of them? How can I perceive something quite foreign to myself? Maharaj, nothing is me is the first step. Everything is me is the next. Both hang on the idea, there is a world. When this too is given up, you remain what you are, the non-dual self. You are it here and now, but your vision is obstructed by your false ideas about yourself. Question, well I admit that I am, I was, I shall be, at least from birth to death. I have no doubts of my being here and now. But I find that it is not enough. My life lacks joy, born of harmony between the inner and the outer. If I alone am and the world is merely a protection, then why is there disharmony? Maharaj, you create disharmony and then complain. When you desire and fear and identify yourself with your feelings, you create sorrow and bondage. When you create with love and wisdom and remain unattached to your creations, the result is harmony and peace. But whatever be the condition of your mind, in what way does it reflect on you? It is only your self-identification with your mind that makes you happy or unhappy. Rebel against your slavery to your mind, see your bonds as self-created and break the chains of attachment and revulsion. Keep in mind your goal of freedom, until it dawns on you that you are already free, that freedom is not something in the distant future to be earned with painful efforts, but perennially one's own to be used. Liberation is not an acquisition, but a matter of courage, the courage to believe that you are free already and to act on it. Question, if I do as I like, I shall have to suffer. Maharaj, nevertheless, you are free. The consequences of your action will depend on the society in which you live and its conventions. Question. I may act recklessly. Maharaj, along with courage will emerge wisdom and compassion and skill in action. You will know what to do and whatever you do will be good for all. Question. I find that the various aspects of myself are at war between themselves and there is no peace in me. Where are freedom and courage, wisdom and compassion? My actions merely increase the chasm in which I exist. Maharaj, it is also because you take yourself to be somebody or something. Stop, look, investigate, ask the right questions, come to the right conclusions and have the courage to act on them and see what happens. The first steps may bring the roof down on your head, but soon the commotion will clear and there will be peace and joy. You know so many things about yourself, but the knower you do not know. Find out who you are, the knower of the known. Look within diligently, remember to remember that the perceived cannot be the perceiver. Whatever you see, hear or think of, remember, you are not what happens, you are he to whom it happens. Delve deeply into the sense I am, and you will surely discover that the perceiving center is universal, as universal as the light that illumines the world. All that happens in the universe happens to you, the silent witness. On the other hand, whatever is done, is done by you, the universal and inexhaustible energy. Question, it is, no doubt, 
very gratifying to hear that one is the silent witness as well as the universal energy. But how is one to cross over from a verbal statement to direct knowledge? Hearing is not knowing. Maharaj, before you can know anything directly non-verbally, you must know the knower. So far you took the mind for the knower, but it is just not so. The mind clogs you up with images and ideas, which leave scars in memory. You take remembering to be knowledge. True knowledge is ever fresh, new, unexpected. It wells up from within. When you know what you are, you also are what you know. Between knowing and being there is no gap. Question, I can only investigate the mind with the mind. Maharaj, by all means use your mind to know your mind. Is perfectly legitimate and also the best preparation for going beyond the mind. Being knowing and enjoying is your own. First realize your own being. This is easy because the sense I am is always with you. Then meet yourself as the knower apart from the known. Once you know yourself as pure being, the ecstasy of freedom is your own. Question, which yoga is this? Maharaj, why worry? What makes you come here is your being displeased with your life as you know it, the life of your body and mind. You may try to improve them, through controlling and bending them to an ideal, or you may cut the knot of self-identification altogether and look at your body and mind as something that happens without committing you in any way. Question, shall I call the way of control and discipline Raja Yoga and the way of detachment Jhana Yoga and the worship of an ideal Bhakti Yoga? Maharaj, if it pleases you. Words indicate but do not explain. What I teach is the ancient and simple way of liberation through understanding. Understand your own mind and its hold on you will snap. Mind misunderstands, misunderstanding is its very nature. Right understanding is the only remedy, whatever name you give it. It is the earliest and also the latest, for it deals with the mind as it is. Nothing you do will change you, for you need no change. You may change your mind or your body, but it is always something external to you that has changed, not yourself. Why bother at all to change? Realize once for all that neither your body nor your mind, nor even your consciousness, is yourself and stand alone in your true nature beyond consciousness and unconsciousness. No effort can take you there, only the clarity of understanding. Trace your misunderstandings and abandon them, that is all. There is nothing to seek and find, for there is nothing lost. Relax and watch the I am. Reality is just behind it. Keep quiet, keep silent, it will emerge or rather it will take you in. Question, must I not get rid of my body and mind first? Maharaj, you cannot for the very idea binds you to them. Just understand and disregard. Question, I am unable to disregard for I am not integrated. Maharaj, imagine you are completely integrated, your thought and action fully coordinated. How will it help you? It will not free you from mistaking yourself to be the body or the mind. See them correctly is not you that is all. Question, you want me to remember to forget. Maharaj, yes it looks so. Yet. It is not hopeless. You can do it. To set about it in earnest. Your blind groping is full of promise. Your very searching is the finding. You cannot fail. Question, because we are disintegrated we suffer. Maharaj, we shall suffer as long as our thoughts and actions are prompted by desires and fears. See their futility and the danger and chaos they create will subside. Don't try to reform yourself, just see the futility of all change. The changeful keeps on changing while the changeless is waiting. Do not expect the changeful to take you to the changeless, it can never happen. Only when the very idea of changing is seen as false and abandoned, the changeless can come into its own. Question, everywhere I go I am told that I must change profoundly before I can see the real. This process of deliberate, self-imposed change is called yoga. 
Maharaj, all change affects the mind only. To be what you are, you must go beyond the mind, into your own being. It is immaterial what is the mind that you leave behind, provided you leave it behind for good. This again is not possible without self-realization. Question, what comes first, the abandoning of the mind or self-realization? Maharaj, self-realization definitely comes first. Mind cannot go beyond itself by itself. It must explode. Question, no exploration before explosion. Maharaj, the explosive power comes from the real. But you are well advised to have your mind ready for it. Fear can always delay it until another opportunity arises. Question, I thought there is always a chance. Maharaj, in theory yes. In practice a situation must arise when all the factors necessary for self-realization are present. This need not I discourage you. Your dwelling on the fact of I am will soon create another chance. Or attitude attracts opportunity. All you know is second hand. Only I am is first hand and needs no proofs. Stay with it. Chapter 1. Hundred. Understanding leads to freedom. Questioner. In many countries of the world investigating officers follow certain practices aimed at extracting confessions from their victim and also changing his personality, if needed. By a judicious choice of physical and moral deprivations and by persuasions, the old personality is broken down and a new personality established in its place. The man under investigation hears so many times repeated that he is an enemy of the state and a traitor to his country, that a day comes when something breaks down in him and he begins to feel with full conviction that he is a traitor, a rebel, altogether despicable and deserving the direst punishment. This process is known as brainwashing. It struck me that the religious and yogic practices are very similar to brainwashing. The same physical and mental deprivation, solitary confinement, a powerful sense of sin, despair and a desire to escape through expiation and conversion, adoption of a new image of oneself and impersonating that image. The same repetition of set formulas, God is good, the Guru party knows, faith will save me. In the so-called yogic or religious practices, the same mechanism operates. The mind is made to concentrate on some particular idea, to the exclusion of all other ideas and concentration, is powerfully reinforced by rigid discipline and painful austerities. A high price in life and happiness is paid, and what one gets in return appears therefore to be of great importance. This prearranged conversion, obvious or hidden, religious or political, ethical or social, may look genuine and lasting, yet there is a feeling of artificiality about it. Maharaj, you are quite right. By undergoing so many hardships the mind gets dislocated and immobilized. Its condition becomes precarious, whatever it undertakes ends in a deeper bondage. Question, then why are sadhanas prescribed? Maharaj, unless you make tremendous efforts, you will not be convinced that effort will take you nowhere. The self is so self-confident that unless it is totally discouraged, it will not give up. Mere verbal conviction is not enough. Hard facts alone can show the absolute nothingness of the self-image. Question. The brainwasher drives me mad and the guru drives me sane. The driving is similar. Yet the motive and the purpose are totally different. The similarities are perhaps merely verbal. Maharaj, inviting or compelling to suffer contains in it violence, and the fruit of violence cannot be sweet. There are certain life situations, inevitably painful, and you have to take them in your stride. There are also certain situations which you have created, either deliberately or by neglect. And from these you have to learn a lesson so that they are not repeated again. Question. 
It seems that we must suffer so that we learn to overcome pain. Maharaj, pain has to be endured. There is no such thing as overcoming the pain and no training is needed. Training for the future, developing attitudes is a sign of fear. Question, once I know how to face pain, I am free of it, not afraid of it, and therefore happy. This is what happens to a prisoner. He accepts his punishment as just and proper, and is at peace with the prison authorities and the state. All religions do nothing else but preach acceptance and surrender. We are being encouraged to plead guilty, to feel responsible for all the evils in the world and point at ourselves as their only cause. My problem is, I cannot see much difference between brainwashing and sadhana, except that in the case of sadhana one is not physically constrained. The element of compulsive suggestion is present in both. Maharaj, as you have said, the similarities are superficial. You need not harp on them. Question, sir, the similarities are not superficial. Man is a complex being and can be at the same time the accuser and the accused, the judge, the warden and the executioner. There is not much that is voluntary in a voluntary sadhana. One is moved by forces beyond one's ken and control. I can change my mental metabolism as little as the physical, except by painful and protracted efforts, which is yoga. All I am asking is, does Maharaj agree with me that yoga implies violence? Maharaj, I agree that yoga, as presented by you, means violence, and I never advocate any form of violence. My path is totally non violent. I mean exactly what I say non violent. Find out for yourself what it is. I merely say, it is non violent. Question, I am not misusing words. When a guru asks me to meditate 16 hours a day for the rest of my life, I cannot do it without extreme violence to myself. Is such a guru right or wrong? Maharaj, none compels you to meditate 16 hours a day unless you feel like doing so. It is only a way of telling you, remain with yourself, don't get lost among others. The teacher will wait but the mind is impatient. It is not the teacher, it is the mind that is violent and also afraid of its own violence. What is of the mind is relative, it is a mistake to make it into an absolute. Question. If I remain passive, nothing will change. If I am active, I must be violent. What is it I can do which is neither sterile nor violent? Maharaj, of course there is a way which is neither violent nor sterile and yet supremely effective. Just look at yourself as you are, see yourself as you are, accept yourself as you are and go ever deeper into what you are. Violence and non-violence describe your attitude to others. The self in relation to itself is neither violent nor non-violent, it is either aware or unaware of itself. If it knows itself all it does will be right, if it does not all it does will be wrong. Question, what do you mean by saying, I know myself as I am? Maharaj, before the mind I am. I am is not a thought in the mind, the mind happens to me, I do not happen to the mind. And since time and space are in the mind, I am beyond time and space, eternal and omnipresent. Question, are you serious? Do you really mean that you exist everywhere and at all times? Maharaj, yes I do. To me it is as obvious as the freedom of movement is to you. Imagine a tree asking a monkey, do you seriously mean that you can move from place to place? And the monkey saying, Yes, I do. Question, are you also free from causality? Can you produce miracles? Maharaj, the world itself is a miracle. I am beyond miracles, I am absolutely normal. With me everything happens as it must. I do not interfere with creation. Of what use are small miracles to me when the greatest of miracles is happening all the time? Whatever you see it is always your own being that you see. 
Go ever deeper into yourself, seek within, there is neither violence nor non-violence in self-discovery. The destruction of the false is not violence. Question, when I practice self-inquiry, or go within with the idea that it will profit me in some way or other, I am still escaping from what I am. Maharaj, quite right. True inquiry is always into something, not out of something. When I inquire how to get or avoid something, I am not really inquiring. To know anything I must accept it totally. Question, yes to know God I must accept God, how frightening. Maharaj, before you can accept God, you must accept yourself, which is even more frightening. The first steps in self-acceptance are not at all pleasant, for what one sees is not a happy sight. One needs all the courage to go further. What helps is silence. Look at yourself in total silence, do not describe yourself. Look at the being you believe you are and remember, you are not what you see. This I am not, what am I? Is the movement of self-inquiry. There are no other means to liberation, all means delay. Resolutely reject what you are not, till the real self emerges in its glorious nothingness, it's not a thingness. Question, the world is passing through rapid and critical changes. We can see them with great clarity in the United States, though they happen in other countries. There is an increase in crime on one hand and more genuine holiness on the other. Communities are being formed and some of them are on a very high level of integrity and austerity. It looks as if evil is destroying itself by its own successes, like a fire which consumes its fuel while the good, like life, perpetuates itself. Maharaj, as long as you divide events into good and evil, you may be right. In fact, good becomes evil and evil becomes good by their own fulfillment. Question, what about love? Maharaj, when it turns to lust, it becomes destructive. Question, what is lust? Maharaj, remembering, imagining, anticipating. Is sensory and verbal. A form of addiction. Question, is brahmacharya continence imperative in yoga? Maharaj, a life of constraint and suppression is not yoga. Mind must be free of desires and relaxed. It comes with understanding, not with determination, which is but another form of memory. An understanding mind is free of desires and fears. Question, how can I make myself understand? Maharaj, by meditating which means giving attention. Become fully aware of your problem, look at it from all sides, watch how it affects your life. Then leave it alone. You can't do more than that. Question, will it set me free? Maharaj, you are free from what you have understood. The outer expressions of freedom may take time to appear, but they are already there. Do not expect perfection. There is no perfection in manifestation. Details must clash. No problem is solved completely, but you can withdraw from it to a level on which it does not operate. Chapter 1, 101, Johnny does not grasp nor hold. Questioner, how does the Johnny proceed when he needs something to be done? Does he make plans, decide about details and execute them? Maharaj, Johnny understands a situation fully and knows at once what needs be done. That is all. The rest happens by itself, and to a large extent unconsciously. The Johnny's identity with all that is, is so complete, that as he responds to the universe, so does the universe respond to him. He is supremely confident, that once a situation has been cognized, events will move in adequate response. The ordinary man is personally concerned, he counts his risks and chances while the Gianni remains aloof, sure that all will happen as it must, and it does not matter much what happens, for ultimately the return to balance and harmony is inevitable. The heart of things is at peace. Question. 
I have understood that personality is an illusion and alert detachment without loss of identity is our point of contact with the reality. Will you please tell me at this moment are you a person or a self-aware identity? Maharaj, I am both. But the real self cannot be described except in terms supplied by the person, in terms of what I am not. All you can tell about the person is not the self, and you can tell nothing about the self which would not refer to the person, as it is, as it could be, as it should be. All attributes are personal. The real is beyond all attributes. Question, are you sometimes the self and sometimes the person? Maharaj, how can I be? Person is what I appear to be to other persons. To myself I am the infinite expanse of consciousness in which innumerable persons emerge and disappear in endless succession. Question, how is it that the person which to you is quite illusory appears real to us? Maharaj, you the self being the root of all being consciousness and joy, impart your reality to whatever you perceive. This imparting of reality takes place invariably in the now, at no other time, because past and future are only in the mind. Being applies to the now only. Question, is not eternity endless too? Maharaj, time is endless though limited, eternity is in the split moment of the now. We miss it because the mind is ever shuttling between the past and the future. It will not stop to focus the now. It can be done with comparative ease, if interest is aroused. Question, what arouses interest? Maharaj, earnestness the sign of maturity. Question, and how does maturity come about? Maharaj, by keeping your mind clear and clean, by living your life in full awareness of every moment as it happens, by examining and dissolving one's desires and fears as soon as they arise. Question. Is such concentration at all possible? Maharaj, try. One step at a time is easy. Energy flows from earnestness. Question. I find I am not earnest enough. Maharaj, self-betrayal is a grievous matter. It rots the mind like cancer. The remedy lies in clarity and integrity of thinking. Try to understand that you live in a world of illusions, examine them and uncover their roots. The very attempt to do so will make you earnest, for there is bliss in right endeavor. Question, where will it lead me? Maharaj, where can it lead you if not to its own perfection? Once you are well established in the now, you have nowhere else to go what you are timelessly, you express eternally. Question. Are you one or many? Maharaj, I am one but appear as many. Question, why does one appear at all? Maharaj, it is good to be and to be conscious. Question, life is sad. Maharaj, ignorance causes sorrow. Happiness follows understanding. Question, why should ignorance be painful? Maharaj, it is at the root of all desire and fear, which are painful states and the source of endless errors. Question. I have seen people supposed to have realized laughing and crying. Does it not show that they are not free of desire and fear? Maharaj, they may laugh and cry according to circumstances, but inwardly they are cool and clear watching detachedly their own spontaneous reactions. Appearances are misleading and more so in the case of a Jani. Question. I do not understand you. Maharaj, the mind cannot understand, for the mind is trained for grasping and holding while the Jani is not grasping and not holding. Question. What am I holding on to which you do not? Maharaj, you are a creature of memories, at least you imagine yourself to be so. I am entirely unimagined. I am what I am, not identifiable with any physical or mental state. Question. An accident would destroy your equanimity. Maharaj, the strange fact is that it does not. To my own surprise, I remain as I am, P. 
pure awareness, alert to all that happens. Question. Even at the moment of death. Maharaj, what is it to me that the body dies? Question. Don't you need it to contact the world? Maharaj, I do not need the world. Nor am I in one. The world you think of is in your own mind. I can see it through your eyes and mind, but I am fully aware that it is a projection of memories, it is touched by the real only at the point of awareness which can be only now. Question. The only difference between us seems to be that while I keep on saying that I do not know my real self, you maintain that you know it well. Is there any other difference between us? Maharaj, there is no difference between us. Nor can I say that I know myself, I know that I am not describable nor definable. There's a vastness beyond the farthest reaches of the mind. That vastness is my home, that vastness is myself. And that vastness is also love. Question, you see love everywhere while I see hatred and suffering. The history of humanity is the history of murder, individual and collective. No other living being so delights in killing. Maharaj, if you go into the motives, you will find love, love of oneself and of one's own. People fight for what they imagine they love. Question. Surely their love must be real enough when they are ready to die for it. Maharaj, love is boundless. What is limited to a few cannot be called love. Question. Do you know such unlimited love? Maharaj, yes I do. Question, how does it feel? Maharaj, all is loved and lovable. Nothing is excluded. Question, not even the ugly and the criminal. Maharaj, all is within my consciousness, all is my own. It is madness to split oneself through likes and dislikes. I am beyond both. I am not alienated. Question. To be free from like and dislike is a state of indifference. Maharaj, it may look and feel so in the beginning. Persevere in such indifference, and it will blossom into an all-pervading and all-embracing love. Question. One has such moments when the mind becomes a flower and a flame, but they do not last and the life reverts to its daily grayness. Maharaj, Discontinuity is the law, when you deal with the concrete, the continuous cannot be experienced for it has no borders. Consciousness implies alterations, change followings change when one thing or state comes to an end and another begins, that which has no borderline cannot be experienced in the common meaning of the word. One can only be it without knowing, but one can know what it is not is definitely not the entire content of consciousness which is always on the move. Question. If the immovable cannot be known, what is the meaning and purpose of its realization? Maharaj, to realize the immovable means to become immovable. And the purpose is the good of all that lives. Question. Life is movement. Immobility is death. Of what use is death to life? Maharaj, I am talking of immovability, not of immobility. You become immovable in reticence. You become a power which gets all things right. It may or may not imply intense outward activity, but the mind remains deep and quiet. Question, as I watch my mind I find it changing all the time, mood succeeding mood in infinite variety, while you seem to be perpetually in the same mood of cheerful benevolence. Maharaj, moods are in the mind and do not matter. Go within, go beyond. This being fascinated by the content of your consciousness. When you reach the deep layers of your true being, you will find that the mind surface play affects you very little. Question, there will be play all the same. Maharaj, a quiet mind is not a dead mind. Question, consciousness is always in movement. It is an observable fact. Immovable consciousness is a contradiction. When you talk of a quiet mind, what is it? Is not mind the same as consciousness? 
Maharaj, we must remember that words are used in many ways, according to the context. The fact is that there is little difference between the conscious and the unconscious, they are essentially the same. The waking state differs from deep sleep in the presence of the witness. A ray of awareness illumines a part of our mind, and that part becomes our dream or waking consciousness, while awareness appears as the witness. The witness usually knows only consciousness, sadhana consists in the witness turning back first on his conscious, then upon himself in his own awareness. Self-awareness is yoga. Question. If awareness is all-pervading then a blind man once realized can see. Maharaj, you are mixing sensation with awareness. Ajani knows himself as he is. He is also aware of his body being crippled and his mind being deprived of a range of sensory perceptions. But he is not affected by the availability of eyesight, nor by its absence. Question. My question is more specific. When a blind man becomes a Johnny will his eyesight be restored to him or not? Maharaj, unless his eyes and brain undergo a renovation, how can he see? Question. But will they undergo a renovation? Maharaj, they may or may not. It all depends on destiny and grace. But Ajani commands a mode of spontaneous, non sensory perception, which makes him know things directly, without the intermediary of the senses. He is beyond the perceptual, and the conceptual, beyond the categories of time and space, name and shape. He is neither the perceived nor the perceiver, but the simple and the universal factor that makes perceiving possible. Reality is within consciousness, but it is not consciousness, nor any of its contents. Question. What is false, the world or my knowledge of it? Maharaj, is there a world outside your knowledge? Can you go beyond what you know? You may postulate a world beyond the mind, but it will remain a concept, unproved and unprovable. Your experience is your proof and it is valid for you only. Who else can have your experience, when the other person is only as real as he appears in your experience? Question, am I so hopelessly lonely? Maharaj, you are as a person. In your real being vow or the whole. Question. Are you a part of the world which I have in consciousness, or are you independent? Maharaj, what you see is yours and what I see is mine. The two have little in common. Question. There must be some common factor which unites us. Maharaj, to find the common factor you must abandon all distinctions. Only the universal is in common. Question. What strikes me as exceedingly strange is that while you say that I am merely a product of my memories and woefully limited, I create a vast and rich world in which everything is contained, including you and your teaching. How this vastness is created and contained in my smallness is what I find hard to understand. Maybe you are giving me the whole truth, but I am grasping only a small part of it. Maharaj. Yet. It is a fact, the small projects the whole, but it cannot contain the whole. However great and complete is your world it is self-contradictory and transitory, and altogether illusory. Question. It may be illusory yet, it is marvelous. When I look and listen, touch, smell and taste, think and feel, remember and imagine, I cannot but be astonished at my miraculous creativity. I look through a microscope or telescope and see wonders, I follow the track of an atom and hear the whisper of the stars. If I am the sole creator of all this, then I am God indeed. But if I am God, why do I appear so small and helpless to myself? Maharaj, you are God but you do not know it. Question. If I am God then the world I create must be true. Maharaj. It is true in essence but not in appearance. Be free of desires and fears and at once your vision will clear and you shall see all things as they are. 
or he may say that the Sataguna creates the world, the Tamaguna obscures it and the Rajaguna distorts. Question. This does not tell me much because if I ask what are the gunas, the answer will be what creates, what obscures, what distorts. The fact remains, something unbelievable happened to me and I do not understand what has happened, how and why. Maharaj, well, wonder is the dawn of wisdom. To be steadily and consistently wondering is sadhana. Question, I am in a world which I do not understand and therefore, I am afraid of it. This is everybody's experience. Maharaj, you have separated yourself from the world therefore, it pains and frightens you. Discover your mistake and be free of fear. Question, you are asking me to give up the world while I want to be happy in the world. Maharaj, if you ask for the impossible, who can help you? The limited is bound to be painful and pleasant in turns. If you seek real happiness, unassailable and unchangeable, you must leave the world with its pains and pleasures behind you. Question, how is it done? Maharaj, mere physical renunciation is only a token of earnestness, but earnestness alone does not liberate. There must be understanding which comes with alert perceptivity, eager inquiry and deep investigation. You must work relentlessly for your salvation from sin and sorrow. Question, what is sin? Maharaj, all that binds you.